assuming he or she had survived the hazards of birth and the first days of infancy. Of course, Caroline had survived childbirth before, but it was no guarantee that she would again. He tried to visualize how the child might look, then abandoned the effort. He had no close acquaintance with infants. He felt no different, no wiser, no more mature by the fact of fatherhood and wondered if he were capable of cherishing and guiding a child in its development of moral character, wisdom and learning in the ways of the world. His own short childhood before his mother's death had left him ill-prepared, and most of his learning had been accumulated through the bitter years and hard knocks of experience. The guidance and education of a child became suddenly a vast and frightening responsibility. He was thankful that Caroline, with her firm moral convictions and love of learning, would share the task with him, but he felt that it was yet his own responsibility, and he doubted his qualifications. The reverie ended in the tramp and bustle of the mid-watch relieving the first watch. Merriweather dozed off for an hour. At dawn, Merriweather looked first for Countess and found her in place under the close surveillance of Comet. Then he searched out the enemy squadron. It appeared no closer than at dusk last night. The westward detour it had been compelled to make to avoid the brothers had cancelled out its superiority in speed for the time being and left it almost dead astern. With no navigational impediments now, it stood a chance of coming up with the convoy by noon. He decided to reorient the escort, leaving Comet in her present position, but signalling vigilant to a station astern, moving the starboard leading snow around to the starboard quarter, then positioning Pitt in the centre of the escort force astern, where it might dash off in either direction to counter an attack. He waited on deck until he saw the order accomplished, then went below for breakfast. As he came into the cabin, he saw a flicker of movement on the transom out of the corner of his eye. Sang! The little Indian came out of the pantry and bent in his first meeting of the day salaam. What is this? Sup, replied Sang, looking up with his most melting gaze. It is a son of our late cat. Sang could not bring himself to say Abercrombie. The name evidently recalled too many painful recollections of his days of bondage under the heavy-handed pirate. I thought, sir, you might call him after another of your late enemies. He looked expectantly at Merriweather. Well, who? he demanded, unable to fathom what Sang had in mind. Why, sir? looking now self-conscious. Why, Tipu Sultan! Done, laughed Merriweather, and now let's have a look at young Tipu. The kitten cuddled in his hands, emitting a coarse purr as his ears were scratched. You're sure it's a Tom? Otherwise we might have to change the name to Madame Bai. It was almost as red as Abercrombie, but with more pronounced stripes in its fur. Merriweather had no objection to Sang keeping the pet, it would deter rats and mice in the pantry. He handed the kitten back to Sang and called for breakfast. Before two bells in the forenoon watch, the wind began to play an exasperating game with the convoy. It died away completely, leaving the ships becalmed, while it continued to serve the French squadron, bringing it hull up before failing there too. Then it blew again, but drew around out of the south-southeast, taking several of the less alert ships aback. At least the convoy could still hold its course, and it then made amends of a sort by leaving the frigates still becalmed, so that they receded again to mere specks on the horizon. But there were thunderheads building up in the southwest, and Merriweather kept a wary eye on them lest a sudden squall catch the ships with too much sail set. The squall struck halfway through the first dog watch, a grey line of torrential rain blotting out the squadron and sweeping through the convoy. He had had signals flying to shorten sail, but even so, 
the force of the wind preceding the rain made Pitt stagger through some anxious moments before squaring away before it. It swept past them in the space of a quarter of an hour, and Merriweather found the frigates nearer, but not quite full up in line abreast. Darkness found the situation unchanged, and near the end of the second dog watch, Merriweather resumed his vigil in the canvas chair on the quarter deck, dozing in intermittent catnaps. Half an hour before the end of the first watch, Merriweather came wide awake. Everything appeared in order, the ship ghosting along at an easy four knots or so, Dobbs standing at ease on the weather side of the quarter deck just abaft the helm. The sails were drawing well, and the quartermaster could hold his course with little effort. There was little to be gained by remaining on deck any longer. Better to get a good night's rest against the possibility of a strenuous day tomorrow. Suddenly Merriweather felt a desire for conversation in the fashion of the long, entertaining discussions in the night with young Harris, the Yankee shipowner, on the voyage back from Ile de France last year. Dobbs had never displayed any gift of small talk, most of his utterances being limited to terse line of duty subjects, and on impulse he cleared his throat, then spoke. Mr. Dobbs! The young officer came over to the chair, his face barely visible in the light of the gibbous moon. Merriweather was suddenly uncertain and self-conscious, and continued lamely, And how do you find your service in the Marine? Why, very well, sir. Merriweather regretted for a moment commencing the conversation. Dobbs was still tongue-tied, and he might as well terminate the effort. He opened his mouth to utter some platitude in dismissal, when Dobbs continued. Of course there is enough to keep me busy, what with the navigation, though I find it much easier now that I use the new American method. American method? Merriweather had learned Moore's method by rote, in preparation for his examination for a commission as second lieutenant ten years ago and still could toil through the tedious equations to a solution when the necessity arose. He was no mathematician, and had not heard of a new method, American or otherwise. Yes, sir, a theory of navigation published five or six years ago by a man named Nathaniel Bowditch. The work is called The New American Practical Navigator and it presents a method that is shorter and more accurate than Moore's. I found a copy at Fort William last year, and then showed it to Captain Wilkerson, the fleet surveyor and navigator at Bombay. He proved out the equations, and suggested that I use both methods until I was sure the new one worked. And it does. He asked me to write a report of my experiences with my comments and recommendations. Possibly, he said, the entire marine should adopt the theory if I found it superior to the Moore method. I have all the results, and a rough draft of my report to submit when we reach Bombay. There was genuine enthusiasm in Dobbs's voice. There were more depths to this young man than he had previously discerned, Merriweather concluded. How did you learn so much about mathematics? Mostly since I came into the marine. Of course, I had some education, but Lieutenant Massey in my first ship taught me the theory, and McRae helped me too, so I've studied ever since. How did you chance to enter the Marine? Sir, my parents died of smallpox when I was fifteen. My father had a greengrocer's shop in Manchester, but of course I was not able to carry on the business, and my uncle sold it as my guardian. I wanted a warrant as midshipman in the Royal Navy, but we didn't have the connections. My grandfather had sailed as mate in an India man, and one of his old shipmates had the influence to get me a place as a volunteer in the Marine. I took the examination for lieutenant two years ago, became a past midshipman, and then you got me the commission as second lieutenant last year. You have made very good progress in the Marine, and earned every step of it. You know I made special mention of your services at Ras el Khaimah. Yes, sir, you showed it to me. Thank you. 
No thanks are necessary. It was your due. Will you make the marine your career? I hope to. I enjoy navigation and seamanship, though I don't have the flair for gunnery that Larkin has. By the way, sir, did you see the report in the London papers at Bombay of a steam-propelled vessel? No. Is there such a thing? Yes, sir. An American named Robert Fulton built such a ship last year at New York. It has boilers and a steam engine that turns paddle wheels on either side. And it can sail right against the wind and tide. Merriweather thought instantly of the problem of finding and storing enough galley firewood, even for a three-month voyage. Would there be room for a crew and cargo after stowing enough wood for a voyage? And wouldn't the vessel be likely to catch on fire? I don't know, sir. Perhaps you could use Newcastle coals. They burn hotter and longer than wood. A long way to Newcastle, Merriweather replied dryly. Something in the idea of a ship with its white wings of sail being corrupted by a smoking, stinking, clanking engine like the ponderous, puffing billy that pumped the graving docks dry at Bombay offended him. And, too, he had spent the major portion of his life learning the art that enabled him to take a vessel from port to port regardless of wind direction. Should this hard-earned mastery be superseded by a mere machine that any dolt could manage? It will be a long time, I think, before such a contraption becomes practicable. I have hopes I may serve in one before my career in the Marine is finished, said Dobbs in a faraway tone. Merriweather could dimly distinguish the blunt features in the moonlight as Dobbs looked up to check the trim of the sails, then drifted over to look in the binnacle. When he returned, he spoke in a different voice, but with a studied air of off-handedness. Sir, do you have any intimation of where our next commission may be? Merriweather responded with complete candour. None whatever. Merriweather had a sudden conviction that the young officer was blushing, though it was impossible to see in the darkness. Well, you know Rapid was in the scouting squadron with Commodore Waldron last year east of Malacca. We called at Penang going out, and again returning. Dobbs paused as the messenger approached. Yes, you may call the watch. He turned back to Merriweather and continued. Anyway, when we were there the first time last year, I met a girl at the ball Mr. Raffles gave. And I saw her several times again last year. He went on in a small, diffident voice. She said she would wait for me, but there are others, particularly a lieutenant in the Royal Navy. Have you heard from her? Yes. In the mail we got at Razul Kaimar. She sounded a bit impatient. I cannot predict our next operation, provided we survive this one. But if we come back to Bombay and the requirements of the service permit, I would entertain a request for a reasonable amount of leave. There was an appreciable pause while Dobbs assimilated the statement. There was a tramp and bustle as the mid-watch began to come on deck and relieve. Dobbs withdrew to impart the situation and night orders to McCamey preparatory to his taking the deck. You never know, Merriweather mused. He had not pictured square, inarticulate Dobbs as the lover sighing like a furnace or suffering the pangs of unrequited passion. The thought of the quotation recalled that delicious spontaneous interlude of his own with Caroline last summer, just before he left for Persia with Rob Percy. He racked his brain to recall the sequence of events leading up to his carrying her off bodily to bed, but the words would not come. Was it soldier? He remembered quoting the justice and certainly the lover had triggered the climax. But as a result of that brief idyll, he had fathered a child. He felt uncomfortable for a moment at the present uncertainty, the lack of news, then consoled himself with the thought that he could have been no more than a moral bulwark to Caroline had he been present. He was suddenly weary, arose, 
found the glass and swept the horizon, now distinct in the moonlight. He could not discern the frigates and went below, leaving word with McCamey for a call at daybreak. Just before he dropped off, he determined to inquire of Dobbs which of the young ladies at Penang had caught his fancy. Dobbs came awake slowly, conscious of the messenger's rough hand on his shoulder. Good God, was it time again? He had only just closed his eyes, it seemed, after coming off the first watch at midnight. Mr. Hamlin says sky and horizon are clear half an hour to sunrise. All right, I'll come. The messenger went out, the horny soles of his bare feet whispering along the teak deck. Dobbs did not dare to let his eyes close again. He needed a star fix to verify Pitt's position after the change of course and squall yesterday. There had been too much cloud cover to observe even a single star last night, and the captain was most particular about his day's work in navigation, though the dead reckoning position was never far from that established by celestial observation. The thought of Merriweather produced a warm sensation in his heart as he remembered the report of the operation last spring at Raz ul Khaimah. He could recite from memory the paragraph dealing with himself. I wish to call particular attention to the services of Lieutenant John Dobbs, whose survey of the bottom disclosed the shallow winding channel leading to a point just off the town, allowing Pitt to approach the fortress within point-blank range. His energy, resource, and attention to duty are in accordance with the highest traditions of the company's marine, and largely responsible for the success of the operation. Dobbs put his feet on the deck and groped for his trousers, then found his boots and clumped into the wardroom to pour a cup of tea. On deck, Hamlin and Gaffner, the duty quartermaster, had the sextants laid out and the hack watch already compared with the chronometer. The motion of the ship was easy, the sea calm, the sky almost cloudless. The stars were brilliant, and the horizon just becoming distinct as he gulped down his tea and picked up the sextant. The captain's canvas chair at the weather rail was empty, he noted, before he looked up at the heavens. Beetlejuice, he told Hamlin, sighting through the reversed sextant on the star then moving the arm on the arc until the horizon became visible in the mirror. He turned the instrument right side up and made the fine adjustments to bring the star down precisely on the line of the horizon. Mark! 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 Hamlin echoed him and Gaffner made a note of the time, then the altitude each officer read off from the ivory scale inletted in the ebony instrument. Only a slight difference, Dobbs was pleased to note. They repeated the observations on four more stars. Then Dobbs and Gaffner went into the cubby to commence solving the intricate equations conceived by Nathaniel Bowditch in his new American method that eventually would result in a position he could plot on a chart. Hamlin would work out his observations for comparison when he came off watch. But for the present... The diminutive Gaffner would also work out the sights according to Moore's older formulas as a continuing check on the new method. Finished, Dobbs painstakingly plotted the indicator position on the chart, marking it with a faint dot surrounded by a circle, then added the date and time, and looked over at Gaffner, hunched on a stool, his sharp face intent on his figures. In the yellow light of the lamp, the quartermaster resembled a gnome in a drawing out of a storybook. He set down the final figures, slid off the stool and rapidly manipulated the parallel rules on the chart, then placed an almost invisible dot. Less than a mile of difference, sir, he reported in a high cockney voice. I was hoping to catch your off this time. He grinned, showing yellow teeth. Dobbs grinned back at him. And so you might, but I threw out the star I mistook for Capella, he said over his shoulder as he went out on deck into the light of the rising sun. I make it twelve degrees, thirty-one minutes north, fifty-two, fifty east, he reported to Hamlin, who entered the position in the deck log, 
then sent the messenger to the cabin with the slip showing the date, time, latitude and longitude initialed by Dobbs. Dobbs looked about the deck, then astern, yawning mightily. The topsails of the frigates reflected gleaming white in the oblique rays of the sun. They were measurably closer than at dusk last night, but not dangerously so, he decided. By noon, assuming the wind held and no squalls, Pitt might well be in action. A spot of breakfast would help now. The wardroom mess steward had actually found two swine in Muslim Jeddah, and there was still bacon for breakfast. Larkin was alone at the table, finishing a cup of coffee before he took the deck for the forenoon watch. Dobbs would succeed him in regular rotation at noon, and they grunted amiable good mornings at one another, before Larkin picked up his hat and went out. While the tea cooled, Dobbs thought of his conversation with Captain Merriweather last night, and felt again the inner sense of warmth. The man was essentially kind, he decided again, though he brooked no nonsense and demanded efficient performance of every duty assigned. There had been no obligation on his part to offer a leave, even if the exigencies of the service permitted, and Dobb would not have asked for such indulgence on his own initiative. Even if granted, it would take a mighty and fortuitous combination of luck and circumstances to transport him to Penang and back. Possibly it would be more realistic to ask for transfer to a ship serving in the Straits area, though it would mean leaving Merriweather for some unknown quantity as a commanding officer. But Judith was worth it. Her vision swam before his eyes as he stared blindly at the sideboard across the room. She had been a pert slip of a girl, the youngest of the group, when he met her at the governor's ball at Georgetown more than a year ago, and he had monopolized her evening. She had put him at ease instantly. He had found no need to talk as she bubbled along in a stream of inconsequential gossip, identification, and judgments on others present, punctuated with indirect inquiries about himself. And yet when he spoke she had listened. By the end of the evening, he knew she had been born in Bombay, daughter of a sailing master in the Marine who now served as port captain for Penang since he had lost an arm, married to the sister of a writer in the company's Bombay establishment. Dobbs had found himself for the first time in his life in the close company of a girl, albeit one some five years his junior. He had asked to see her again, and she had consented. On Rapid's last call at Penang last fall, he had summoned the courage to ask her to marry him, and she had made a conditional acceptance that the marriage take place within the year. Cold hatred welled up in Dobbs as he thought of Lieutenant Garner serving in HMS Argus, based on Penang, who persisted in pursuing Judith during his absence. He had been within an ace of calling the obnoxious rival out last fall, but Judith had dissuaded him. Still, the danger persisted. Absence might not make her heart grow fonder, but he felt the most urgent compulsion to make her his own. Life would not be worth living if he could not have Judith Johnson. He pushed back the chair and hurried to his room to take pen in hand and compose a letter to be posted in Bombay hopefully as specific as he could make it. He was working on the third draft when he heard the drums and bugles summoning the hands to quarters. He laid the writing kit aside, inserted a brace of pistols in his belt, clapped on his hat, and mounted the ladder to assume his post as officer of the watch. The situation had changed dramatically in the last hour. For no apparent reason, the frigates had in one quick burst of speed closed the gap that had held them off the past forty-eight hours. Merriweather watched the approach, trying to forecast the tactics they might employ. If that Frenchman played his cards astutely now, he could cut out the Countess of Surrey with one frigate while holding the escort force immobilized with the other two. Even as he visualized the tactical situation and its alternatives in his mind, 
Meriwether saw the outboard frigate alter course to port, while the other two pressed ahead in the chase. He looked back and saw the silhouette of Countess changing in shape. The India man was wearing about on the port tack, making a run for it almost due west, hoping to gain refuge under the frigate's guns. Signals to Comet and Ariel. Port the India man. Send the hands to quarters, Mr. Larkin. It was one thing for Cosby to try to slip away from the convoy in the night for a quicker passage to Surat, but quite another to defect in the face of the enemy with the evident intention of joining them. Still, even now he acted at his peril in taking such action against a company maritime service ship whose master took precedence over a captain in the marine. The burden would be on him to prove his charges, with the presumption in favour of Cosby if the matter should reach the courts. The bugles shrilled their urgent summons, drums rolled in the staccato beat to quarters, and boatswain's mates passed the word down every companionway and hatch. Merriweather took his eyes off the Frenchman long enough to observe the disciplined speed with which the seamen manned their battle stations. A far cry from the sullen crew of four months ago. He looked back at the diverging frigate, attempting in his mind to solve an equation containing an infinite number of variables. The decision he made now was vital. Comet, with fourteen guns, could not oppose a thirty-six-gun ship with any expectation of success. And yet if he took pit in pursuit of Countess and the single frigate, the remaining escort force mounted four less guns than the two frigates. It was the classic example of the old tactic of divide and conquer, though he guessed that if the India man made its escape, the squadron would break off the action. Mission accomplished. The silhouettes of Comet and Ariel had also altered as they wore about in pursuit of Countess. But Countess was almost the equal of a frigate in speed if handled properly, and she was setting stunsails and skysails, cracking on canvas in an effort to run away from the big Salem-built schooner. His first move must be to prevent the Frenchman from joining forces with the India man, even though it meant abandoning the rest of the convoy. He turned to issue his orders and was surprised to find Dobbs only just in the act of relieving Larkin. So little time had elapsed. Hands to the braces. Starboard helm. Your course is north by west. The commands echoed forward. Set stunsails, driver, flying jib and skysails. This was far more sail than he wanted to carry into action, but the first order of business was to intercept the frigate. He checked the binnacle, then looked out to gauge the bearing of the target as Pitt settled on the new course. The Frenchman was drawing ever so slightly forward. Come a half point to starboard, he told the quartermaster, and heard Dobbs pass the word forward to perfect the trim. Larkin materialized before him. All stations manned and ready, sir. Very well. The tall man made his way forward to his station by the pivot gun on the forecastle stopping for a word of encouragement to each gun crew in the port battery. Merriweather looked back to starboard for Comet and Countess, interrupted for a moment as Sang delivered his pistols and sword to him. McRae, from his position to leeward, had cut across the wake of the India man to seize the weather gauge. Comet was flying the arbitrary imperative heave to, but Countess pressed on. It was another moment or so before he saw the smoke of the gun, and seconds later heard the distant report. McCrae had reinforced his signal with a shot across the bow, but to no avail. The Indian man persisted in holding its course. Merriweather wondered if he had issued an impossible order. Countess was at least three times the tonnage of the schooner, and would survive any collision. He looked astern to see the two frigates coming up on the escort with bones in their teeth. McCracken had signals flying too. The three snows, Vestal, Psyche and Thetis, were formed in a close order line ahead with Vigilant in the last position as the heaviest armed of the four, to windward of the predicted course of the French cruisers. 
It was clearly the best formation to concentrate the puny firepower of the small vessels. But how long it would hold together in the face of a few well-aimed broadsides was problematical. Nothing he could do now. McCracken had taken prompt and proper action. The bearing of the intercepting frigate had drawn almost imperceptibly aft. Merriweather let Pitt run another two minutes, then altered course a half point back to port to regain a collision course. The Frenchman was less than two miles away now, broad on the port bow. Merriweather beckoned to Dobbs. Send the messenger forward to Mr. Larkin, and tell him he has permission to open fire when he sees fit. In a moment, he saw Larkin wave his hat in acknowledgement and the stir on deck as the powder monkeys dashed down to the magazine for cartridges. On second thoughts, he gave the same order to Hamlin at the after pivot, though it could not yet bear on the target. The minutes ticked off at a snail's pace. A dreamlike atmosphere seemed to settle over the ship, the crew standing quiet beside the guns only the sound of wind and water breaking the silence. Larkin's hail came with startling clarity even against the wind. I shall open fire with your permission. You have it. There was an expectant stir among the hands, a mutter of comment all along the deck. But the tall American officer did not immediately open fire, though the piece was now loaded and primed. He remained stooped. Hands on knees behind the gun, the sight set at maximum range on its tang, the piece at its full elevation. It seemed an age while Larkin adjusted the sight for deflection, then signalled the minute alteration in train to match the correction. Stand by, he said, stepping smartly aside. Fire! He twitched the lanyard as he cleared the path of the recoil. The high-pitched, spiteful report cracked out, the smoke blown instantly off to starboard. Merriweather had the glass to his eye, but he failed to find the splash. Not observed, he shouted forward, and Larkin waved negligently as the hands sponged out, then rammed home cartridge wad, shot, and wad again, and the gun captain inserted his quill of priming powder all in the stylized economical movements of a well-rehearsed cotillion. The bearing of the frigate remained steady, about a point forward of the port beam. If each ship held its course and speed, the two would collide at an angle of about forty degrees some two miles ahead. But they would be in easy range long before that time. The crack of the long nine interrupted Merriweather's calculations by seaman's eye of relative speed and movement. He put the glass to his eye in time to see the cloud of splinters rise just forward of the break of the poop on the Frenchman. It was a hit, but caused no significant damage. He judged that the two ships were already within what he would term long gunshot of each other, and was opening his mouth to order the main battery to be run out when he saw the six afterports on the frigate's gun deck open. The French captain must be nettled by the hit at long range, he thought, as he braced himself for the salvo. It was woefully short, the nearest splash a cable's length off the port quarter. That was poor shooting if, as was usually the case with French ships, she carried long guns on her gun deck. He heard Larkin fire again. Good shot! The hit was almost midships. The bulwarks showed a ragged gap beside a deck carronade, and there were men down. Ports opened on the frigate. The Frenchman was showing his teeth, but no broadside followed immediately, and Merriweather looked back for Comet and Countess. Far off the starboard bow, the silhouette of the Indiaman had altered. She was almost bows on with Comet still alongside. Even with the glass he could not distinguish any activity on her decks, but McRae was at least staying with her. Ariel was a half mile beyond and closing in on the pair. He turned back to see McCracken leading his doughty little line of battle across the bow of the nearer frigate. Smoke erupted from the escorts one after another, as they fired their puny broadsides. 
and the shape of the Frenchman altered as it yawed to port to permit its own broadside to bear. He waited a moment, hearing the distant rumble of the guns, and saw that Vigilant and the Three Snows had survived the first salvo. Merriweather turned his attention back to his own problem, feeling as though he were a juggler with three balls in the air. The full broadside came from the frigate. Though fired at a moderate long range, there were solid hits on Pitt, one forward, the other crashing just about the flag cabin, and the main topmast staysail halyard was severed so that the sail thrashed about the deck. He saw Boatswain Caldwell leading his party on the double to deal with the casualty. Port battery, stand by! The ports opened and he put the glass to his eye, watching for the instant the enemy guns would be run out again, hoping that the French captain had not yet granted authority for independent fire to his gun captains. A solid broadside pumped in just before the command might disturb their aim. Muzzles began to appear in the ports. He waited an instant longer and gave the command. Fire! It was a good broadside, though delivered at almost the maximum effective range of the carronades. Hits were visible all along the side of the Frenchman, and when its broadside followed seconds later, it was ragged, evidence of casualties to guns or crews. And Merriweather felt no hits on Pitt. The frigate was altering course to port, coming almost squarely before the wind, but Merriweather held on long enough to fire the second broadside. He was baffled a moment by the manoeuvre, and edging away, until he looked back to see Countess some four miles distant under a full press of sail, Comet still dogging her. Macrae must have failed in his attempt to board her, and the Frenchman had computed a new point of interception. The guns roared out, and a moment later Dobbs gave a cry. Got her! he shouted, waving his hat in the air. You're a dead duck now, Mr. Crapo! The main topmast to gallant and royal masts were folding in upon themselves in a welter of thrashing canvas and snarled hemp. Even as he looked, the four royal and four to gallant musts bent slowly backward, and with gathering speed crashed on top the wreckage of the main. Merriweather could appreciate the disaster. He had lost his main topmast in rapid last year. The Frenchman had been carrying staysails and stunsails to compound the confusion. It was high time to get his own extra sail in, but there was no stopping now. Strike while the iron is hot. Hands to braces! Wear ship! Starboard helm! His voice cracked with excitement as he delivered the volley of orders. Close hauled on the port tack, he set his course to cross the stern of the helpless frigate. Starboard battery! Stand by! Most of the wreckage was dragging over the frigate's port side. She was unmanageable, and she was slowly coming about to port. He could see with a naked eye the frantic activity on her decks, axes flashing in the sun as the commander strove to cut loose the dragging mass of canvas in the water and restore control. Only a slight alteration of course now would permit the battery to bear. Come left two points! He measured the angle with his eye as the gun crews inched their pieces around in train. Fire as your gun bears! The guns and carronades began to explode one or two at a time down the side, four to aft, and then again in a ragged broadside as Pitt crossed the stern. Most of the shots were solid hits. A third salvo blasted out as she began to draw clear. The frigate had responded with only two or three wild shots from her gun deck. Merriweather estimated that there was room to wear about and cross the stern again on the reciprocal of his present course, and the advance and transfer would bring her back across the stern at point-blank range. Hands to the braces, he told Dobbs. Where ship? Your course is due east. As the ship swung round, Merriweather had time to survey the situation. The position of Countess and Comet appeared unchanged and he turned to see what had happened to his escort force and convoy, not to mention the other two frigates. 
what he saw startled him. The Frenchmen were much closer than they had any right to be, target angles almost zero and bearing down upon him. He had more pressing business right here, however, to finish off the crippled frigate without interference. The turn was almost completed. The quartermaster eased the rudder, then met the swing of the ship as Dobbs conder on her new course. Port battery, stand by! Pitt would pass the helpless frigate less than half a cable's length off her port side, still fouled with wreckage, her batteries unable to fire. Merriweather saw French seamen running for shelter on her deck as his gun ports opened, then heard a wordless shout from Hamlin at the after-pivot gun. She struck! shouted Dobbs, his face alight. The tricolor was coming down, and a white flag ascending. The French commander could not face the prospect of another series of broadsides ripping through his helpless ship. Belay! Gun crews all along the port battery looked around in disappointment, then saw the surrender and raised a cheer. Merriweather turned his attention back to the other frigates less than a mile distant. Far beyond them, he could see the escort vessels in their line ahead still barring the way to the convoy. They appeared to be intact. The Frenchmen must have broken off their action with the small vessels after a single broadside and headed for Pitt to give succour to their consort. Too late now, but he had no time to put a prize crew aboard her, and the crippled ship might very well retract her surrender given time to make repairs. It was a chance he was compelled to take. The Indian man, Comet, and Ariel all appeared to have drawn closer together, still about four miles distant. It was a good omen. McCrae might be able to bring Countess to bay at last. But Merriweather had more pressing matters to think about here. He tried desperately to decide his next manoeuvre at this critical juncture. Take in all light sail! Best stripped to fighting trim while he had the chance. Pitt was still on the starboard tack, close hauled, course almost due east, now dead ahead of the crippled frigate, where all activity appeared to have ceased. The approaching Frenchmen were on the port tack, wind on their quarters abreast of one another, and about a quarter of a mile apart. He tried to assimilate the various factors of the situation into one solid picture in his brain, and from it to distill some resolution of the problem they held the weather gauge on Pitt with all its tactical advantages, but he was yet uncertain of their intentions. Were they coming to the rescue of their consort, or was their objective still the Countess of Surrey? In either event, it was plainly his duty to engage them, but his strategy in one event might not serve so well in the other. He hesitated, unwilling to commit himself then temporised by ordering Larkin and Hamlin to try ranging shots at the frigates with the long nines. He missed the fall of shot in his preoccupation with the next move, then temporised further by ordering the starboard battery to stand by. The frigates were within long cannon shot but beyond the range of the carronades. Merriweather gave the order almost absently. Divide your battery, Mr. Hamlin. After section, aim for the starboard frigate. Fire when you were on target. The commands went yelping forward, relayed by each gun captain in turn. In a moment, the cries of, Mark! 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 came echoing back along the battery. In that brief interval before the broadside roared out, Merriweather came to a tentative conclusion. Pitt was only an irritant to be dealt with if it became an active nuisance. Countess was still the objective, and somehow he must divert the enemy. He took the time to observe the fall of shot. Most were short, but there were two apparent hits on the starboard frigate and at least one on the port. Not bad shooting for the range. He saw smoke blossom from the bow of the first one, then the other as their bow chasers fired. But he could not see the fall of shot. It would be suicide to throw himself in the way of the two ships. With the weather gauge, 
They had freedom of maneuver and could choose their point of attack, sliding by, fore or aft, punishing him as they passed, or even leaving one to deal with him while the other hurried on after Countess. He thought he saw a chance to reduce the odds by assuming the role of artful dodger. Hands to the braces! Stand by to wear ship! Starboard helm! Pitt began to swing. Course north! The frigates were almost dead astern now, and Merriweather watched them closely for any reaction, then saw their bow chasers fire again. There was one splash a cable's length to starboard, but they held their course towards the predicted position of Countess. This was confirmation of his earlier conclusion. The crippled frigate was almost a beam, two cables' lengths distant to port. Merriweather looked astern, measuring the rate of gain by the frigates. He held on another moment or so as the bearing of the crippled ship drew aft to the beam. Hands to the braces! Wear ship! Starboard helm! Your new course is west by north! Pitt came around to settle on the new course, thrashing along as close-hauled as she would lie, aiming to pass as near under the stern of the dismasted frigate as possible. Merriweather stood on the port side of the quarter-deck, hands clenched together behind his back, head pivoting right to see his course, then left to judge the relative movement of the Frenchman. A dead silence had descended on the decks. The weathered faces of the gun crews all turned to watch him as he appeared to be sailing away from an engagement with the frigates. He caught a glimpse of Dobbs, a curious expression of anticipation on his homely face, as though he had already deduced the stratagem, standing tense, ready to execute the next manoeuvre. The breeze had freshened, snoring through the taut lines of pit standing rigging as she plunged across the stern of the frigate only fifty yards distant. Men were running for cover on her decks, fearful that he had returned to pour in another broadside. Now, stand by to go about! Dobbs relayed the orders forward. There was always the very real danger when sailing as near the wind as Pitt was now, that her way would be insufficient to carry her around to settle on the opposite tack, leaving her in irons, unable to move. Starboard helm! The rudder bit. Pitt began to swing. She did not lose her way, and her advance and transfer were enough to carry her ahead of the Frenchman. There was a long moment of indecision as the yards were braced around, the heart-stopping instant before the sails cracked full of wind again on the starboard tack. And then the ship began to pick up speed again as she passed the bow of the motionless vessel and settled on an eastward course that would intercept the nearer frigate within moments. But there was a vast difference in the strategic situation now. Pitt held the weather gauge on the frigates only a quarter mile to the nearest, and Merriweather could dictate the exact amount of engagement. His first objective was simple. A few moments of uninterrupted broadsides against the nearer frigate, while screened against intervention by her consort. He estimated her speed, and solved without conscious calculation the course that would put him in that position. Come to port! Course northwest! Starboard battery stand by! Locks clicked as they were cocked along the deck. Pitt had almost squared before the wind. The guns would bear now. Fire! Twenty guns spoke almost at once, and it appeared that every shot struck home. The frigate returned the fire, but its broadside had gaps in it, evidence of casualties to guns or crews. The battery was run out again, and the second broadside erupted. If the drill ran true to form, he could count on getting off three shots from his shorter guns to two from the Frenchman. Fire at will! There was no need to control the gunfire any longer. Let the faster crews set their own pace. The firing assumed a galloping tempo as the ships edged together, and clusters of grape were now being rammed down on top the round shot. The frigate 
had lost its bowsprit and headsails. The main yard was shot in two and the spanker boom splintered in addition to major hull damage. In a single ship action she would strike within a few more such broadsides, but he saw the second ship coming across her wake. In a moment it would be in position to repay Pitt with interest. Starboard helm! Port battery stand by! If she would just come around fast enough, he could avoid her broadside and be in position to rake the consort. The last shots from the starboard battery were fired even as the ship swung. The first frigate was wavering out of control. Only a few yards more, and he would be across the bow of the second frigate. There came a last despairing shot from the main battery of the first Frenchman, and disaster struck. Pitt's fore topmast bent forward, then crashed across the starboard bow in a thrashing welter of canvas and tangled cordage. With the loss of the foresail, she would not answer her helm, and sagged off before the wind as the second Frenchman swept across her stern. There must have been at least a dozen hits. The main yard fell, as did the spanker gaff, fouling the helm. Two quarter-deck carronades were dismounted in the port battery, and men were down along the deck. Even so, the port battery roared out as the frigate came into range, making solid hits all along the side of the ship. The second ship put her helm up and spilled the wind from her sails. Evidently, she intended to tarry a bit and punish Pitt before resuming her dash for Countess. Merriweather heard firing from starboard again, and looked around. The first frigate had managed to rig a foresail and was creeping up to starboard. Her guns were firing steadily now from both batteries, but somehow the enemy's masts remained intact, and the starboard frigate obviously intended to board. There was nowhere to go. He was caught fast in a trap. There was nothing he could do but try to fight off the attack. Canister! he shouted in desperation as the starboard frigate crashed into the bow, driving Pitt's head around and causing her bowsprit to tangle with the standing rigging of the port frigate. There was a frenzied activity in the ship to port as her hands tried to cut loose the tangle and free themselves, but she had lost her way and the wind inexorably pushed her against Pitt. The guns were almost muzzle to muzzle now, and those that could still fire threw flaming wadding into both ships. Smoke was boiling up through the forward companion, and a party was dragging a length of hose from the pumps, while powder monkeys doused a dozen smaller fires with pails of seawater. He saw the carpenter standing before him, shouting, Near four feet of water in the hold! The words came through with startling clarity. He saw Dobbs look around. Hell, they might sink before they burned. Stop it as best you can, Merriweather told the carpenter, and turned to see a party forming up with cutlasses, pikes and pistols in the waist of the port frigate. Repel boarders! Repel boarders! He shouted and saw the marine detachment on the forecastle drawn up in two rigid ranks, muskets already aimed. The smoke from the volley obscured them, and he looked back to starboard. The batteries of all three ships still fired, not in measured broadsides, but in an irregular tempo as the serviceable pieces managed to reload. There was activity on the deck of the starboard frigate, blue and gold-clad officers rallying a party of French marines, while seamen swung out over the bulwarks to slash at the boarding nets. Pitt would be engulfed from either side, Merriweather thought, as he saw the marines advancing at the double, bayonets extended to meet the first elements of the port side party as they leaped down to the waist. He looked for Dobbs but could not find him in the smoke, then took the double pistols from his belt and discharged them despairingly, one barrel after another aiming into the milling mass of boarders striving to break through the thin line of sepoy marines. He could distinguish no effect, but the four shots must have struck something. The din had become almost rhythmic, 
as though two smiths were alternately striking a gigantic anvil with their sledges. The ships on either hand continued to fire with only an occasional shot from pit now to punctuate the horrid tempo. The scene was a nightmare, worse than the one he had dreamed at Calcutta last year. The situation was hopeless. He would die here, in the approaches to the Gulf of Aden, uselessly, without a glimpse of his own child. A cold tide of terror flooded through him without warning. I shall die, he said, not realizing that he spoke aloud. I do not want to die. I must not die now. He felt his mouth work and saliva run from the corners. Merriweather wiped his chin with the back of his hand as he moved towards the flag halyards, unreasoning panic hastening his steps. He must survive at any cost, and only a single avenue was left. He must strike his colours, surrender the ship and thereby live. He came hard against a sturdy blue-jacketed figure in the murk just forward of the helm. One quartermaster lay already dead, and the other writhed weakly in a puddle of blood. The wheel was unattended, but the ship was going nowhere. He tried to shove past the figure, feeling momentary anger at the unexpected obstacle, then recognized the plain blunt features through the swirling smoke. Captain! shouted Dobbs, his high voice penetrating above the clamor as the smoke of another discharge again engulfed them. Move! shouted Merriweather in desperation using his hands to try to push the officer to one side and reach the halyards. Stand aside! I must strike! Surrender! His voice cracked. Dobbs' face became visible as a slant of wind dispersed the smoke again. His expression was of disbelief, then incredulous dismay, mouth opening, eyes staring before his face began to work crumpling in upon itself as tears started and he wept. God damn the man! Did he possess no imagination, have no desire to live? Merriweather's body tensed to exert the force to shoulder him aside and press past. He shouted again, almost in his ear, I must surrender! There was a shattering blow. Incandescence exploded behind Merriweather's eyes, and he felt himself fly through the air observing with a sense of detachment the curious phenomenon of the mizzen upper works rotating lazily above him. He crashed to the deck on his back and lay stunned, fighting to regain his breath. Was this it? Was this death, the end of his mortal existence? He began to breathe again, and consciousness flowed back through his body. With an effort, he managed to roll over, get to his knees, then shakily on his feet. There was a bloody heap of blue and white rags pitched against the port bulwark beside a dismounted carronade. Dobbs? Merriweather could not bring himself to look. He turned to face forward again. The scene was as though frozen in time, borders still pressing against the marine detachment to port, guns thundering from both sides. There was yet time to reach the halyard, haul down the marine ensign, end this horror. He drew his sword, then staggered towards the pinrail to slash the halyard. He saw movement in the waist of the starboard frigate, men brandishing pikes, cutlasses and pistols, as they poured, shouting across the narrow gap between ships into pit. Good God! Was there time even to surrender? Form lion's mouth! Form lion's mouth! The high-pitched command behind him was audible over the din of the battle. What? The command made no sense to him as he whirled around to look. That child, Marlow, was running forward, cutlass in one hand, a glowing length of slow match dripping sparks in the other. The hands from the starboard quarter-deck carronades were snatching cutlasses and pikes from the racks. Even as he wondered, the boy reached the three-pound boat howitzer set just forward of the mizzen and jammed the slow-match into the touch-hole. 
A hat full of musket balls fired at point-blank range was a fearsome thing. It cut an expanding swathe through the boarding party from starboard, and Merriweather joined Midshipman Marlow in leading the screeching, shouting lion's mouth charge to fall upon the shaken survivors, driving them willy-nilly across the deck. Some managed to scramble back into the Frenchmen, but the majority were cut down or dropped their weapons in surrender. He came to a halt, seeing blood on his sword and a trickle blinding his left eye. He had not felt the blow, but his fingers found the slash across his forehead into his hair. No time to stop. Hamlin was now leading the lion's mouth force to fall on the flank of the port boarding party as Marlow crouched on the deck, shoe off, blood oozing through the toe of his stocking. There came the crash of a broadside of many guns from somewhere forward. Good God! What now? Had the crippled frigate somehow revived and joined the action? He ran towards the forecastle, leaping up the ladder to peer forward through the smoke, as the breeze rolled it back to reveal Countess of Surrey for a moment, before her eighteen-pounders roared out again. She was lying less than a hundred yards dead ahead of the portside frigate, sails brailed up, every raking shot crashing through the length of the Frenchman. Merriweather looked about as though in a dream, wondering when he would awake with a start to find himself back in the lodgings at Calcutta with Caroline beside him. It was only a moment ago that he was ready to betray himself, his men, and the marine by hauling down, striking his colours, intent only on preserving his own life. And Dobbs was gone, dead, struck down by a cannonball even as he tried to push the young officer out of the way in his craven attempt to surrender. But it was no nightmare he knew seeing the long pivot gun on the forecastle smashed and dismounted. The mutilated bodies strewn about it were real enough, but he was thankful that he did not recognize Larkins among them. He stood, sword dangling from his nerveless hand as the breeze pushed the smoke back again to reveal Comet and Ariel lying just ahead of the starboard frigate, pumping broadside after broadside into the Frenchman. Five minutes later, the port frigate hauled down her colours, quickly followed by her consort, and silence descended on the scene. The chaos was deadly serious. It was touch and go where the pit would sink under them before they could get the sail fothered under her bottom to check the torrent of water that poured through the gaping wound on her starboard side at every roll in the long swell. Boats from Comet, Ariel, Vigilant, and Countess disgorged parties of artisans armed with the tools of their trades, and the men joined the frenzied activity, rigging pumps, moving the carronades across the deck to give the ship a port list, plugging shot holes. The surgeon assigned to the escort force came on board with his mates and lob lolly boys and dived below to the sick bay. Merriweather made no conscious decisions. The instinct of a lifetime at sea served him. McRae, out of Comet, ensured execution of his orders. The crews of the escort vessels were decimated to furnish the prize crews for the frigates, and soon the flag of the Bombay Marine was flying over three French tricolours. The lines to the sail, now stretched over the side and bottom of the ship, were just being secured when the thought struck Merriweather. McRae! The transports! Somewhere over the horizon to the south were ships filled with French soldiers bound for some point in the Gulf of Cambay to assist the uprising against Holkar in Rajputana. The small Scots officer looked at him, the cast in his eye evident. Dinner worry a muckle about them, Captain said McCrae in the thick accent that he affected in moments of stress. They will go nowhere now. We have the she-tiger and her cub battened down below decks. And Cosby's dead. Dead? He met my marines on deck with pistols and was hit on the head with a musket butt. 
just a wee bit too hard. Just as well. It would have been a sticky affair to bring a company maritime service captain to trial for treason. His officers claim they did not know his motives or intentions, they only obeyed orders. I left my marines aboard to make sure they continued to do so, and brought her here as fast as she would sail. Her gun crews made an excellent practice, I thought, considering that they are merchant seamen. Yes, you saved Pitt, and me. A wave of nausea flowed through him, and he felt an almost overwhelming compulsion to blurt out the nearness of his surrender and his blind panic. But he managed to control himself. He saw McCrae looking at him with concern. Do you feel all right, Captain? That cut? It's only a flea bite. And now if you'll be kind enough to send off your press gang to pick up Laskers from the convoy to man the pumps, I'll be much obliged. It was after midnight when he came into the flag cabin to throw himself fully clothed on the cot that had survived the bombardment and sleep until dawn. McCrae sat wearily in the stern sheets of Comet's gig as it pulled away from Pitt. It had been touch and go as to whether they would save the frigate, but with the sail now fothered under her starboard side, the flooding had been checked to the point where the pumps could just barely contain it, and the Laskers impressed from the country ships in the convoy provided a fresh reservoir of manpower to serve them. By moving guns and water casks to port to induce a list, the shattered planking might be exposed sufficiently to permit more permanent repairs. He had left all of the carpenters out of the escort force aboard to lend assistance, and they would work through the night, plugging holes and caulking the lower gun ports in preparation for the ship to be heeled over. It had been a long yesterday. Now it was halfway through the mid-watch in a new day, and McCrae felt his body slumping. He realised now that he had been on edge ever since Merriweather assigned him to the duty of holding Countess on a short tether. If the decision had been left to him, he would have landed a detachment of marines on her deck, put the mastery in irons, and hang the consequences. Still, he could not appreciate the considerations that had dictated otherwise. As for Merriweather, he had appeared to be in a daze, though he had given every proper order to save Pitt. When McCrae arrived on board at the head of his rescue and salvage party, it was as though he was a stranger, silent, withdrawn, looking past him as though he were unable to focus, even a perceptible hesitation in his usual brisk gait. Intent on collaring Countess, McCrae had missed much of the tactical manoeuvres by which the deadly frigate action had been played out, but he had observed the last few minutes as he conned the Indiaman into position, and had seen the inferno Merriweather had survived with the three ships locked together, and many of the enemy guns still in action. As for his own role in the action, he characteristically minimised the part he had played. He had done no more than the duty enjoined upon every officer in the Marine, engaged the enemy with all the force he could bring to bear. He thought with deep regret of young Dobbs, destined to be committed to the deep this day. The boy had developed into a first-rate navigator and ship handler, and his single-handed attention to duty made him a most desirable junior officer. Hard lines. And Hamlin had confided that Dobbs was betrothed to a young lady down at Georgetown. McCrae was sure he remembered the girl from the ball there last year. Hard lines. And Larkin, that confident, sanguine, proud American lying even now in a drugged sleep amid the horrors of the loblolly, his left arm amputated above the elbow. His philosophy and way of life were at variance with McRae's tidy, cautious, Calvinistic Scots nature, always pessimistically expecting the worst. 
but he respected the man's courage, abilities, and plain-spoken common sense. Of course, Nelson had gone on to glory after losing an arm, but in a service such as the Bombay Marine, it could be a well-nigh insurmountable handicap, and he could not see Larkin accepting some safe shore billet to wait out the years until retirement. He heard the hail and the coxswain's reply, Comet, and came back to the present as he mounted the ladder. His steward had laid out tea with biscuit and a pot of jam, and Macrae was suddenly ravenous. He had done all he could for the present to aid Pitt, and he felt the necessity for a medicinal dram for himself before he began the repast. He felt the whisky expand through his body, dissipating some of the fatigue, and he ate the biscuit, heaped with preserves with relish. Finished, he felt a craving for the pipe he occasionally took. Tobacco was shaved off the plug and tamped into the clay bowl, then lighted with a spill from the lamp. When it was drawing well, he sat back, blue smoke eddying over his head, and thought again of Merriweather. He recalled his first meeting with the man almost three years ago in the chamber of Commodore Wellchance in Downing Street. Only the fortuitous presence of a newly promoted captain in London had deprived McClellan of the command of Rapid on her dash to rescue the governor-designate of Madras from that pirate Abercrombie. But McClellan had never resented the fact. McRae could confess some initial reservations. He had not known Merriweather before that day. But the manner in which he had unmoored a strange ship in close quarters in the Thames had won his seaman's heart. The captain normally possessed an optimistic outgoing nature, and the bleak disconsolation he had exhibited since the action was at variance with any mood McRae had previously observed. Something was seriously wrong. Had the man lost his nerve in that horrendous battle yesterday? McRae was instantly ashamed of the thought, though he had seen such instances in the past. He recalled Hamlin's first-handed account of the action. Three-fourths of our guns were out of action. Gunny was barely holding off the borders to port when they came pouring over from starboard, Hamlin had said, rolling his eyes for dramatic effect. I thought it was too late even to surrender, that we would just sink with colours flying. And then that cub Marlow fired the boat gun full of musket balls into them, and he and the captain, with me following like a fool, went dashing down the deck, shouting and waving our hangers just as you appeared off the bow. That account did not square with McRae's half-formed theory that Merriweather had lost his nerve. There was something missing, overlooked, but he could not fathom what it was. Ah, wheel, no need to trouble himself further at this hour of the morning. He was almost asleep when his father's old comment upon the village eccentric came unbidden into his mind. Just like my old razor, honed too fine, and it cracked. Macrae chuckled and drifted off. It was mid-morning when Merriweather picked up the quartermaster's notebook and rough deck log from Gaffner, the gnomish little quartermaster, in the navigator's tubby, and read them to refresh his recollection. A short length of plank balanced across his knees had to serve as a desk. The list of the ship made the one that had survived in the flag cabin temporarily unusable. He braced himself and wrote his report on deck as the sound of hammers and saws pervaded the ship. The carpenter and his mates were over the side fitting new planking to replace the splintered section at the waterline. Once that was accomplished, the ship could be righted and the other leaks dealt with. Both his sleeping and day cabins were a shambles, desk and cot smashed, and a carronade dismounted and hurled bodily through the bulkhead that separated his quarters from the flag cabin. But repairs to living areas held a low priority as compared to hull damage. He drank the cup of tea that Sang had just refilled for him, and looked again with horror at the summary of the casualty list that Buttram and Mefford had compiled for him. Killed in action thirty-nine, wounded forty-two, of whom eight are accounted mortal. 
almost a fifth of his crew dead or disabled. It was still hard to believe that the steady, earnest, reliable Dobbs was gone, struck down by a round shot. What was left of his sturdy body had been found pitched against the port bulwarks between two of the quarter-deck carronades. And Larkin, that American free spirit able to take any event in his stride, left with only one arm. Boson Caldwell had lost a foot, and there had been another ten amputations. It was cold comfort that the three French frigates had also suffered severely. Two of them lay hove to a cable's length on either side of Pitt, water pouring from their scuppers. And the third frigate was a mile south, a stumpy jury rig now replacing her mainmast. Dillon, first in Comet, had come over to act as first in Pitt. Hamlin now held the new dignity of acting third lieutenant, and Bowman the leading boatswain's mate, and acting warrant as boatswain. Shouts came from over the side, and the carpenter with his mates were hoisted on deck. The ship was no longer in imminent danger of sinking, though the pumps manned by the sixty Laskers recruited from the convoy clanked steadily as they sucked out the water in the lower holds. Now the Herculean task of moving the guns and water casks back to starboard would commence. As each gun was moved, the list would diminish, making the job progressively easier. With the working parties out of the escort force to provide the manpower, he might expect an even keel by mid-afternoon. Merriweather dipped the pen into the inkwell and continued his report. Having shot away bowsprit, foresails, and spanker, as well as inflicting severe hull damage to Glorieuse, her consort, Thetis wore across Pitt's stern to engage her to port. As Pitt was wearing to port to counter this manoeuvre, her four topmast and headsails were shot away, making the ship unmanageable and causing her to collide with Thetis. Glorieuse managed to come along the starboard side, and heavy cannonading by all three ships continued. Thetis organized a boarding party, and managed to reach Pitt's deck, where it was contained, and then repulsed by the Sepoy Marine Detachment, under the able command of Jemadar Gunny. A second boarding party from Glorieuse also reached the deck to starboard, where it was met and destroyed by a lion's mouth charge most gallantly organized and led by midshipman Paul Marlow, formerly of the Honorable Company's bomb catch Vesuvius. At this point, Captain E. McCray of HCS Comet, having seized control of Countess of Surrey from her master, brought her in company with Ariel and Comet across the bows of the French ships, from which point Heavy cannonading persuaded them to strike within the quarter hour. Merriweather went back to read the bald report. Words could not express the inferno that had engulfed Pitt during that last interval, but some of the men who read it had experience that would enable them to understand. He wondered if any of them had been beset by blind, unreasoning panic, to the point that they would have hauled down their colours. Then he re-read the account to see if the terror showed through the words of the account. Not Waldron, certainly, nor Tollett. They were men of iron nerves, devoid of fear. He was bitterly ashamed of his moment of weakness, the sudden overwhelming compulsion to save his own life at whatever cost. But for Marlow, he would be a prisoner of that French captain over there, broken, dishonoured his career at an end. Merriweather stared blindly at the sheet of foolscap. He had made no overt move to betray his cowardice, his intent to surrender Pitt. No living man could accuse him, but he would carry to his grave the memory of the expression on poor Dobbs's face just before he was struck down. He shook his head as though to erase the recollection, and resumed the report. The gallantry, enterprise, and resource of Captain McCray of Comet and Captain Pegram of Ariel in coming to the succour of Pitt is entitled to great praise, 
and is in accordance with the highest traditions of the Marine. The escort force under the command of Captain Robert McCracken, joined by HCS Vigilant, Captain Joseph Whaley, interposed itself resolutely between the enemy and the convoy and prevented loss. The report was finally finished as Pitt came almost on an even keel again. Larkin, Dobbs and Caldwell praised in their mutilation and death, and Hamlin mentioned for his leadership of the last charge on the flank of the port boarding party. The ink had dried in the breeze almost as fast as the words were written, and there was no need to sand the sheet. He was preparing to rise when Sang came up before him to stand silently, head bowed, until he should be noticed. Yes. Sir, I have cleaned the flag cabin and moved your gear into it. The desk and cot are usable. Good, I'll come down. He stopped at the inkwell, gathered the sheets of his report, and followed Sang. The cabin was habitable, though marred. The dismounted carronade still jammed against the port side with a huge hole in the bulkhead through which it had come, allowing him to see his own ruined quarters. He had a long way yet to go in his report, since he had omitted all mention of Madame By and Captain Cosby from his report of the action, which was strictly marine business. Now he must prepare a separate account of the curious train of events involving the pair that had culminated in yesterday's bitter engagement, which should be of interest to company and government. Napier's intelligence had been uncannily accurate. There could be no doubt now that Madame By had conspired with the French to mount a venture designed to unseat Holkar and place his son Malhar on the throne of Rajputana. Once accomplished, she would be the effective ruler of the most powerful state in the Maratha Confederation, and with her ties by blood and affinity with the French, would also be in a position to do incalculable harm to the company's interests in central India. Tulsi Bai had easily enough subverted the gullible Captain Cosby and bent him to her will with her feminine wiles. Merriweather recalled McRae's laconic report in the flickering lantern light last night, as all hands fought to save the ship from floundering. A hell cat she were, Captain, the small Scots officer had told him, gingerly touching the three glistening red furrows across his right cheek. Screeching, biting and kicking, four men could hardly hold her. We finally got irons on her and locked her in the cabin. Cosby had died ignominiously, his head broken with a musket butt, as he still sought to serve the woman in his infatuation. The officers of the Indiaman had disclaimed all knowledge or responsibility for Cosby's actions. They had merely followed orders, they said, which was reasonable enough, though they had confessed themselves puzzled by Comet's strenuous efforts to stop their ship. Having met Cosby, Merriweather was inclined to give them full faith and credit for their testimony. McRae had finally risked collision to come close enough to grapple Countess of Surrey, and though suffering some damage in the process, to get a boarding party on deck. Once informed of the true situation, the officers and hands in Countess had been delighted to join in the dash to succour Pitt and under McRae's command had fired the half-dozen raking broadsides that induced the Frenchman to surrender. Where to begin? Merriweather felt the sweat begin to run under his arms as the sun rose towards a meridian. The flag captain had no vent or wind sail fitted, and he had been more comfortable on deck. Before he could decide his point of beginning, Sang announced Lieutenant Dillon, Come. Dillon was a tall, broad, pleasant man, Comet's first, and a man of many accomplishments. Sir, your purser says he will pipe the hands to mess in half an hour. I thought it might be as good a time as any for the burial services. In this heat. The officer was right, of course. Get it over with. Right. Pipe all hands, Mr. Dillon. He wondered if he could extemporize the service for the burial of the dead at sea. 
the shelf of books that Caroline had painstakingly assembled for him last winter, had been hurled across his cabin, scattered, some of them with their backs broken, and the Book of Common Prayer had been among them, and make a signal to the convoy and escorts. A moment later, Sang laid the book on his desk, and he sought out the place. The volume fell open to the page. The convoy had its flags at half-mast as Merriweather came on deck to read the service for forty-one canvas-shrouded corpses. Two more had died since Buttram's report. Indeed, there were so many that they had to be slid over the side in relays from half a dozen planks covered only briefly by the Bombay Marine Ensign before they would make sullen splashes alongside. The hands were formed up by divisions in sober-faced ranks. "'Attention on deck! Off hats!' sang out Dylan. Merriweather's finger marked the place in the prayer book, and he read the twenty-third psalm, paused, then began the sonorous phrases of the ritual for the burial of the dead at sea, culminating in the sentence of committal. And the corruptible bodies of those who sleep in him shall be changed and made like unto his glorious body, according to the mighty workings whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. Merriweather nodded to the hands manning the planks, and in unison they were tilted as the sea received its first instalment of the heroic dead. Among them, he knew, was what was left of poor John Dobbs. The hands lifted another corpse onto each plank, and Merriweather again intoned the committal. By the third repetition he knew it by rote, and no longer needed to read from the page. When the last five had made their plunge, he spoke out to the hands. Let us pray. Our Father, who art? The hands joined in, heads bowed, earnest voices rumbling along in unison to the Amen. Dylan looked at him for the signal to dismiss. Merriweather had never attempted to deliver a eulogy on such occasions in the past, but in his present state of conscience he felt compelled to make some expression of his gratitude to the departed, and to those who survived for their magnificent performance of duty yesterday. With his inner sense of shame, he might well make a botch of it, expose himself to ridicule. But he must make the effort. He tried to shape the words in his mind. Men, my thanks to you is a puny reward for your courage and devotion to duty during the late action with the enemy, and even that I am unable to express. No, it would never do far too stilted and insincere. He tried to think, conscious of the ranks of brown faces, every eye fixed on him thinking how he would have failed these men, let their valour go to waste. He cleared his throat, still raw from the powder fumes, and plunged ahead. His voice felt thin and shrill when he spoke, but the words came from his heart. Men, my thanks, and God bless you. He turned to the purser. You may serve out a double ration of spirits, Mr. Davis. On hats, commanded Dillon. Dismiss. The formation dissolved, the hands solemn in demeanour. There was no skylarking or cheers at the announcement. The ceremony would have to be repeated an unknown number of times in the days to come, Merriweather knew as gangrene and other complications took their grim toll of the mortally wounded. It was a gloomy prospect, but he would face each day as it came. For the present, with the flooding stopped, he would get the spare mainyard fished to the stump of the foremast and carry enough sail to permit Pitt to steer a course across the Arabian Sea to Bombay, where the Parsi shipbuilder Jamsetji would make her whole again. As he turned to go below, he saw the wizened quartermaster, Dobbs's special favourite, Gaffner, squeeze into the line of hands drawing their issue as spirits, panikin in hand. 
when the burial ceremonies have been completed and the hands lined up for the issue of spirits, Gaffner left his refuge in the navigator's cubby beside the after companion. When a man is over forty, barely five feet tall and a scant seven stone in weight, he has learned to avoid jostling deckhands as much as possible. His stature, or lack of it, had made him the butt of many pranks at the hands of callous seamen these past thirty years. Only last week, that ape, Bowman, now promoted to acting bosun, had picked him up by the scruff of the neck and held him out at arm's length to the vast entertainment of a score of mirthful idlers. Well, he told himself viciously, Bowman's new rank and dignity as a warrant officer would not avail to shield him. He would repay the insult with interest at a suitable time and place, but in such manner that there could be no retribution. He slipped past the line of men drawing their ration to insert himself ahead of a friendly face, panicking in hand, pretending not to see the captain pass as he went aft, then withdrew to sip the liquor in the privacy of the cubby. The only person for whose death he had felt something resembling grief since his mother died had just been given the deep six. Mr. Dobbs had treated him with dignity and consideration, had selected him from all the other quartermasters to be his assistant at celestial observations and trusted him to have the sextants laid out, initial error noted, hack watch compared with the chronometer, notebook and lead pencils in hand. Gaffner wondered who would succeed him as navigator. Not McCamey, surely. He would be a fortnight just completing the computations, and then they would be dead wrong. Hamlin just might do, but he tended to be erratic in mood and a little too high-handed for his taste. He sipped the spirits, savouring every drop, sorrowful when the pannikin was drained but enjoying the sense of well-being they engendered. Gaffner had neither the strength nor weight to stand a trick at the wheel, but he could measure the altitude of sun, moon, or stars as accurately as Mr. Dobbs and work out the equations almost as rapidly. It was an unlikely enough accomplishment for a cockney waif, orphaned at six, living on the verge of starvation during his childhood, but he had managed it. He thought of the unfrocked schoolmaster who eked out a living as a scrivener in the cheap side row where he had lived who had befriended him. The man had lost his position at a private school because he liked little boys too well. But Gaffner had been willing to accommodate him in exchange for food, shelter, and being taught to read and write and cipher. He had early concluded that he could never make his way by manual strength, but he might live by his wits if he possessed an education. And he had obtained enough to suffice. He thought again of Lieutenant Dobbs, the broad, sturdy torso and powerful legs. He had admired his physique. That was the body he would have chosen rather than this frail, scrawny one. Only one other man had he actually envied, both for his physical endowments and native cunning, and that was Osborne the gypsy acrobat, who had cheated the hangman at Bombay last spring. He shuddered at the thought of the man. With him, dead Gaffner's secret was safe enough. But for a period of weeks before the date of execution, Gaffner had been petrified with fear lest Osborne inform on him. He had known of the conspiracy among some of the old hands in Pitt, and had explicitly agreed with the top man to navigate the ship to the South Seas, where the mutineers proposed to commence a new life in the fashion of bounty. But Osborne had not peached, and no one else in the plot knew of his commitment. He had taken no part in the attempt, had in fact been tied up along with Dobbs and the others in the quarter-deck middle watch. He put the pannikin away regretfully and sat on his stool leaning back against the bulkhead, wondering once again that he was serving in the Bombay Marine at all, and what might have been his lot had the mutiny succeeded. The anomaly of a London urchin who wrote a fair hand and could spell had attracted the attention of the Thames shipping agent. 
when Gaffner discovered that he was doing the work of men three times his age in drafting bills of lading for starvation wages, he had helped himself to the money in the till one night, and stowed away in an Indiaman berthed at Blackwall. He was discovered after the ship had cleared land's end, and spent the balance of the voyage to Bombay at hard labour in the scullery. With the perennial shortage of European seamen, particularly one who could read and write, he had found a berth as ship's boy and powder monkey in the marine, eventually to rise to quartermaster. Gaffner, in his time, has served a score of competent navigators, and soon knew as much of the theory as most of them. But he was content with his billet and the perquisites that went with it. One other accomplishment he possessed that he never mentioned was the ability to read lips. The schoolmaster of his childhood had instructed him in the art, and with his prying, secretive nature, Gaffner enjoyed eavesdropping on conversations quite beyond ordinary earshot. He had become privy to many otherwise well-kept secrets, as well as scandals and assignations, but he merely stored the memorable episodes in the dark recesses of his mind, to be extracted and savoured again from time to time. A shadow darkened the door, and he looked around to see Merriweather. "'Good afternoon,' said the captain. Gaffner noted for the second time this day the frown and stern set of the brown face, in contrast with the startling white expanse of scar tissue across his right cheek. He had never exchanged much more than a score of words with Merriweather, a few aye aye, sirs, and perhaps a brief response to an inquiry as to wind, weather, or position. I return the notebook and deck log with my thanks. Gaffner took them and placed them in the locker without comment. It had been Gaffner's duty to keep the quartermaster's notebook at general quarters under the supervision of Dobbs as officer of the watch. It recorded in exact chronological order. Every command, change of course, alteration in sail, or other event affecting the operation of the ship. Gaffner had turned the half-hour-glass as regulations prescribed, but had also consulted the navigational watch to fix the precise times. He already knew that yesterday's action had consumed two hours and eleven minutes from the first broadside into the French frigate to the time the last enemy ship hauled down her colours. Now, in this second encounter with the captain in a matter of hours, Gaffner did not meet his eyes, lest he somehow betray his secret knowledge. Gaffner resumed his perch on the stool, and leaned back comfortably against the bulkhead, closing his eyes. This should be a delicious interlude of total recall, he told himself, as he extracted his latest secret for its first examination since the event itself. Yesterday, during the final moments of the action, he had been crouched on hands and knees, sheltering the half-hour-glass and notebook with his body, scuttling back and forward to stay within reach of the captain and Mr. Dobbs, and be sure of catching and recording each order and event. It had been a soul-searing experience, the worst of his life, but he had performed his duty. Now he experienced a thrill of expectation as the drama began. I shall die. I don't want to die. I must not die now. The recollection of the saliva dripping from the corners of the captain's mouth added titillation to the utterance, and he hugged himself with ecstasy at the recollection. Dobbs had faced the captain, and he had heard not read on his lips the greeting above the din of battle. Captain! Gaffner treasured the moment, visualising again the scene in his mind. It was the last utterance of a man he had admired. He anticipated the climax of the scene, and hugged himself again. Move! Stand aside, Merriweather had said, trying to press past Dobbs. I must strike. Surrender. He recalled the sequence of expression that crossed Dobbs's face, feeling a lump rise in his throat at the memory. 
disbelief at first, incredulous dismay, mouth-opening, eyes staring. Then how his face began to work as tears started. And the captain's final words as Mr. Dobbs was struck down. I must surrender. Gaffner contemplated the scene for a long moment more, then put the secret back into its compartment in his mind, until such time as he should again desire to extract and re-examine it. Gaffner opened his eyes. The word was being passed on deck to make all preparations for getting under way. Gaffner gathered up the accoutrements of his trade and went aft to stand in his customary position just abaft the helm. It was stifling hot below decks in officers' country. No breeze penetrated here, as Hamlin and Marlow made an inventory of the personal effects of Lieutenant, late, John Dobbs of the Bombay Marine. There were garments, shoes and boots, and a sword to be stowed in the sea chest, along with a small library of books, all treating of navigation, seamanship, astronomy, and geography. A leather pouch with a drawstring contained a dozen gold guineas, assorted rupee pieces, and a worn gold band, possibly his mother's wedding ring, along with a horn-handled clasp knife, badly nicked, the homely accumulations of twenty-one years of a young man's life. Merriweather sat in the one chair in the cramped room, sweat trickling under his arms, as Hamlin called off each item and Marlow entered it on the inventory to be signed, sealed, and witnessed. One writing kit, poor order, said Hamlin. One sheaf of notes entitled... Notes and observations on the new American method of navigation by Lieutenant John Dobbs, Honourable Company's Marine. I'll take those, said Merriweather. They go to Captain Wilkerson, the fleet navigator. So noted, said Hamlin. Here is a packet of letters and some unfinished ones as well, though two are pretty well crumpled. Johnny was in correspondence with Judith Johnson down at Penang, you know and he might want to forward them, though they seemed to be more drafts than finished letters. The gloomy task was finished, and all three officers signed the inventory. Back in the ruined flag cabin, he laid the packet and the two crumpled balls of foolscap in the basket on the desk. He was in no mood to write the letter of regret and condolence to the next of kin, whoever that might be. There would be time enough on the voyage to Bombay. Each thought of Dobbs revived the spectre of his panic at the crux of the battle, the unreasoning desire to live at any cost, and his shameful determination to surrender the ship to achieve survival. The memory of the expression on Dobbs's face haunted him. Merriweather wished for a moment that Dobbs had not been so stubborn. Had he stepped aside, the ball would have struck Merriweather instead. Oh, hell, this train of thought could lead to madness. But his mind would not leave off the morbid train of thoughts, as he stared blindly out the shattered stern lights. There was no doubt, he told himself, Pitt had been in extremis a frigate of equal force locked to either side, battering away with their heavy guns as musket balls rained from their fighting tops to decimate the topside hands. And then, when the portside boarding party had been just barely contained by Gunny's marines, the second attack had come leaping across the gap from the starboard frigate to race aft. At that point, even as he drew his sword to cut the flag halyard, who could have predicted that Marlow would leap into the breach? No, he tried to tell himself. As the situation appeared at the moment, he formed his resolve to surrender. It was the only prudent decision. To resist further would have been only a vainglorious sacrifice of lives to sell a foolhardy pride. But his logic failed even to convince himself. The very fact that Pitt had survived the action, by whatever chance, proved the fallacy of his arguments. 
Naval history was replete with instances where resolute men had snatched victory from the jaws of defeat. Hopeless as the situation might seem, it could appear quite different through the eyes of the enemy, Captain. No, he had intended with all his craven heart to surrender, and he would never trust his courage and resolution again. Better to resign from the Marine and find a less demanding calling. Something touched his ankle, and he came back to the present with a start. It was the tiger-striped kitten Tipu Sultan Sang had adopted, but his appearance was materially altered from the last time Meriwether had seen him. He now had only a raw stump to mark the place where his saucy little spike of a tail had waved. God, even the cat had been maimed in the action. Hello, little fellow. He picked him up and examined the wound. It appeared to be healing cleanly, and the kitten began to purr. Then escaped from his hands to the desk top, there to bat the crumpled balls of foolscap about in the basket. Evidently the cat was in no present pain and had accepted his loss philosophically. Meriwether nudged one of the playthings, and the kitten sprang on it, then seized his hand with forepaws, rolling on his back to kick clawlessly with his hind feet, alternately gnawing at his knuckles and then licking them with his rough tongue. The cat had spirit. He did not permit his wounds to daunt him. Sang! I think young Tipu requires some refreshment. Sang took the kitten back to the pantry. The antics of the animal had been a pleasant diversion for his gloomy thoughts. One of the crumpled sheets had been knocked out of the basket by the cat and lay in the centre of the desk half unfolded. There was writing visible in Dobbs's small, precise hand. Without willing it, Meriwether could read the salutation. My dearest Judy, and part of the first line. Wonderful news. Curiosity overcame him. He flattened the sheet and read the balance of the unfinished paragraph. I may be able to get leave enough to come to Penang this autumn, and if I do, will you marry? The writing stopped, but there followed several irregular repetitions of names. Judith Johnson, then, Mistress John Dobbs, in much embellished script, Judith Johnson Dobbs, and in shaded block letters, Lieutenant and Mrs. John Dobbs. There followed a series of geometric abstractions, then a stylized heart with the initials J.J. and J.D. entwined on the spoiled sheet. Obviously the young man had been indulging a pleasant fantasy visualising a not-too-distant day in which Judith Johnson would be Mrs. John Dobbs. Meriwether felt a sudden sense of shame at thus peering unbidden into the soul and secret heart of a young man. But it was too late to recall his impulse. Seeing this pitiful memoir of an idyll shattered by a cannonball, Meriwether was sick at heart. He felt worse even guiltier than before his spirits had momentarily been revived by the playful kitten. There was no remedy. A mere resignation was not enough. Death by his own hand was the only expiation for his failure. But lest he compound his sins, he must first bring the convoy safely to Surat in accordance with his orders. There was a knock on the door, and the carpenter and bowman, the leading boatswain's mate, wearing the new dignity of an acting warrant as boatswain, came in. Sir, said Mr. Svensson, if we hit no full gales, I think the ship floats until we reach port. Bowman agreed, showing his broken teeth. Souvenirs of his long fight from the lower deck up to boatswain, the king of warrant officers. And the main yard is fished and stayed, and the sails bent on ready to set for it. Very good. Ask Mr. Dillon to see me at his convenience, and you may pass the word to make all preparations for getting under way. Merriweather resolutely refused to let his mind return to the morbid thoughts of a moment ago. 
he concentrated upon the signals necessary to get the convoy moving again, and the course he must set to raise Surat. Wearing the twin dignities of acting third lieutenant and navigator of a 36-gun frigate at age 18, had not changed the outward appearance or manner of midshipman Hamlin. Always inclined to be cocksure and a bit impatient with those who possessed slower wits than his, the young officer was already looking past the examining board for lieutenant at Bombay in September as a mere formality. Once commissioned, he was certain that his rise in the marine would be nothing less than meteoric. However, he did not let his thoughts dwell on the future bright as it appeared, but concentrated on keeping Pitt on course under her clumsy jury rig. Unbalanced as it was, with a spare mainyard serving as a stumpy foremast, he had soon discovered the tendency of the bow to wander. The helmsman seemed incapable of assimilating this simple fact, and for the third time in this afternoon watch he saw the luff of the spanker beginning to tremble, evidence that the ship had gone off course again. "'Mind your helm!' he told the quartermaster sharply. The man was sulky and resentful in manner, and for a moment Hamlin was tempted to skin him alive in Larkin's idiom. Then he restrained himself. The hands had had a hard enough time during and since the battle day before yesterday, and this man was a striker endeavouring to replace one of the two quartermasters killed in action. The thought immediately revived memories of poor Johnny Dobbs, as the two junior officers in Rapid, Dobbs and Hamlin had naturally gravitated towards one another, though there was a marked contrast in their characters. Dobbs had been slow, methodical, tenacious, single-minded in his performance of duty and lacking in small talk. Hamlin was quick, mercurial in temperament, ready to believe the worst of his fellow man, inclined to gloss over routine housekeeping chores and articulate in the civilised prattle taught by the public schools of England. While he had been Larkin's junior watch officer, he had preferred to call on Dobbs to explain a knotty problem in seamanship or navigation, and had found him willing to stand even an occasional watch, in the rare instances when the ship had been in port and he had a pressing social engagement ashore. He thought now of Judith Johnson down at Georgetown, not a particularly pretty little girl, and he had sheared away from her when he discovered that her flow of conversation was not only constant but unsophisticated. He preferred women a bit older than himself at this point. They were usually more approachable by a fluent, polished younger man with keen Norman good looks. But Johnny and Judith had hit it off and Dobbs had confided only last month that she had accepted his proposal of marriage within the year. He wondered, as he watched the compass card come back to the base course, what those crumpled balls of foolscap on the desk had contained. Under the stern eye of the captain, he had dared not look. With the innate snobbery of a scion of the gentry, albeit a third son and compelled by the entail to make his own way, Hamlin had never made an effort to ingratiate himself beyond the necessities of the service with Captain Merriweather. The man had risen from the lower deck, and while Hamlin maintained correct professional relations, he considered Merriweather his social inferior by several degrees, since he had not entered the marine by the genteel route of midshipman or even volunteer. Still, Merriweather had been entirely fair to him and had promised his recommendation as qualified to take the examination for lieutenant at Bombay. Mind your helm, he said for the fourth time, and the watch barely half over. Pitt's motion had grown a bit sluggish, he decided, and time to pump again. Turn those laskers out. Man the pumps, he told the boatswain's mate of the watch. And mind you have the carpenters sound the well before they start. It was important, Dillon had insisted, that they establish the rate of leakage. But for the last twenty-four hours, one hour of pumping out of each four had sufficed to clear the bilges. 
and the carpenter was still finding and plugging holes. The thought recalled the holocaust he had survived. He remembered with contempt his bright observation that an engagement with three frigates of equal force should be an interesting affair. Even the action with those privateers in the Straits last year had not prepared him for the reality of an all-out naval battle. And the captain had hung on beyond reason to the point where it became a foolhardy slaughter. Hang the glory and prize money. Life was more precious than either. Hamlin wondered suddenly if regret for the men killed and wounded was the cause for the captain's gloomy preoccupation since the battle. In his year and a half of service under Merriweather, he had never seen the man in so bleak and melancholy a mood. He wondered what secret guilt might be concealed behind the taciturn, scarred face. Hamlin's father was fond of saying that he could read peculation in the mien and manner of an embezzling estate agent long before the rent books revealed the fact that no man was capable of entirely concealing a guilty conscience. That woman. Suddenly he was sure she was the cause of Merriweather's dejection. Of course. The time was almost exactly right since her mysterious visit last week. The saintly Merriweather had bedded her in his cabin, and she had peppered him. He almost chuckled at the thought, though it was enough to give concern to any man returning to a wife after long absence. He would make a discreet inquiry of Mefford or Buttram to confirm his theory, but he was convinced in his own mind of the reason for the captain's remorse. Hamlin finished his watch in high spirits, elated at having divined Merriweather's guilty secret. The third day, there was enough of a blow to cause the convoy to shorten sail, and Merriweather and the carpenter concern. Merriweather Dillon, Mr. Svensson, and the acting boatswain were down in the middle hold, where a mare's nest of timbers braced the shattered frames on the starboard side. The ship was working enough in the sea that the seams in the outer planking alternately opened and closed, spewing oakum and admitting jets of seawater at every roll. Four carpenter's mates were fitting yet another brace designed to stop the movement, and two others were hammering home spikes and wedges in the existing braces to take up the slack. Bowman had a party of seamen standing by with pots of molten tar on bundles of oakum but it was useless to try to cork the seams until the planking had been immobilized. "'It will four new rib take to make her whole,' grumbled the carpenter. "'Easy in the graving, Doc, but we only make patchwork here.' "'Well,' said Murrayweather, "'we are only pumping twelve out of the twenty-four hours so far, even with this blow. "'If the sea moderates, we should still make Bombay.' He and Dillon came back on deck, passing the off-watch Laskers sprawled in the shade of the mainsail, while their mates swayed at the brakes of the pumps. He could never have kept the ship afloat except for these dark, muscular men. I'll pay my call on the wounded now, he told Dillon. The gun deck was serving as a hospital, wind sails rigged at two hatches diverting a cooling breeze along it. Pallets and a few cots covered the deck, each occupied by a wounded man. There were fewer sounds of misery today than yesterday. There had been three more corpses to bury in the sea this morning, but now the race was against gangrene. All those men who had been accounted mortally wounded on Buttram's initial report had died, and Buttram would account himself a failure for each that succumbed hereafter from the complications of infection. Loblolly attendants passed along the rows, doling out water and easing the positions of the casualties, while Buttram and Mefford were bent in consultation over a cot forward. Some of the men spoke to greet him, others lifted a shaky hand in salute, and some merely acknowledged him with their eyes. The doctors looked up. Good morning, Captain, they said almost in unison. Don't let me interfere. Carry on. We've completed morning round, sir. Dressing's all changed, said Buttram. 
All these slugbeds have to do now is wait for the next issue of medicinal brandy and then have dinner while they're deciding how to spend their prize money. There was an appreciative titter down the deck, as Merriweather thought grimly that these men would go through hell itself if they could see a few shillings of prize money on the other side, and the share they received would be squandered without a thought of the blood and sweat that had bought it. He saw the doctor eyeing him intently and wondered who had attracted his attention, then looked down at the man on the cot. It was Larkin, still pale and drawn under his tan. How do you feel, Mr. Larkin? he asked stiffly. The bright blue eyes under the disordered yellow hair met his for a moment, then shifted away. Oh, tolerable, Captain, tolerable. I was just trying to find out from these two sawbones why a hand that ain't there any more should itch. A common enough phenomenon, broke in Mefford. Such sensations will gradually decrease, then disappear. Merriweather felt a cold chill run up his spine at the thought of an amputated arm, already food for fishes, still sending sensations to the brain of a man, real enough to judge by Larkin's expression. He was no malingerer inventoring imaginary symptoms, but a man of raw courage and common sense. A Merriweather had brought him to this pass. He could no longer meet his gaze. The man would read the secret of his guilt in his eyes if he met it. He turned away and continued down the rows of wounded. But he did not deceive his conscience. Then he escaped to the rain-swept weather deck and took refuge in the flag cabin to await Svensson's report. A man keeps few secrets from his valet and in two years of serving him, Sang had developed an almost clairvoyant ability to gauge Captain Merriweather's temper. He sat now on his stool in the pantry, head bowed, staring at the tailless kitten stretched out asleep on the deck at his feet. He had brought such order to the cabin as he could out of the wreckage, and was able to carry on his duties until the carpenters accomplished their pressing repairs and could turn to lower priority items. In the meantime, the captain was occupying the flag cabin, since most of its furnishings were intact. The little Indian was deeply troubled. He had never seen Merriweather in such a state of dejection. Though he dealt promptly and effectively with day-by-day -day decisions, he sat even now at his desk simply staring into space, with an expression that Sang could only read as bitter sorrow. This man, who only three days ago had won a great victory. Sang reached back through recent events, seeking some clue that might explain the mood. Aside from the battle, he could recall nothing out of the ordinary that had taken place since the ship departed from Jeddah. One day had been much like another. Periods of progress, then interludes in which the convoy had been becalmed. Becalmed? Light dawned in Sang's mind. That half-caste woman. The cold hatred he had felt for Madame Bai since she had poisoned his cat flared suddenly hot. The whole matter became crystal clear in his mind. She was one of the Yoginis, a sorceress, walking the earth in the guise of a mortal woman. In her rage and frustration at being thwarted in her scheme to kill the captain, she had cast a spell upon him. The solution was so simple and logical that Sang was angry at himself for not divining it earlier. He had often enough heard of such cases, though this was the first he had encountered in person. He opened his eyes and slid down from the stool, disturbing the kitten which rose and stretched. Through the serving window he saw that Merriweather was still seated in the same position, oblivious to his surroundings. A perfect example of the sorceress's art. She had planted a demon in his soul to devour it and thereby destroy him. What was the remedy? He came back to the stool and strove to recall the days of his childhood, when he had received instruction in the theology and canons of Buddha at the knee of the village guru. 
the master had been a good man, and Sang had conscientiously followed his precepts, though the exigencies of the life he had been forced into had also forced many compromises upon him. Bimu had been an adherent of the new Buddhism called Mahayana, the Great Vehicle, which taught that a man by the spiritual merit which he gained might assist other men on their way to perfection. The older sects, following what was sometimes called the lesser vehicle, had rejected this theory of the transference of merit from one individual to another, and held that a man might only help another on his way by example and advice. Sang recited to himself the vow of the Bodhisattva. I take it upon myself. The deeds of all beings, even of those in the hells, the other worlds, in the realms of punishment, I take their suffering upon me. I bear it. I do not draw back from it. I do not tremble at it. I have no fear of it. I do not lose heart. I must bear the burden of all beings, for I have vowed to save all things living to bring them safe through the forest of birth, age, disease, death, and rebirth. I think not of my own salvation, but strive to bestow on all beings the royalty of supreme wisdom. So I take upon myself all the sorrows of all beings. I resolve to bear every torment in every purgatory of the universe. For it is better that I alone suffer from the multitude of living beings. I give myself in exchange. I redeem the universe from the forest of purgatory, from the womb of flesh, from the realm of death. I agree to suffer as a ransom for all beings for the sake of all beings. Truly I will not abandon them for I have resolved to gain supreme wisdom for the sake of all that lives to save the world. The doctrine was good. Sang felt a warm glow of satisfaction spread through his small body with the conviction that it was within his power to make Captain Merriweather whole again, rid him of the demon that possessed him. But how? Pimu had taught that these she-demons must be compelled, coerced, rather than persuaded. He must pronounce the right formula, the mantra in the correct manner. He racked his brain trying to remember some of these magic phrases, but try as he might he could not recall only the most common, having never before had the need to use such an incantation. He repeated to himself the six syllables, Om Mani Palme Hum. It could not hurt to try it, he decided, though, ah, the jewel is indeed in the lotus, did not sound promising as a mantra to exorcise a demon implanted in a man by a sorceress. He heard a knock on the cabin door, a Merriweather's greeting. It was the carpenter and boatswain to announce that the caulking still held. When the warrant officers departed, Sang peeped through the crack of the serving window. Merriweather had changed position, unstoppered the inkwell and was beginning to write. Marshalling all the force and concentration he could muster, eyes fixed upon Merriweather's face, Sang repeated the magical six syllables once, twice, thrice. He remained staring at the captain, seeking by force of will to drive the demon out of him, then repeated the incantation three times more. Merriweather looked up suddenly, meeting Sang's gaze, and started slightly. I had forgotten you were in the pantry. A cup of coffee, please. The spell was broken. All Sang could do was hope and say a silent prayer. When he served the coffee a few minutes later, Sang could discern no alteration in the stern set of the captain's face. By mid-afternoon, he was sure that he had failed in his effort to exorcise the demon, obviously because he did not possess the correct mantra. He cast about for some solution to his dilemma, 
but he was the only Indian in the ship's company and there was no one to consult. He decided to go on deck for a breath of air and a look about. Mr. Hamlin had the deck, but was in the process of being relieved by Lieutenant McCamey. He heard him call to the new boatswain's mate, Turn those Alaskas two at the pumps, Mac. The thought of the Alaskas brought on board had not crossed Sang's mind. He went forward. They were all of impossibly low caste and ignorant, but he would see if he could communicate with them. He found a group squatting or sitting about the deck forward, dark, muscular men, who looked at him curiously, then spoke to one another. Sang caught a scrap of the conversation which commented humorously on his lack of stature. It was in a dialect that he could understand, and he addressed his inquiry generally to the group. Is there one among you who is learned in the precepts of Buddha? It was a forlorn hope. He saw the blank stares from two dozen pairs of dark eyes. Then one slender man, stretched at full length on the deck with his eyes closed, spoke lazily without opening them. Gandhi professes that once he was a monk, but he works at the pumps now. Thank you. Sang squatted down in a scrap of shade to wait for the man to be relieved. When he came, he was a heavily built man with sweat pouring down his face and torso. One of his fellows nudged him and pointed, and Sang beckoned him to one side. Yes, said Gandhi when the question was put to him. For ten years I was a monk of the Buddhist order, and begged my food through the village. But I tired of the life put aside the saffron robes, and left it. Now, what is it you want? It is a spell, a demon planted in the soul of my master, Sang explained earnestly, and I cannot pronounce the mantra to expel it. He explained the captain's mood and his deduction that one of the yoginis walking the earth in the guise of a beautiful woman had cast the spell while the man stared unblinkingly at him with eyes as hard as obsidian. Ah, yes, Gandhi broke in, and the mantra for one thus possessed is most difficult. Such demons are very strong, and it is not without danger that one opposes them. Perhaps some silver will help me gain courage. How much? demanded Sang. "'conscious of the small hoard he had accumulated "'during his two years in the marine. "'Well,' said Gandhi, looking away for a moment, "'then back with an appraising glance at the small man. "'I shall have to repeat the mantra four successive days "'just as the sun touches the sea. "'And I demand ten rupees for each pronouncement.' "'Done!' agreed Sang, pulling his small bag of coins from his loincloth and counting them out into the avaricious hand of the former monk. And can you begin tonight? Yes, but expect no result until the fourth pronouncement. Sang hurried back to his pantry, feeling that a great burden had been lifted from his own small shoulders. The depressing task was done. Merriweather had often enough in the past written such letters to the next of kin expressing his regret and extending condolences for the death of a kinsman by blood or marriage, but the one for Dobbs was the hardest of his career. He remembered writing for young Bircham, who had died so uselessly at the hands of Tipu Sultan near Velour two years ago, but he had not been present at that death and it had been something fortuitous, unpredictable, the angry whim of a madman in frustration. He had not then felt the crushing burden of guilt. The first letter was to an uncle and former guardian of the young officer, and, he thought cynically, the man would be comforted by the revelation that a substantial share of prize money might be forthcoming. Nothing like a legacy to cheer up a grieving kinsman. The second letter to Miss Judith Johnson at Penang had been a bit easier. He had an insight into Dobbs' sentiments, but none to hers, and he kept the message as impersonal as he could, while expressing his deep regret. 
In any event, the thing was done, and he even felt a sense of relief as he sealed the missives up, then called Sang to take the letters down to Davis to be deposited in the private mail bags. Merriweather was conscious of a sharp scrutiny. The small man was looking at him in a manner that he had never noticed before, and he wondered briefly what prompted it. On this, the fourth day after the battle, the convoy was measurably closer to its destination, and there had been no burials this morning. Buttram had asked permission to move some of his more advanced convalescents to cots under an awning on deck to take advantage of the fresh healing breeze. He had granted the request, but their presence on deck would be a constant reminder of his betrayal of them. The sea had subsided since yesterday, and the necessity to pump had diminished to one hour in four again. Merriweather came out on deck for a last look around before darkness fell. Dylan had the watch, with Marlow as his junior. The wind was over the starboard quarter, and the ship was sailing easily in spite of her much reduced sail area forward, but she presented a continuous problem to the helmsman to keep her bow from wandering. He saw Dylan look sharply at Marlow, who started, then spoke to the quartermaster. Mind your helm! Pitt was back on course as he stepped forward to the break of the poop to look into the waist. Sang had apparently found a friend among the Laskers manning the pumps. He squatted beside a short, heavily muscled fellow on the deck a dozen feet away, conversing in whispers. The man looked up, unwinking black eyes boring into his for a moment, and he saw his lips move, but heard no sound. They remained so for a moment more, and Merriweather turned away, conscious somehow that the gaze still was fixed on the back of his head as he entered the companionway. Dylan, first lieutenant in Comet and now acting in the same capacity in Pitt, was a tall, broad, pleasant man with a stock of droll stories off duty but he was a martinet when he held the deck, as midshipman Marlow soon came to know. Marlow's attention had been called three times this watch to sloppy steering on the part of the duty helmsman, and in injured silence he now stationed himself beside the binnacle, where he could issue a sotto voce warning before the stem sagged off noticeably to leeward. The jury rig just did not balance, and what normally would be an easy point of sailing had become difficult. His left foot still ached where the boat gun had recoiled across his toes, and his right hand was bandaged with goose grease smeared on the powder burn he had suffered when he touched off the piece four days ago. But the recollection was pleasant, and he savoured Captain Merriweather's brief words of praise a few hours after the action had concluded. Mr. Marlowe, he had said in a low voice, that was a magnificent lion's mouth you formed, and I am most obliged to you. And yet the captain had seemed unable to meet his eyes, and was most unhappy in expression, but he had continued, I shall mention your services in my report. Marlowe had been on board a relatively short time after being snatched bodily out of the sea when Vesuvius sank and certainly he did not know the captain as well as the other officers did, but he had heard Mr. McCamey remark this morning to the purser that the captain still seemed shaken. In his carefree adolescent spirits, the battle at its outset had seemed more of a lark, a game of high adventure, than the almost fatal affair it had turned into. Watch it, he told the quartermaster in a loud whisper, and the man rotated the wheel four spokes to the right, held it a moment, peering into the binnacle, added two more, then came back hastily four to the left. The ship had sagged off less than a point before he caught it, and was now back on course, though Dylan was staring hard at him. Marlow thought again of his moment of glory. His station at quarters was the starboard battery of quarter-deck carronades, though he bore small responsibility once the order to commence fire was given, and the gun crews settled into their rigid ritual of loading and firing. His pieces and most of his crews had somehow miraculously survived the Holocaust, 
which accounted for his ability to form the lion's mouth from them. In the early stages of the action he had moved from one gun to another shouting encouragement. By the time all three ships were locked together his voice could no longer be heard, and he had felt desperately alone on the deck exposed to the torrent of enemy fire. He saw the boarding party forming up in the waist of the frigate to starboard, but his guns could not train enough for it to bear on it. The three-pounder boat gun, crammed almost full of musket balls, was already secured pointing forward at the break of the poop. He had had presence of mind enough to cut off a length of slow match smouldering in its tub, before his resolve somehow failed and he froze to the spot in cold terror. The memory was uncomfortable. He had been thoroughly indoctrinated during his brief career in the belief that an officer of the Marine never experienced fear. He came back to the present, as Captain Merriweather had come on deck, and he looked hastily into the binnacle. Mind your helm! Marlowe snapped, although Pitt was exactly on course. He watched Merriweather go forward to the break of the poop, and then resume the examination of his recent performance of duty. Merriweather, he remembered, had been just then saying something to Lieutenant Dobbs, and then was hurled across the deck as Dobbs seemed to disappear into thin air. He had remained frozen to the spot, unable to move, horrified by the phenomenon, expecting death at any instant, only to see the captain rise, draw his sword, and rush forward as the boarding party poured over the starboard side. That action had somehow unlocked the ions of terror. By example, galvanized him to utter the command and run forward to fire the boat gun into the invading mass. He had found himself beside Merriweather, shrieking like a banshee, swinging a cutlass as they rushed the survivors of the boarding party, and only moments later... Countess, Comet, and Ariel had commenced the bombardment that had induced the surrender of the frigates. He tucked his guilty secret out of sight in his mind, certain it would never emerge again. The fearless example of Captain Merriweather had rescued him from disgrace, and he was thankful. From his station on the starboard flank of the convoy, Whaley could see only the main and mizzen upper works of Pitt outlined against the setting sun. The sea was calm, the breeze steady, and vigilant under plain sail was beginning to foreach again on the slower ships. He cocked his ear, expecting the order to change course so as to lose enough ground to regain position. No order was forthcoming from Pelfrey, the officer of the watch, and with difficulty... Whaley restrained the stinging rebuke that was on the tip of his tongue. Pelfrey had no natural bent for seamanship, and had learned his duties by rote, but he finally noticed that the bearing of the guide had drawn noticeably aft, and gave the belated order. Hands to braces! Where ship? Your new course is east by north! Better later than never, thought Whaley, feeling a flush of irritation but he managed to hold his tongue as he had resolved to do at the outset of his command. It was difficult to alter the mental processes and prejudices acquired in the years as a junior officer charged with enforcing the will and whims of a commanding officer. He had often enough had to compromise his own principles to conform with the idiotic orders issued by a captain. In Whaley's mind there were no shades of grey. Things were black or white, dead wrong, or unequivocally right. But now he was a commanding officer himself and must rely upon his subordinates to execute his orders. It was easy enough to compel, even coerce his officers, demand that every duty be performed in the exact manner that he directed. But there were not enough hours in the day to follow up and ensure compliance with the letter of his orders. He had begun to realise in the last months under Merriweather, seeing the quiet, efficient performance of duty by Larkin and Dobbs, that it was the result that counted. He recalled Merriweather's parting words at the gangway as he embarked in Pitt's gig to read himself in. Captain, you stand now in a lonely and slippery place, 
supported only by the loyalty and efficiency of your officers and crew, and this is one more often by persuasion than compulsion. I wish you every good fortune in your new command. It was the philosophy of those that Whaley had always categorized as namby-pambies in bitter contempt. But the statement had somehow hung in his mind and made a profound impression. It was a concept that had not occurred to him, and he found himself unaccountably making no sweeping changes in the custom and mode of performance of duty in Vigilant. He managed to repress many of the criticisms that he was accustomed to utter, and to look the other way on minor infractions that had formerly infuriated him. He soon discovered that Murray, his first lieutenant, was crackerjack at getting things done if left alone, and the boatswain had the crew in the palm of his hand. The performance of duty by all hands in the brief flurry of action with the two French frigates five days ago had been entirely creditable. He wished he had had a more active duty assignment than merely barring the way to the convoy. But Vigilant would receive a full share of any prize money realised. Whaley thought back to his first impressions of Merriweather. He had, of course, known that Merriweather had been jumped over the heads of a score of more senior and deserving lieutenants in the Marine, that he owed his promotion to captain to political influence in the court of directors of the company and he was married to the niece of the former Governor-General, now Governor of Madras. Whaley, in his disappointment at being passed over himself for promotion to captain, had been entirely prepared to dislike the man, and to discover him to be weak and incompetent. The apparent reluctance to inflict punishment had confirmed his initial opinion, but he had gained respect for the man after he had thwarted the abortive mutiny. Merriweather had told the assembled officers in the grey light of that early morning that every officer in the ship, from himself down, bore a share of the responsibility for the event, that each must examine his own conscience and mend his ways to ensure that such would never again occur. Perhaps it was the example of the executions at Bombay, the removal of the dissidents from the ship or the efforts of the officers to improve their performance of duty, or the firm competence and fair play of Captain Merriweather. Whatever, the hands in pit had welded into a crew that had fought to the last gasp. It was difficult to fault such an achievement. It was almost dark. Whaley could still see the guide in the convoy now almost exactly on bearing. He did not look around, gave Pelfrey no cue, but he heard the order given only ten seconds late this time. Hands to the braces! Where ship! Your new course is northeast! Whaley turned and went below in his short, brisk gait, confident for the moment that though he stood in a lonely and slippery place, he was adequately supported and that the precepts of Captain Merriweather held merit. Seven days after the amputation, Larkin still felt shaky, and he could not seem to bring his thoughts into focus. He was content to relax in a canvas chair rigged beside his cot under the awning Buttram had ordered spread forward, appreciative of the steady breeze from the southwest that found its way under the canvas and sip the thrice-daily ration of port the surgeons have prescribed. It was intended to stimulate replacement of the blood he had lost from his wound, but he considered the prescription mere superstition. He had no taste for wine. Red meat was the best remedy. There was little pain in his stump now. It appeared to be healing well, though a twinge would come when he involuntarily reached for something with the non-existent hand. He had suffered no sickness or serious injury since childhood. His recuperative powers were excellent, and he anticipated no complications. Larkin's thoughts turned to his own future. While he might be permitted to stay on in the Marine, the prospects for a crippled junior officer were not bright. 
and he had grown weary this past year of the constant pressures of service at sea. The last time he had really enjoyed his duties was a year ago on the voyage to Mauritius. The scouting expedition to Java last fall had been hard, serving as first to an ambitious and demanding officer such as Tollett. Then he had been denied his own command in Rapid due to her unseaworthy condition. Had become second lieutenant to Whaley's first with all its complications of the unsuccessful mutiny. He would have resigned after Ras ul Khaimah but for Whaley's transfer. He thought of Dobbs, that quiet, earnest young man, and felt a pang of regret at his death. He had never been close to Dobbs. Their interests were too disparate. But as first lieutenant of a man of war, he had learned that he could rely implicitly on the officer to carry out his orders. He had been happy to see Dobbs receive his due for the success of the operation at Russell Kaima, and happy for him again when he confided that he intended to marry that talkative little girl at Penang he had met last year. Bad luck. The thought of the girl made Larkin consider his own situation. He had had no more than a passing interest in any woman since Jane Wisdom encouraged his attentions at Bombay two years ago and then married another. He had seen her again at Bombay last winter, one child in arms and another imminent, now fat and blousy. His thoughts turned once more to his own career. He had no desire to wait out the years in the marine in some backwater station. He had saved most of his pay, all of his prize money, and the occasional gain from a bit of private trade. He had the capital to take him back to Kentucky, if he so decided, and establish himself in some appropriate venture. But he was uncertain of conditions there since it had become a state thirteen years ago. Possibly there were greater opportunities south or west, since the United States had purchased Louisiana from Bonaparte. He was not sanguine as to his chances of making his way on the frontier with only one arm, but he had always had a bent for trade. He could drive a shrewd bargain, and had an instinctive feeling for what the traffic would bear. But the trade of merchants was too confining. Possibly he could pick up some land grants in the new territories and resell them at a profit. Though he had no moral scruples, he did not consider the slave trade. He had had enough of that, and it had no future. He could reach no conclusion, of course, until he returned to the United States and saw for himself the conditions there. But he realized that he had not even considered India or England. They were too crowded for his free spirit. Buttram and Mefford appeared with the loblolly attendants carrying their medical kits. Larkin permitted the bandages to be unwrapped and forced himself to look at the raw stump with the black loops of the sutures tying off the blood vessels protruding. Buttram bent to sniff delicately at the surface, then looked up with a smile. Healing cleanly, Mr. Larkin. He tested the sutures, pulling gently with thumb and forefinger. There was a stab of pain, and Larkin winced. It will not be long before these will come out. If you feel equal to it, I suggest you take a turn or two about the deck twice a day to build up your strength. Yes, Doctor. I'll commence tomorrow. Buttram coated a wad of lint with the medication, pressed it against the stump, and began to replace the bandage. Have you talked with the captain lately? he inquired. Oh, yes. He stopped by each morning to inquire as to my health. Have you noticed a change in him since the battle? Had there been a change? Merriweather had always been quiet and courteous, no bluster or bombast in his manner. But, yes, he had appeared much more subdued. Now that Larkin thought about the matter, Merriweather gave the impression that he was bearing a secret burden and was embarrassed or self-conscious. Possibly it was the butcher's bill. 
The old hands in pit insisted she had suffered the heaviest casualties in a single ship in the history of the Marine. Perhaps Merriweather felt guilt at having called upon his officers and men to face such overwhelming odds last week. He decided on his reply to Buttram. No, doctor. He appears entirely his normal self to me. It might be only blind loyalty, Larkin thought, but he would not corroborate any suspicions Buttram harboured. The doctor made no reply for a moment as he tied the split ends of the bandage. But then he stepped back and looked shrewdly at Larkin. Well, I have, he said in a positive tone with a frown. I think he has a problem. A monkey on his back, as the hands would say. But I wondered if a man who has known him as long as I had noticed anything. Oh, well. Now remember, a turn about the deck. Buttram turned to the next patient. Larkin turned the matter over in his mind. Merriweather had never evaded responsibility, nor had it appeared to weigh heavily upon him. He thought back to the day of the action with the French. When the frigates made their move, the captain had acted properly by Larkin's lights. The only chance with three vessels, each of a force equal to his own, was to divide them, seek successive encounters with single ships where the speed of Pitt's broadsides could cripple the enemy. The scheme had worked to perfection with the interception of the first frigate, the French commander had made a serious tactical error there in detaching one frigate. Undoubtedly he had anticipated snapping up a few prizes before breaking off to escort Countess in her escape from the convoy. The second phase of the action had commenced as a thing of beauty to Larkin's professional eye. With one frigate crippled and her colours struck, the other two were compelled to come back to the serious business of their mission to detach Countess. Merriweather had not made the obvious move of throwing Pitt in their path. With the weather gauge, they could choose the moment and method of joining or avoiding action. Instead, he had used the crippled frigate to mask his intentions, circling her, then coming to the wind to shift to the opposite tack gain the weather gauge, and emerge within easy gunshot of the nearer vessel while screened by her from the fire of her consort. The nearer frigate had been crippled within minutes of striking when the second sheared across her wake expecting to get in a raking broadside or two before Merriweather could respond. But he was already coming to port to counter the manoeuvre and place himself in position to rake the enemy when misfortune struck. Pitt had been within one cannonball of victory, Larkin thought softly, when that last despairing shot from the crippled Frenchman took down the foremast, throwing the ship out of control and causing her to collide with the frigate to port. There had been only two alternatives then. Hold fast, serve the guns as long as there were men to load and fire them, or surrender. Larkin remembered almost with disbelief the hell that had ensued. The crippled frigate able to close again to starboard and grapple, while the undamaged one pumped in her broadsides from the other hand. He had seen the boarding party assembling in the waist of the ship to port, and was training the long nine around to dose it with canister, when the blast of grape shot wiped out his crew and took his arm. He could not remember anything more until he awakened from his drugged sleep some time in the mid-watch next morning and asked for water to wet his parched throat. His first question to the loblolly attendant after he gulped down the cooling cup had been whether they were prisoners. Oh, sir, them Frenchies struck right after you come below. It was hard to believe. Pitt had been in extremis. Two-thirds of her guns out of action, the deck littered with dead and wounded. He could remember looking aft just before he was hit to see the Bombay Marine ensign still flying and wonder at Merriweather's tenacity. In his judgment, the surrender should already have been made, but events had proved him wrong. 
he thought again of Buttram's question and his reply. Of course, the doctor was a trained observer. Possibly he read into Merriweather's manner something more than regret that so many of his men had been killed or maimed as a result of his stubbornness. The concept did not trouble Larkin. His own philosophy was simple. If a man hired out, signed articles of enlistment in a naval service, he assumed the risk, took the bitter with the sweet. Larkin's train of thought was interrupted by the appearance of mess attendants with the evening meal. Somehow there was fresh roast beef and great balls of fire. It was a bit rare, just the way he liked it. The word swept through the sick bay that Flint, acting as master of Countess, had slaughtered his last bullock and sent over a side of beef for the wounded with his compliments. That should replace the lost blood quickly enough, but Larkin took his glass of port afterward in accordance with Buttram's prescription as reinforcement for the red meat. The sense of well-being engendered by the delicious meal encouraged Larkin to rise and take a turn about the deck a day earlier than he had planned. Dusk was not far away, the sun just beginning to touch the horizon here halfway through the second dog watch. Some hands on the forecastle had brought out fiddles, flutes, and other instruments, and they launched into a sprightly tune. He made his way slowly through the waist aft, past where the party of Laskers squatted twittering like a flock of birds, and saw Merriweather leaning against the bulwark on the weather side of the quarter-deck. He would have raised his good hand in salute, but the scarred face was set in an expression of such despondency, dull eyes staring blindly forward, that Larkin chose not to intrude. He saw that Dylan had the watch with Marlow as his junior, and decided to pass the time of day with him in the hope of entertainment by way of one or another of his stories. As he approached the ladder, he saw Sang and a thick-set Lasker squatting on the deck looking up towards the captain. The Lasker's lips were moving. Larkin wondered idly what the pair were up to. In spite of keeping a sharp eye on young Marlow in the ship, Dylan was in rare form, and when the watch ended, Larkin started forward still chuckling over the last of his yarns. Dusk was falling. The concert on the forecastle had ended some minutes ago, and the new watch was making the ship secure for the night. Halfway to the ladder, he came face to face with Captain Merriweather. The metamorphosis was astounding. The stern, gloomy countenance of a few minutes ago had been transfigured. Somehow, Merriweather had resumed his normal expression of cheerful resolution, and his eyes had regained their sparkle. A smile of genuine pleasure blossomed on the captain's face. Why, Larkin, I am delighted to see you up and about. Please myself, Captain. Buttram says the exercise will hasten my recovery. Something beyond his comprehension had occurred, had wrought this transformation in the man, restored his normal spirit. It was, Larkin thought, as though a condemned man had been delivered by the king's pardon at the foot of the gallows. Will you join me for a tot of brandy in the cabin? I seem to recall the medical men prescribe it for patients on the mend. Larkin hesitated. He was happy that the mood of the past week had been somehow dispelled, but he was a bit apprehensive that something he might say or do could bring it back. Let well alone, he decided. Thank you, Captain, but I should return to my cart. I have already taken my dram for tonight and should not overdo myself. Very well, Larkin. Again, I am delighted with your progress. You can make your way, and good night. Forward, Larkin encountered Buttram coming from the wash-deck pump, evening rounds completed, but he only lifted his hand in passing. He was afraid of saying anything at this point as to the captain's transformation, lest he jinx the man. The duty attendant came over to assist him to his cot, but was waved away. 
Time enough he became accustomed to undressing with one hand, Larkin decided, feeling drowsiness possess him, anticipating a night of untroubled sleep. Buttram rinsed his hands for the third time under the gush of salt water from the wash-deck pump, finally removing the scum of harsh soap. He put his fingers one by one under his nose and sniffed. The smell of corruption from dealing with the gangrene during the evening rounds was gone, he decided, reaching for the towel the loblolly attendant held out for him. He moved over drying his hands to look in the fragment of mirror fastened to the bulkhead, noting again with disapproval his coarsened complexion and the yellowish tint under the tan, wondering yet again what had possessed him to take service in the Bombay Marine. It had been good to him in its fashion, he admitted, and otherwise he would never have met Jennifer. But India was still the Englishman's grave, and three years out here was enough for him. He thought with a nostalgia of the Kentish countryside and the comfortable old house where he had grown up before Cambridge. Well, he had determined to submit his resignation as surgeon to the Commandant of the Marine by New Year. It was high time his daughter made the acquaintance of her grandparents. The sound of musical instruments and voices raised in song came to an end as the first watch was called, but it was a good sign. The age-old axiom held that losses of one in ten destroyed a military force's effectiveness, but morale among the hands appeared to have survived since they sang with such spirit. Buttram thought with distaste of the evening rounds just completed. There was gangrene in at least five of the wounded, and the prognosis was poor for three of them. He had just finished trimming proud flesh from the foot of Boson Caldwell for the second time, in the forlorn hope of saving half of it. But when a grape shot had sheared off the toes, there were usually complications in the rest of the foot, and he might yet have to amputate. Larkin was taking the loss of his arm philosophically, already ploughing how he might swivel a staff to the forearms of his long rifles to serve as a rest when he fired them. The tall American had little formal education but possessed a quick intelligence and was perceptive in his judgment of persons. Buttram had tried a while ago to draw out his opinion of the state of mind of Captain Merriweather, but Larkin had dissembled had not been frank with him. Merriweather had visited the First Lieutenant each day, and his despondency must have been apparent. Loyalty was an admirable trait, but it should not be permitted to interfere with honest diagnosis. His mind turned again to Merriweather. He had come to know him these past thirty months in the close confines of a shipboard life, and he felt he understood him as well as one man might another. The first year, he thought he had detected an undercurrent of insecurity, a consciousness perhaps of humble origins, with a tendency to overcompensate by assuming an air of gentility often not practised by those to the manner born. That personality had altered just about the time Rapid departed on its voyage to Mauritius. The captain in the six-month interval before Buttram saw him again, seemed to have acquired a new confidence. Possibly it was his successful mission to Persia in the company of that blue-blooded diplomat, Percy, that had wrought the change. But this past week, the gloomy preoccupation of the man had been a facet of his character never before displayed. Merriweather had faced adversity often enough in the past, but he had never permitted it to obsess him for any great period of time. Bartram recalled many cases of men whose spirit had cracked and broken under great stress and strain, or were haunted by events into madness. He was reluctant even to contemplate this hypothesis in the case of Merriweather, but the symptoms he had observed thus far pointed in that direction. If there were some method by which he could discover the man's problem, he might be able to exorcise it. 
Such things that loom large in the confines of one man's mind often evaporated when exposed to the light of reason. He came out on deck and saw Larkin walking towards his cot. The man raised his hand in salutation as he passed, but did not speak. Buttram was glad that he was taking the exercise he had prescribed. It should aid him to regain his strength. He looked about the deck. It was a pleasant evening beginning now to cool, but it would still be hot in the wardroom, and without conscious logic the doctor decided to pay a call on Merriweather. He had the excuse of updating his medical report after all. The greeting that responded to his knock was in a stronger voice than Buttram had heard Merriweather use the past few days. The captain was leaning back in his chair, shirt unbuttoned, pen in hand and a sheet of foolscap on the desk. Buttram was instantly conscious that the captain had altered materially in the past few hours. His expression of dejection had lifted and been replaced by the normal air of resolution he had worn since the doctor had known him. In his surprise, Buttram almost forgot his opening gambit as Merriweather waved him to a chair. Sir, he began lamely, trying to remember some development in the sick bay that was important enough to justify his visit. I think, and then decided to abandon the stratagem. I came by on no particular mission, Captain, just to talk a bit, and if you are otherwise engaged, I shall depart. Not at all, Doctor said Merriweather, sticking the pen in the shot bowl. Delighted to see you any time. His gaze met Buttram squarely for the first time in a week, clear-eyed and serene. Of course, Buttram had seen persons who could rise from the depths of despondency to ecstasy in the drawing of two breaths, but instability had never appeared to be a part of Merriweather's temperament but I was about to violate one of my own rules at sea by having a glass of gin. Will you join me? Claret? Brandy? Brandy. Buttram was recovering from his astonishment, and he took advantage of the interval while Merriweather rang the bell and gave Sang the order to make a closer study of the man. He was thinner, the high cheekbones stood out more than they had a week ago, but otherwise he was, to all intents and purposes, in body and manner, the same Merriweather that Buttram had known before the battle. He shifted his gaze to Sang as he turned to go back to the pantry. The little Indian steward had worn an expression of perpetual sadness since Buttram had first known him, but now he too was transfigured. His face was alight, eyes glowing, radiating happiness as he disappeared into the pantry. The doctor could not fathom the change in Sang any more than he could that in Merriweather. There must be more here than met the eye, but he could devise no means to unearth the secret. The brandy was set before him. Half an hour later, Buttram made his way to his room, still baffled. He took the time before he retired to write in the journal he kept of unusual medical problems an account of Merriweather's case. The sudden descent into acute melancholia, its duration and outward symptoms, then the almost instantaneous arrest and reversal of the affliction. Completed, as he usually did, he added the word comment, then sat back in contemplation trying to distill some helpful present from the case. Try as he would, he could reach no satisfactory or logical conclusion. His eyes were growing heavy as he picked up the pen and added two words, God knows. Halfway through the second dog watch, Merriweather came on deck to stand on the weather side of the quarter deck at the break of the poop. The sun was almost touching the horizon. The breeze was steady out of the southwest and the columns of the convoy stretched out ahead in reasonably good order. The quiet scene on deck was a far cry from the same time a week ago today. Then, every able-bodied hand in the ship had been pumping, plugging shot holes or fothering sail as pit sank under them. Only the quick assistance of artisans out of the other ships present had saved her. Now, 
thanks to Mr. Svensson, his mates, and the carpenters out of the other vessels of the escort force, the Laskers need pump only one hour out of four. The view of the cots and pallets ranged along the waist forward under the awning reminded him of the visit he had made to the Loblolly an hour after the actions ceased. It had been horrifying beyond his experience. The cacophony of screams, groans, and sobs caused physical pain to his ears. Bartram and Mefford had been too busy to talk as they cut, sawed, and stitched. Assisted by the surgeon's mates out of vigilant Countess, Comet, and Ariel in the stifling heat, amidst the acrid stink of urine and vomit and flickering light of the battle lanterns, Larkin had lain comatose to one side, arm already amputated, snoring stentoriously from the effects of the laudanum he had been dosed with by the surgeons. A blast of grape from a French gun had wiped out all but two of the forward pivot's crew, taking Larkin's arm as well. Merriweather had given such comfort and encouragement as he could to those men able to comprehend, and escaped to the fresh night breeze on deck, where sailmakers were working their way down the long row of pitiful remains laid out in the waist to swathe each corpse in canvas with a thirty-two-pound shot at the feet. Now, seven days later, the ship's routine had shaken down to near normal, and some of the hands off watch and the walking wounded were skylarking on the forecastle, as though there had never been a battle. They had brought out a brace of fiddles, three flutes, a drum, trumpet, and even a small harp. There were tentative trills and notes sounded. Then, at a signal from a portly storekeeper, the ensemble struck up a tune that in a moment had the younger seamen setting to partners in a sprightly dance. The tempo changed, and two of the ship's boys engaged in a competitive hornpipe, faces flushed with exertion as the hands clapped in steady rhythm punctuated with an occasional wordless cheer. The tune shifted again into a slower melody, and the hornpipers collapsed, wiping the sweat from their face as the assemblage burst into song, led by a red-haired Irish gunner's mate with a fine tenor voice. Leaning against the bulwark, Merriweather stared forward at the hands, listening to the roaring choruses of the shanty. He looked down to see Sang and his Lasker friends squatting on the deck below him, their eyes fixed upon him, lips of the Lasker moving, and then looked back to the hands on the forecastle. If there were still undiscovered mutineers from last winter among them, they had concealed it well during the arduous exertions of the combined operations at Russell Kaimar, and the crew's performance against overwhelming odds last week had been magnificent. The old hands in pit and the men from Rapid in the space of half a year had welded into an able and courageous crew, undeserving of a captain who would have betrayed them. He could only now fully admit to himself the extent of his terror, his mindless, unreasoning panic, the frantic desire to live at any cost that had possessed him. But he could yet find no rational explanation within himself. He had managed to put such fears out of his mind in the past, but he had never before been so literally in extremis as in the last few minutes of the engagement. His courage and resolution would forever be suspect in his own eyes, though there was no other living mortal to accuse him. Merriweather was not fit or qualified to hold a commission, let alone exercise command in the Marine. Once back at Bombay, he would submit his resignation, gather up Caroline and their child and slink back to England. He might even make a passable greengrocer if he put his mind into it. He had, he realised, reached the nadir of shame and despondency. There was nowhere to go. No way to make amends. The tempo of the music shifted again, something now slow and sonorous, the hands singing along earnestly. It was out of the hymnal of the Church of England 
provided, along with the Book of Common Prayer and the Bible from the earliest days by a God-fearing court of directors to the company's ships, maritime or naval. Regulation also required observance of the Sabbath with services, but this was more honoured in its breach in the Marine. Merriweather had spent his youth in an Indiaman commanded by a devout captain, had been compelled to learn his catechism and be confirmed in the Church of England. He had given the matter of religion little enough thought since those days, and nurtured few strong convictions on the subject. He was entirely unable to comprehend the bitter differences that continually arose between followers of competing sects, and delegated the duty of presiding at services to Davis, the purser, an accomplished lay reader. Now, as daylight faded, Merriweather heard the hands pause before they began the second stanza of the hymn. The magnificent tenor voice rising above the baritone rumble of the rest. Forgive me, Lord, for thy dear son, the ill which I this day have done, that with the world, myself and thee, I, ere I sleep, at peace may be. The couplets he had heard a hundred times before suddenly took on a meaning. He had done ill, forgotten his duty in panic, sought to save his own life at any cost, and a man had died in the interval. It was impossible to undo the ill a man had done, but the cumulative burden of guilt would become intolerable unless there was some means of casting it out. There was common sense expressed in the philosophy behind the words of the verse. If a man could not make literal amends, he might yet do so in spirit. He began to rationalise his conduct of seven days ago. The cold terror and panic he had suffered the blind unreasoning instinct for survival that had compelled him toward a surrender of the ship had not of themselves caused the death of Dobbs. That was simply an incident of the service. The Lord must have willed Pitt's survival by providing Marlowe's lion's mouth and McRae's race to bring the heavy batteries in Countess to bear upon the enemy. For no apparent reason the same arguments and logic that he had rejected all this past week now made sense. Possibly it was more than time dulling the edge of his conscience, but the weight of guilt he had borne again to lift from his soul as he heard the hands sing. Teach me to live that I may dread the grave as little as my bed. Teach me to die that so I may rise glorious at the judgment day. There were two more stanzas, but Merriweather did not hear them. The world would not end, life would continue. He would remember, regret, but no longer permit the episode to haunt him. More wisdom had been distilled out of human experience into religion that he had given it credit for. He realised that he had somehow exorcised his guilt. The evening hymn ended the impromptu concert as the first watch came on deck and he saw Larking coming towards him. He bespoke the officer with an easier conscience. Part 3 The Wrath of China The boat's stank of fish, and the hoop-supported canvas shelter amidships confined the stifling heat while excluding most of the breeze. Tulsi Bai sat quietly against the starboard gunwale, her veil now cast aside and the sari loosened for comfort. Even so, sweat beaded her forehead and gathered in her armpits. But surely it was worth a little discomfort to escape the Bombay government. She listened to the slow regular thump and creak of the sweeps against the thole pins as the two fishermen propelled their craft through the shallows west of Bombay Island. The wind was dead foul until they should clear the harbour entrance. Then, by keeping well inshore, they might take advantage of the land breeze to beat down to Goa. 
Tulsi thought with cold fury of the ruin of what had appeared to be a well-conceived and executed plan for the overthrow of Holkar. It was difficult to believe that the scar-faced captain had proved to be incorruptible. Was it possible she was losing her beauty, showing her age? She ran fingertips over her cheeks, still firm and smooth, and her body, she knew, was that of a girl in spite of her thirty-three years. The man was a fool. He had been offered money and even her charms as a bonus simply to look the other way. Of course, Cosby, that jealous nincompoop, had guessed her intention and intruded, just as she had felt Merriweather waver. Served the bumbler right to be knocked on the head, she thought. And then her assassination attempt had failed due to her own weakness. God damn the cat and that scar-faced captain. There had been time during these past few weeks of sailing to Bombay to talk to Malhar. Time to convince him that power was more desirable than mere wealth. But she was not sure that she had succeeded. Her scheme to place her son on the throne of Rajputana had only been postponed, not ended. Holkar would welcome his son back, she was sure, and it was incumbent upon the boy to ingratiate himself with his father, while currying favour with the French mercenaries who trained his army and enlisting support from the Pindari leaders Amir Khan and Wasil Mohammed. But Tulsi was by no means certain Malhar possessed the resolution to follow through without her presence. He was not stupid, merely indolent and easily diverted by the pleasures of the flesh. The risk was simply too great for her to chance entering the country at this time, and she must go away to a place secure even from Holkar's thugs. God damn the cat and that scar-faced captain. She thought briefly of her twin brother René, a man of force and guile, far different from her half-brother Harry Fitzgerald, who looked British and had wholeheartedly adopted their ways. René had acted instantly once the bumboat man delivered her note last night. He dealt in jewels and contraband opium, and his sources of information penetrated even the governor's establishment. The delivery had been easy. That stupid captain of the guard was so complacent, so sure a woman was incapable of escape, that he had not even bothered to arm his soldiers while he transported her from the ship to a place of confinement. Lucky for him he had not resisted the rescue, or he would be a headless corpse at this moment. But René had disquieting news once she reached one of his hiding places on the outskirts of Bombay. Holkar had been furious when he learned that Tulsi had accompanied Malhar on his pilgrimage to Mecca, and his agents were even now sojourning at Surat in the expectation of her arrival there and the Countess of Surrey. So be it. They would be as disappointed as the Bombay government at her absence but René insisted there was no safety for her even here from the assassins once the news of her escape reached Surat. Madame Bai was devoid of fear, but it would be folly to risk death when a little time might solve the matter and enable her to achieve her ends. She reluctantly agreed to travel to Goa where she would be under the protection of the flag of Portugal. She had lived there for a time in the beginning of her first exile from Rajputana and understood enough of the language to get along. The creak of sweeps ceased. There was a clatter on deck as they were laid aside, and she parted the curtain to look back at distant Bombay. Blocks squealed as sails were hoisted and the small vessel picked up way south. It was safe enough now to come out on deck and luxuriate in the fresh breeze as it dried her soggy garments. René had provided a basket of provisions, and she sat in the stern to consume a noontime ration, washed down with a half-bottle of wine. Her thoughts returned to Merriweather. Somehow he had avoided the poison potion she had designed for him. With the captain out of the way, she was sure the Indian man could have sailed away in the confusion during the change of command, concluded the rendezvous with the French squadron, and by now Malhar might well have been on the throne. That goddamned cat! The mere thought of the animal caused a shudder of revulsion to course through her body. 
she had been compelled by her phobia to leave the cabin before she saw the strychnine ingested, and Merriweather had survived to capture the French force. Madame By compelled herself to put the rankling memories out of her mind, and tried to think of her childhood instead. The man painted in the ivory miniature had been boldly handsome, dark hair in ringlets, blue eyes and prominent nose. Tulsi had no other recollection of her father, who had died of fever before she and René were a year and a half old. He had been the Cantilaire de la Housse from Normandy, her mother said, serving as a mercenary officer in the Maratha forces. After his death, her mother had moved to Surat and soon contracted a liaison with the Irishman Fitzgerald. She remembered him well. She had been fourteen when he went back to England, a wealthy man, taking Harry with him to be educated as an Englishman. Her mother had come back to her native Rajputana, and within a month Tulsi had caught the iron fancy of Holkar to become his concubine and bear his child. She had lost his favour ten years ago, but with the proceeds of her jewels, had sojourned in exile, first in Goa, then during the peace made her way to Port Louis. Her beauty had attracted the commandant of the Ile de France, and she had lived as his mistress until his recall to France two years ago. But before she departed the island, she had conceived the plot and laid the foundation of her scheme to supplant Holkar with Malhar. Her thoughts came full circle. God damn the cat and that scar-faced captain. Three days later, she landed at Goa and found the house of her brother's correspondent in the opium cartel, a swarthy Portuguese by the name of Francisco Cochino. Upon Tulsi's recital of the recent misfortunes which had beset her, he took instant alarm. Goa, he insisted, was not beyond the reach of Holkar, and he had no desire to be implicated. His wife was present during the interview, and Madame Bai had no opportunity to employ her other wiles. She reluctantly took ship two days later bound for Macau with munitions and supplies for the garrison. Cheered only slightly by a rumour that the city would soon be occupied by French forces with a view to denying the British trade with Canton. God damn the cat and that scar-faced captain! Just before she boarded the vessel, a furtive man who said he was from René in Bombay pressed an oilskin packet into her hands with the injunction to deliver it to one Don Miguel de Siveira at the governor's palace in Macau. Tulsi would have declined the commission, but it was accompanied by a small but weighty bag of escudos to ease her sojourn. The warm glow of happiness and pride still pervaded his body, as Merriweather took his second cup of tea in the tiny cubicle assigned to him in the transient officer's quarters adjacent to Bombay Castle. The news was second-hand but authentic in Caroline's own hand. The mail pouch for Pitt had gone to Surat in anticipation of her arrival there, but Pitt had entered the graving docky yesterday morning for the urgent repairs necessitated by her recent action in the Gulf of Aden. It had been a strenuous twelve hours to warp the frigate through the gates, sent her exactly over the blocks that would support her keel, and then wait the interminable interval that it took puffing Billy, spewing sparks and smoke, to pump out the dock. The hands had been shifted to barracks ashore, and the officers assigned to these dingy quarters. Pitt was a dead ship, out of commission for at least four months while her whole starboard midship section was removed and replaced. He had called on Tollett, still acting in the absence of Sir John Walden as Commandant of the Marine late yesterday afternoon. The officer had leaped to his feet, grasped the extended hand with both of his, his face wreathed in smiles. Glorious, Merriweather, simply glorious. There was no doubt of his sincerity. He glowed with admiration. Merriweather felt a twinge of conscience. A residue of his shame and guilt still lurked in the recesses of his soul, though he had come to terms with himself. 
McCray and Comet had proceeded pit into the harbour the day before yesterday to alert the castle to the necessity of having the dry dock in readiness to receive the damaged ship, and undoubtedly had given the Commodore a full account of the action. Have a chair while I finish signing these dispatches and we'll go to the club, where I shall propose a toast or three while listening to some amplification of McCray's report. Merriweather turned to the window and looked out over the harbour where the three French frigates rode at anchor, marine ensigns sparkling above their tricolours. They were excellent ships of recent construction, and once the battle damage was repaired they should bring a pretty price. It was entirely likely that the Royal Navy would purchase them into the fleet, what with its shortage of fast cruisers out here. By the by, said Tollett, looking up from his papers, your old friend McClellan reported for duty at the castle last month. Good. Where is he? He and his bride are staying for the nonce in lodgings in Harry's public house outside the gate until their bungalow is ready. And now, I think that takes care of the drudgery for another day. Are you ready? Tollett put on his hat, and they went out across the yard to the club. The first drink was cool and delicious the lemon exactly right in flavour. "'This glass must have a hole in it,' said Merriweather apologetically, signalling the waiter. Tollett laughed and tossed off his whisky and water, then leaned back. "'God, I would have given a year's pay on my right arm to have been with you at Aden,' the Commodore said ruefully. "'You know, in over twenty years of service in the Marine, I have never been in a major engagement, and now I guess I never will.' The man was entirely sincere, Merriweather saw, expressing genuine regret at what he considered a misfortune. I can't exactly recommend the experience, Merriweather replied. It was touch and go there for a while before McCrae brought up the heavy batteries in Countess and Comet. I confess I was beginning to give serious consideration to striking. Pure sophistry, he told himself. He had done all in his power to surrender and had only been thwarted by a combination of unlikely events. But he had made peace with himself on that score, and must needs present an unruffled face to the world. Tollett drew him out skilfully, leading him through the initial tactics of the engagement, putting in a shrewd question from time to time to amplify a point. And then, with borders on deck to port, French marines made an attack from starboard, a midshipman Marlow formed a lion's mouth to repulse them, just as Comet and Countess commenced their bombardment from ahead. Lion's mouth? ejaculated Tollett incredulously. Why, I haven't heard the term since I was a midshipman in a six-gun snow. Seems still to work, said Merriweather. I made special mention of the young man's services in my report. The rest of the account was soon over just as he finished the third gin, and Tollett rose regretfully. I must go. We have a dinner engagement. But tomorrow we shall call on Governor Duncan to discuss with him the political implication that Madame Bai's plot presents. Merriweather was at a loose end. He had drunk all the gin he desired for the time, and it was yet a bit early to dine. Then he remembered that McClellan was close at hand, and he felt he knew the big Scots officer well enough to call on him unannounced. "'Why, Captain!' shouted McClellan. "'And congratulations!' "'For what?' demanded Merriweather. He saw little Mary Wilkins hovering in the background. First and foremost for your son!' "'Son?' said Merriweather. Then realisation flooded over him. "'When?' And is Caroline... There must be a letter for him somewhere. Here is Caroline's letter we received last week, interposed Mary. He was born the 20th of May. Seven pounds, seven ounces, and both are fine. Thank God, said Merriweather, feeling the sudden emptiness in his stomach subside. He took the proffered letter and skimmed through the obstetrical details to come to the last paragraph. 
and with Percival absent it has fallen to me to name our son who will be christened this Sunday at St. John's. Accordingly, with great trepidation, I settled on George for my uncle, Robert for that Percy my husband so admired, and Percival naturally. It is quite a name for a very small boy to carry. Commodore Land and Jennifer Buttram have graciously consented to stand sponsor for him as godparents. George Robert Percival, repeated Merriweather wonderingly. I believe this is an occasion for a toaster, McClellan said. Your pleasure. The toasts to the new son were drunk in gin, whiskey and Madeira, according to individual taste. The happy mother and the proud father were toasted, then, almost as an afterthought, the victory at Aden. It was a happy hour before Merriweather took his leave and came back to the club pleasantly fuddled, but relieved that he had a vigorous heir and a healthy wife. There he encountered McCrae, Whaley, Dillon, Larkin, McCamey, the junior officers from three ships, and the celebration commenced all over again as he made his announcement. Now, having breakfasted on melon, fresh eggs, crisp bacon and toast, Merriweather felt the malaise engendered by last night's celebration subside. As Sang stacked the plates on the tray and went out, he turned his thoughts to what this day might hold for him. Tollett's note had been delivered before he was awake. They would wait on the governor at eleven anti-meridian. Time to bathe, shave and dress. Perhaps after these formalities were completed he might have a few days for himself. The tonga was waved past the sentry at the gate, and they dismounted at the door to the governor's mansion. Commodore Tollett and Captain Merriweather of the Marine, we have an appointment to see Governor Duncan, Tollett told the secretary. They were admitted almost immediately. The governor's usual calm manner was somewhat ruffled this morning. He rose to greet the officers with quiet courtesy, seated them, and resumed his place behind the desk only to speak in a tone of chagrin. That woman, Madame By, she's gone. Got clean away this morning as the guard was transporting her to a place of confinement. Merriweather was instantly alarmed. She had been in his custody, technically under the guard of Jemadar Gunny and his marines in Countess, and he wondered if he could be held accountable for the escape. No, continued Duncan as though he read his mind. Your Jemadar holds the officer of the day's receipt for Madame By, and her loss is chargeable to him alone. Not that he had much choice from what I can discover. When did this happen? A bit after sunrise, I am informed. The Countess of Surrey was to sail on the morning tide for Surat. I had concluded that Madame Bai's crime was against the princely state of Rajputana, and not government or company. I intended to hold her in custody, pending advices from Holkar as to her disposition. Captain Reagan left the ship a little after seven, and the rescue was perhaps half an hour later, within a square of their destination. He had a sergeant and three private soldiers to handle her baggage, and Mrs. Hobbs, one of my housekeepers, to preserve propriety, all unarmed and riding in a barouche. A native sprang into the street, seized the bridles of the team, and four others armed with Gurkha knives held the guards at bay while the woman entered a Tonga. Once her luggage was loaded, one of the men cut the traces, hit the team with the reins, and it ran away. They all vanished in an instant, leaving the guards sitting there with their mouths open. Duncan gave a mirthless laugh. Thus so much of the subject of Madame Byers you wish to discuss, Commodore, in this audience has become moot. You're searching for her, of course, inquired Tollett. Oh, yes, the guard and the Bombay watch. But in that rabbit warren north of us it is nearly hopeless, and she was wearing native dress. Duncan abruptly changed the subject. Now, Merriweather... Had Tollett not asked for this audience, I would have sent for you anyway. You stay, Tollett. This is both government and marine business. 
He turned to pick up a packet of papers and leafed through them, separating them into two piles. Merriweather took instant alarm. He had anticipated an easy four months here while Pitt was repaired. A matter of a morning visit to the graving dock to ascertain progress and slight administrative duties. And with so much time, there was the very real chance that he might find a ship bound for Calcutta, wangle enough leave and see Caroline and his child. He sat back in resignation. You are generally familiar with this matter, Tollett, but I shall make a brief summary for the benefit of the captain here. For some months, intelligence has insisted that the French have a scheme to take Macau at the approaches to Canton, and thereby deny the company's trade with China. Portugal, of course, has long been the ally of England, though neutral in its war with Bonaparte. With his invasion of Spain, however, the situation has become so critical that the royal family has found it necessary to take refuge for the time in their colony of Brazil, and they find it impossible to reinforce the garrison of Macau. In this situation, the Governor-General took up the matter with the Viceroy of Goa, who exercises supervision of Macau with a view to reaching an agreement that substantial land and naval forces to supplement the Portuguese troops be dispatched and landed. The Viceroy indicated complete agreement with this offer and promised to draft an order to the commander of Macau so directing. For some reason, known only to the Viceroy, it has not been forthcoming as of this time. Your Excellency, I beg your pardon, but Macau is the property of the Emperor of China, and the Portuguese hold it only at his sufferance. Merriweather hurried on, seeing two lines form between the Governor's brows. I mean to say, sir, the Viceroy is on dangerous ground unless the Emperor consents. Precisely what Minto intends. But consent certainly will not be forthcoming unless the Viceroy first acts on his order. He looked speculatively at Merriweather. Pellew was here in Bombay only last month, and while he approved the plan for the reinforcement of Macau, he thought the danger was slight. Now it appears to be imminent. There are two French ships with a number of auxiliaries carrying troops at Manila, only six hundred miles distant and last month two frigates were reported by an American ship to have touched at Mauritius en route to the eastern seas. In the opinion of the Governor-General and his staff, the danger has become quite real. Accordingly, Minto has ordered the forces to be assembled for the occupation of Macau under the command of Rear Admiral O'Brien Drury, Royal Navy. He paused and looked again at Merriweather. I know your connection with Barlow, but are you also acquainted with Gibby Elliot? Why, no, sir. I only met him the one time when the combined operations against Russell Kaimar was being formed. Merriweather wondered what had provoked the question. Your credit seems to be quite high with him. I have here orders for you to proceed in pit to the rendezvous with Drury's squadron and the transports at Penang thence to proceed in company to Macau, and be attached to Drury's staff as the personal representative of the Governor-General. Of course, there are two alternates named, should you not be available, and you have rather thoroughly eliminated Pitt as a means of conveyance as a result of your recent action. But you have Comet available, Tollett. I am constrained to ask for her services. Certainly, Your Excellency. She will require victualling, water, and some maintenance, but she can be ready for sea in forty-eight hours, I am sure. No rest for the weary, Merriweather thought, with resignation. He had anticipated a restful period while Pitt was in the dock, and now he had been built of it. He became conscious that Duncan was speaking again. I also have here an assessment of the situation prepared by Colonel Napier for the Governor-General to which are appended some rather explicit instructions as to your duties as his representative. You may receipt for these items now. 
The governor pushed one stack of the papers across his desk and handed Merriweather a freshly dipped pen. And now a much more pleasant duty. By proclamation I have designated the usual monthly levee tomorrow night to be in the honour of the victors in the action at Aden. Back in his quarters, Merriweather subsided over a cup of tea to sort through the packet, still feeling a bit put upon at the recall to duty so soon after two strenuous operations in the past six months. Duncan had done a magnificent summary of the intelligence estimate, and he soon cast this aside to concentrate upon the memorandum of advice and admonition as to his authority in the premises. It quickly became clear that the personal representative of the Governor-General must depend largely upon moral suasion insofar as the military decisions were concerned, since this authority was vested in Admiral Drury. The Admiral had been granted a very broad discretion as to the action he should take, dependent upon the local situation and the advice he should receive from the select committee of supracargoes at Canton. At the mention of these arrogant men, Merriweather wrinkled his nose in distaste, wondering if the obnoxious Elfingham was yet president of the select committee. That individual, more than two years ago, had preferred charges against him for violation of the laws of China, though he had been most honourably acquitted by a court of inquiry at Bombay Castle. Oh well, time for a drink and then dinner. He found every officer out of Pitt, Comet, and Vigilant, plus McClellan at the club already having drinks set before them. In a port as secure as Bombay, it was considered safe enough to leave a warrant officer as duty commander aboard ship, with responsible petty officers to stand the gangway and anchor watches. Before he reached a vacant seat at the long table, there was a babble of voices in greeting. He soon learned the reason for this extraordinary turnout. Sly Boots here, explained McCrae, indicating Larkin, was going to take French leave with never a word to his old shipmates. Now, Mac, protested the tall American, I was going to call around and say goodbye to everyone. Likely story. There was good-natured chaffing up and down the table as the servants finished serving the drinks. Then Buttram stood to propose a toast. To Lieutenant Alexander Larkin, who has seen the error of his ways and proposes to mend them by departing the Marine for the greener fields of Kentucky and Louisiana. May his fortunes prosper. Glasses were downed as cries of speech, speech, echoed along the board. Larkin arose slowly, a bit red in the face. Gentlemen, I am most appreciative of this farewell. To save repetition, I'll say my piece this one time. I had concluded some months ago I had had enough of India and the Marine. When I lost this flipper, I decided the time had arrived. A fortunate combination of circumstances makes it now. The Indian man, West Riding, sails on the morning tide. She was short two mates, and her master very kindly offered me passage to London and a hundred pounds in return for standing a regular watch homeward bound. Thence I shall go back to America, where the United States has bought half a continent from Bonaparte. I can only believe that there are great opportunities there. And now, to each of you, I wish all good fortune, plenty of prizes, and plenty of duff. He sat down as the table rose spontaneously to toast his health again. The affair only broke up after midnight when a group of the younger officers departed for the European brothel over in Bombay. Larkin was in no condition to be trusted alone to make his way out to the India man, and McCrae volunteered to see him aboard. And have you received your orders? Merriweather inquired. Yes, Captain. But I indented on the victualling yard this afternoon. You'd best see to any cabin stores you desire for yourself as well, for I travel light. Are you taking a servant? Yes, sang, of course. Quarters would be cramped enough in the schooner, 
that he really should have an aide along someone he could trust to carry a message or serve as his eyes and ears when he was absent. Hamlin was bright and quick, with considerable force of character and the assurance of one to the manner born, but somehow Merriweather doubted that he would wear well on a long voyage in close company. Then, too, there were the examinations for lieutenant here at the castle in September, and Hamlin was already recommended for them. Marlowe was a relatively unknown quantity, but he admired the boy's spirit and was indebted to him for his providential lion's mouth last month. He reached a decision. And I shall take Marlowe as my personal aid if you can accommodate him. Two days later Merriweather stood at ease on the quarter-deck, as Comet weighed anchor to be towed out of the harbour against the wind by the pulling oars of two dockyard launches. He had no difficulty this time keeping hands off as McCrae and Dillon conned the vessel in the weary beat south to Goa. He could watch Bombay slide below the horizon with little regret. There was nothing to hold him there. They must put in a Goa and wait on the Viceroy, in the unlikely event that he had decided to issue his orders to the Governor of Macau to permit the British to reinforce his garrison. If no such order was immediately forthcoming, he must proceed without further delay to the rendezvous at Penang. Admiral Drury was an unknown quantity, only recently arrived on the Indian station, and it behooved Merriweather to get off on the right foot with the commander of the force. He thought of the social affair last night. Much sound and fury is signifying nothing, he decided, a mere repetition of the dozens he had attended. He had enjoyed foregathering with McClellan and Mary, and Mrs. Tollett had been pleasant enough in her shy way. But he had, for the second consecutive night, drunk far too much, and a period of abstention in the fresh sea air would be therapeutic. He watched Marlowe unobtrusively, serving on the voyage as Dillon's junior, and thought he discerned a new confidence in the lad as he gave his orders to the helm. When he had summoned the midshipman to his quarters to acquaint him with his new assignment, Marlowe appeared ecstatic, and Merriweather had allowed him to read through the packet of orders, assessments, and instructions to impress him with the gravity of the mission. There would be no time for skylarking, he told the boy. This was serious business, and much of his future in the Marine might depend upon how well he performed his duty. Cock and bull, possibly, but he might well have to rely on the wits of this sixteen-year-old officer. Comet anchored off the bar at Goa, and Merriweather accompanied by Marlowe, dressed to the nines, boots gleaming, made a spray-swept passage into the port. He did not penetrate beyond the single English-speaking secretary to the Viceroy. No, Captain, the haughty Don said as he returned to the anteroom. His Excellency is not prepared to issue such orders at the present time. Please express my profoundest thanks and the compliments of the Governor-General to His Excellency, said Merriweather with a sweeping bow. And now I bid you good day. He had expected nothing more. The Dons, Spanish or Portuguese, were famous for their ability to procrastinate. Still, it would have been pleasant to walk out of the palace with the order and surprise Drury with his enterprise. Once clear of Ceylon, the big schooner fairly flew across the Bay of Bengal to raise Pulo Rondo north of Sumatra four days later. Merriweather came on deck to survey the island where he had destroyed Abercrombie's lair nearly three years before. Two hours later, they overhauled three transports under escort of Phaeton, 38, Greyhound, 32, Diana, 12, and Jasser, Brig, 12. According to the operation order, this was the European contingent of troops from Madras. McRae pressed on by, flying the current recognition signal, having no desire to be dragooned into forming a part of the escort force. At least they would not be late for the rendezvous. They came to anchor off Fort Cornwallis in early morning. 
Rear Admiral Drury had his flag in Russell, 74, with Dedania's, 36, present, and the company's ships David Scott and Alnick Castle, carrying the 600 sepoys from Calcutta moored close by. Merriweather saw that the absentee pennant was not hoisted. He bundled up his orders and made an immediate call upon the Admiral. Drury was a man who wore his dignity like a cloak, reserved and precise in speech, and yet neither cold nor aloof. The innate kindliness of his nature showed through his formal manner, though he was clearly a man of force and resolution. Merriweather remembered the anecdote of the Royal Navy captain at the Levee that last night in Bombay. He had made discreet inquiry of the officer who had come out with the Admiral on his staff with orders to relieve Pellew early in the new year. I've known Obi since we were midshipmen together, and he has a most unusual philosophy as to the mission and social rank of a naval officer. In his mind, it is the highest and most honourable calling to which man may aspire. Why, on the voyage out here, we were strolling on quarterdeck one fine evening, wondering a bit what service in the eastern seas might be like. Neither of us had been here before. When he asked my opinion in all seriousness whether he should claim precedence of the Governor-General by virtue of his rank. Clayton, he said, the Governor-General is merely the servant of the East India Company, while I am a King's officer. The captain had laughed, and Merriweather took alarm. Was he to be afflicted with another George Barlow, a man jealous of the last perquisite ruffle and flourish due his office? Something of his dismay must have shown in his face, for the captain laughed again, and continued, But he is not all that bad. He is essentially a kindly man, though a stickler for the performance of duty, and so long as you show due respect for the lofty nature of the office he holds, you will receive fair and considerate treatment from the man himself. And he will not call upon you to do anything he would not do himself. Now, seated across the desk in the flag cabin of HMS Russell, face to face with Admiral Drury, Merriweather could see for himself something of the complicated nature of the man. He was entirely courteous, yet encouraged others to keep their distance. Solicitous of the comfort of an officer of a fellow naval service, but compelling consciousness of the great gulf that separated them. I see that you did not come in the frigate as your orders directed, Captain. Is there an explanation? Yes, sir. Pitt is docked for major rebuilding at Bombay. Damaged in a recent action, Captain? Yes, sir. At Aden. And the result of that action? Three French thirty-sixes taken, sir. I have seen no report of that engagement. We left Madras after Pellew arrived from Bombay. What the hell? Did the man doubt his word? The Admiral departed Bombay almost a fortnight before we came in, sir. He looked at the bland face, and added, Comet brought a pouch of mail for you, sir. Good. Is the consent of the Viceroy included? No, sir. I called at Goa last week, but no such order had been signed. It is by no means essential but I would prefer to have such a direction in hand when we call on the Governor of Macau. And now, Captain, I am informed that you are entirely familiar with the situation at Canton, and that I may call upon you for such information as I require. In fact, Lord Minto was most complimentary of the services you have rendered to Sir George Barlow and, more recently, to him in a mission to Persia and the destruction of Russell Kaima. My knowledge of Canton is somewhat stale, sir. I was last there two years ago. No matter. Little change in the Orientals, they tell me. And, Captain, are your quarters in Comet adequate? We are somewhat crowded here in Russell. Entirely, sir. Merriweather had no desire to be crammed into the quarters of some resentful evicted lieutenant in the flagship for the long voyage to Macau. Very well. 
The balance of our force should be here by tomorrow, and I intend to sail the next day. Not many facilities here for a place planned to be the major operating base for the Eastern Seas. Are you acquainted ashore? There seems to be no more than an acting first secretary here in charge since Governor Dundas died last year. Yes, sir. Tom Raffles, I presume. He paused a moment to see if the Admiral had another comment. He was most helpful to me last year when I commanded the Bengal Squadron. Once he escaped from this interview, he intended to call on Tom and Livy. The thought of that charming, enigmatic woman gave him a thrill of anticipation, though he was now a married man and a father. I think we understand one another, Captain. Possibly, some fine day on the voyage, we may be able to foregather for a more extended discussion of the situation and tactics. I am anxious to see if there is any later intelligence in that pouch. Drury rose and inclined his head in formal dismissal. On his way back to Comet, Merriweather tried to sort out his impressions of Rear Admiral O'Brien Drury Royal Navy. Without the shrewd observations of Captain Clayton that night at Bombay, he would have been at a loss to explain the man, and yet he might yet be dead wrong. But he felt he had at least a glimmer of what made the Admiral go. The man beneath the mantle of rank and authority was able, modest, and unassuming even a bit surprised that he found himself cloaked with such power and dignity, but under compulsion to exact full respect and deference to the office he filled for the time. It was only in the last fifty years that the naval officer had come to be accounted a gentleman in the ordinary sense of the term, though sure even now he was likely to be looked down upon as a parvenu by those who felt themselves born to the title and many officers still possessed little enough confidence in their social standing. But the day of the gruff, horny-handed old sea-dog was largely past. The entering midshipmen likely to be from the landed gentry or minor nobility of England, particularly the southern counties, and accounting themselves gentlemen by birth rather than by virtue of the King's commission. The distinction had caused Merriweather concern in years past, but he had been accepted at face value in the British community in India as an officer of the Marine, and since his tacit acknowledgment last year by Percy, the fact of his bastardy had ceased to trouble him. Drury had first made it plain that Merriweather was present only to supply him such information as to the situation as he might require, but on parting there had been almost an intimation of a hand in the development of strategy and tactics in the affair. Probably it was no more than a matter of semantics, Merriweather concluded, and resolved to govern himself with the utmost restraint in his dealings with the Admiral. Somehow the almost magical spell that Livy Raffles had cast over Merriweather a year and a half ago had dissolved. Not that she had changed. She was as vivacious, charming, and witty as before and he wondered if marriage and fatherhood had somehow made him less susceptible to the allure of this woman of the world. He now sat in the familiar room in their hillside bungalow, listening to the witty criss-cross of statement and comment that flew back and forth between Tom and Livy, with an occasional tangent darting out to include him in their conversation. But the exhilaration that had bubbled in his veins last year when he was in her presence was lacking. He could discern no visible difference in her appearance or manner, and her welcome had been warm enough, an embrace and kiss on the lips, but it had not ignited the fire that had consumed him on the other occasion. He became conscious that Tom had addressed him. Captain, we plan a reception in honour of Admiral Drury for tomorrow night, and have invited several of the residents for refreshment and a buffet beforehand since supper will be quite late. The young man had removed his formal coat and the waistcoat with its magnificent chain and jingling seals that he affected, and sat now in his shirt, collar open. We would be delighted if you will join us. It should be a pleasant affair, Merriweather decided, and accepted the invitation gladly. 
And now I must go back to the ship. You know I am entertaining the officers in Comet at Mr. Moulton's public house tonight. He rose and bowed to Livy. It has been as delightful to see you both as I remembered. No, Tom, it is an easy walk to the landing and I need the exercise. Merriweather made his escape, wondering at the sense of uneasiness that had possessed him in the company of this charming pair, then dismissed the thought as he made his way briskly down the hill to the boat landing, stopping off at the public house for another gin while he renewed acquaintance with Mr. Moulton, the proprietor, and bespoke the private dining room for the entertainment he planned for the officers of Comet that evening. Two days down the Strait of Malacca, Merriweather took the glass to the cross-trees to try to make out for himself what young Mr. Thomas Stamford Raffles professed to see as the site for the eastern capital of the British Empire. There was an island off the mainland that appeared to shelter a considerable expanse of water for a snug anchorage, but at this distance he could tell little about the terrain. There were several trails of blue smoke rising into the sky, but he could not see the village of Singapore itself. He thought for a moment of the handsome, energetic man, risen almost from obscurity to be the de facto governor of the presidency of Penang, and the vibrant woman almost ten years his senior whom he had married. He wondered again at the rumour that Raffles owed his appointment a meteoric rise in the company to the fact that he had removed an embarrassment to a senior company official by marriage to Livy. The man was facile, alert for the main chance, ambitious, and entirely capable of making such a bargain. But he also appeared to be devoted to his wife, and she to him. Last year, during his days of glory as Commodore of the Bengal Squadron, Merriweather had lusted after the woman, felt her spell possess him, envied Raffles his enjoyment of her charms. He had had the provocation and opportunity the day he delivered his gift of the Chinese desk to cuckold the young man, but had stepped back, and in retrospect had often regretted his sudden surge of principle. Now he concluded he had been entirely right. He thought of the reception for Admiral Drury two nights ago. It had been a glittering, raffles-managed affair, with Livy sparkling at his side as he introduced the British residents to the officer, then dancing and liquid refreshments, and finally a sumptuous supper served. Merriweather had received the letter he had written to Miss Judith Johnson from the mail pouch, and had it in his pocket for personal delivery with his condolences to the young lady at some appropriate time. It was a duty he dreaded. The probable hysterics and tears, the blasting of an idyll. And almost he determined to leave it with Raffles for delivery after he departed, then concluded that he owed it to Dobbs to impart the sad news in person. He had remembered her as a slip of a girl, but she had bloomed in the year and a half since he had seen her. She came in on the arm of a junior lieutenant he remembered vaguely as out of HMS Argus to take their place in the line approaching the guest of honour. Once through the introductions, he followed them to the room where punch was being served to come close alongside. He saw recognition in her eyes. Why, Commodore! Her escort looked sharply at him, then bobbed in a bow. Miss Judith Johnson! I'm delighted to see you again. Not really, and this was certainly no time to give the grisly news. No longer, Commodore, Mistress Judith Sargent, since last March. And this is my husband, Lieutenant Hilary Sargent, Royal Navy. Merriweather bowed in response, feeling all of Dobbs's dreams turn to ashes. He was suddenly thankful that the young officer had not survived to face this heartbreak. A few platitudes, and then an escape without an inquiry as to Johnny Dobbs to go outside and shred the letter. Now he turned his attention to the activities in the various ships of the expedition, observing a fire drill in Russell, man overboard in Greyhound, 
and gunnery exercises in Comet below him. He could appreciate Drury's concern. He had often enough experienced it himself to make sure of the state of readiness of the ships he would have to depend upon in the forthcoming operation. It might be drudgery, but it was essential, and he made his way down to the deck, passing the sweating hands as they hauled the eighteen-pounders up to battery once more. Almost before they sighted the islets called the Ladrones, Meriwether could smell China. On the ebb tide, the excrement of millions of persons living ashore and afloat was carried out to sea from the network of streams that converged to become the Pearl and Canton rivers. Drury had ordered an anchorage in the roadstead off Macau, since warships were not permitted to go above Boca Tigre in any event and this was the point from which a landing could most easily be made in the Portuguese colony. To reach the company's compound at Canton, it would be necessary to travel by boat, a wearisome journey of many hours in the oppressive heat of the day. A boat from Russell soon made its way into a landing to report the squadron to the captain of the port and request pratique, a legal nicety considering the admiral's intentions but after a short interval the salutes began to bang out. Your best bib and tucker, Mr. Marlowe. The midshipman was dressed in the usual informal fashion affected by junior officers in the tropics. Wide plaited straw hat, sleeveless shirt, loose pantaloons and sandals of braided coir. Only a few minutes after the boat returned to Russell, the coxswain of the Admiral's barge had passed up a note from Drury's flag lieutenant, Admiral requests your presence, eleven, anti-meridian, this date. Evidently, there had been some news ashore, and he might as well initiate Marlow into his new duties, at least to carry the portfolio of orders, situation estimate and instructions from the Governor-General. A quarter of eleven at the gangway. The young officer departed at a canter. There were two company army officers in the flag cabin when Meriwether and Marlow were ushered in. A short obese lieutenant colonel with a florid complexion and a thin, hard-faced major. The admiral was not present, but his flag lieutenant made the introductions. Colonel Patrick Kelly commanding the occupation forces and Major Silas French commanding the Calcutta Sepoy Battalion. Captain Meriwether of the company's marine and his aide, Midshipman Marlow. It was only a moment or so before Drury entered from his sleeping cabin and took his place behind the desk. Gentlemen, I have an urgent communication from Mr. Roberts, President of the Select Committee of Supracargoes at Canton, requesting an audience at noon today. I thought it well that we foregather and discuss the situation and any impediments that might delay an immediate landing, if that is to be our course of action. None that I know of, sir, said Kelly, after a glance at Major French. Of course my orders put the force at the disposition of the company's select committee. Quite, replied the Admiral but under my orders I choose the time, place, and necessity of making the landing, and I certainly shall not order it until I have communicated with the Governor of Macau, and, if at all possible, obtained his consent, as well as that of the Viceroy of Canton and the Emperor, to an occupation of the town until peace shall be secured. I wish you gentlemen to be fully advised of my resolve in this respect." Kelly and French looked at one another again. Sir, that is a matter between you and the select committee. If it orders us to jump, we jump. Very well, gentlemen, I think we understand one another. I shall permit no hasty or ill-considered action by the committee. There was desultory conversation between the company officers until the messenger announced the arrival of Messrs. J. W. Roberts and T. C. Patty the President and second member of the Select Committee. Roberts was a tall, fair man of possibly forty, but his hooded eyes belied the politely languid manner he affected. Patty was short, dark-haired, ten years younger, and gave the impression of passion barely contained. 
Drury unbent enough to offer his hand to each in turn, and they were seated at the opposite end of the desk from Merriweather and the army officers. He wondered what had been the fate of the old, arrogant John Elfingham, who had been the president two years ago, when he had influenced the Hoppo to withhold Grand Chop to certain Indian men in the hope of private gain. Sir George Barlow had promised that he would be sacked, but this was no time to inquire. Now, Admiral, Roberts drawled, I think it imperative to make a landing and take possession of the Portuguese defence works at the earliest possible moment. Drury wore the bland expression of complete self-confidence in his rank and position that Merriweather had seen last month. He listened to an amplification of the demand and the numerous reasons advanced in its support. Roberts finished his exposition, then spread his hands. So... Has the governor been apprised of your intentions? Only in general, sir. And his reply? He wants to await an order from the Viceroy of Goa. Did you bring it? No. Captain Merriweather made a renewed request in person, and it was not forthcoming. I think it not essential, but I do consider it no more than common courtesy to call upon the governor and formally acquaint him with our demands, in order that he may in turn inform the Viceroy of Canton and the Emperor of China. Patty appeared on the verge of erupting, but Roberts's expression did not change as he leaned forward in his chair. I have no objection to informing the governor prior to the actual landing so that he may restrain his troops, but I am of the opinion it would be productive of great mischief if the Chinese are informed in advance. Will you elaborate? Why, apparently Roberts had thought that his opinion would be accepted without justification. Why, principally, the distance to the emperor and the delay in getting the troops ashore. I am sure they do not thrive penned up in transports. Merriweather saw that this was a reason that appealed to the two company officers. Then, too, the Emperor takes little interest in the affairs or trade at Canton. This is a perquisite of the Viceroy, but I can stop it with a word depriving him of the customs duties which account for a major portion of his income. "'Doesn't that cut both ways, Mr. Roberts?' inquired Drury. "'If the Chinese decided not to trade, it would be the ruin of your company. "'I think the Viceroy needs us far more than we need the Chinese.' Roberts looked down at his hands. "'I agree with your opinion that the Governor should be informed, but not the Viceroy.' There is little enough he can do once he does learn of the action. And the Emperor? I doubt the Viceroy will see fit to communicate with him, even when he discovers the occupation. Is the Viceroy the only eyes or ears the Emperor possesses in Canton? It was a rhetorical question, only as Drury continued. But first things first. I shall call upon the Governor at his earliest convenience to broach the subject in person. Will you be kind enough to ascertain when it would be convenient to see him? No need, said Patty, reaching into his pocket. I have here an invitation from His Excellency, Senor Bernardo Alex de Lemos e Faria, requesting the pleasure of your company at a reception in your honour this evening, beginning at nine, which means ten o'clock at his mansion. While this will be entirely a social occasion, I have no doubt but you can make a formal appointment with him. He handed over a vellum sheet handsomely lettered in black ink and bearing an imposing seal. He looked over at Roberts, received a nod, and continued. And now we must conclude this interview, sir, leaving our course of action somewhat unsettled, but with the hope that we can reach an early conclusion. The supercargoes rose, bowed, and went out. The Admiral sat at his desk a moment, bemused. Arrogant bastards, he said almost as though to himself, then picked up the invitation. It is in English, gentlemen, and includes my staff, you officers, the captain, and one officer from each ship present. 
Flags, will you see this communicated without delay to all ships present? Full dress, but no swords. Can't risk an incident. And stay in their boats until I step ashore. He paused and looked at the four officers a moment. I shall see you later. Oh, Merriweather, remain if you please. Once they were out, Drury leaned back and faced him. I gather you did not know those gentlemen. No, sir. A man by the name of Elfingham was president when I was here two years ago. But these appear to be worthy successors to him. What do you mean by that, Captain? Merriweather related the train of events that had culminated in the issuance of Grand Chop by the Hoppo and the frustration of Elfingham's plan to delay the sailing of certain new India men for his private gain. Then he sent a member of the Select Committee to Bombay to prefer charges of violating the laws of China against me. I was tried and acquitted by a court of inquiry, and Sir George Barlow recommended to the Court of Directors that the entire committee be replaced. I can only assume that it has been, but by men of like stripes. Do you still have contact with those Chinese in Canton? I am sure I could find them. Their grandfather, if he is still alive, is a Mandarin of Canton, the old Chinese dynasty, not Manchu. And I am acquainted with the resident agent of British intelligence in the city. Well, perhaps you will be of assistance to me. I really had no knowledge of what qualified you to be sent on this assignment. Now, I am bound to pay attention to the desires of those gentlemen. They control the use of the troops. But I am by no means satisfied with the course of action they urge. Once I talk to the governor, I should have a better idea of which way to go. I shall see you later. Comet's gig lay fifty yards off the landing as the Admiral's barge proceeded in. Seniority among the commanders of the ships present made McCrae with his recent promotion second from last, and the Admiral was already being greeted by Roberts and Patty, together with a thin, anxious-appearing civilian, by the time Merriweather and his party caught up. There were flaring torches set in iron sconces along the mole, and a few yards inland a cluster of brightly uniformed officers in front of two rigid files of troops, evidently the honour guard. He fell in hastily behind Drury as the party moved off. There were elaborate introductions, sweeping bows, the guard to be inspected by the Admiral, and then the guests were loaded into a succession of barouches which moved off towards the governor's mansion. There was a fugal man standing at attention a pace forward of the first rank, his face clearly visible in the torchlight, darkly handsome with curly side whiskers and a bulb moustache. His yellow eyes swept across Merriweather's face without the slightest flicker of recognition as the barouche passed. But Merriweather felt a hand of ice seize his heart. Osborne? Was it possible? Osborne? Could a man rise from death in the mud at the bottom of Bombay Harbour? He almost turned in his seat to look back, and then decided he was being ridiculous. The man was long since food for fish. The type was common enough. It had been said that Osborne had gypsy blood to account for his swarthy complexion. But the resemblance was uncanny. The barouche was coming to a stop at the door of the mansion, and he put the matter out of his mind as the elaborate formalities of the governor's welcome commenced. The thin, anxious man turned out to be Mr. Wickham, the British consul at Macau, fluent in Portuguese and ready to serve as interpreter. This was an old colony, albeit a small one, and protocol was rigidly observed. The governor and his lady were flanked by close to a dozen couples, several of the men in uniform glittering with gold lace, and the others in civilian formal dress. Senor Bernardo Alexis de Lemos e Faria was an erect, dignified man of middle years with a full head of iron-grey hair, clean-shaven, with a bold nose and penetrating black eyes. 
his lady was considerably younger, a raven-haired beauty of much fairer complexion than most of the other women present. Merriweather watched proceedings as he waited in the line, and the British consul made the presentations. The governor apparently had at least some command of English, and he and Drury had their heads together for a moment before the admiral moved on. The introductions were soon over, and the party adjourned to another area of the ballroom where wine was served and formal toast proposed. With so many candles blazing within the room and the press of people, the air soon became stifling, and Merriweather felt sweat begin to trickle under his arms. There were double doors open at the end of the room, and a patio beyond looking out over the roadstead. Candles were shielded in coloured paper globes to shed a mellow light over numerous small tables set about, many of them already occupied by chattering groups of officers and ladies, while servants moved along them setting out wine and dainty morsels of food. The sea breeze was pleasant, and Merriweather found an unoccupied table at the edge of the terrace, where he was soon served with a glass and plate of small cakes. The wine was drier with a hint of the taste of resin in it, much more suited for this climate than the heavy port of the toasts. He soon felt refreshed and looked about, hearing a string ensemble strike up a lilting tune in the ballroom, but he had no desire to participate in the dancing. He wondered how long the affair might endure. As he could not leave before Drury, he resigned himself to another long evening. It was a strong contralto voice that spoke his name. Why, Captain Merriweather, I could not be sure as you came out of the door with the light at your back. Merriweather rose in confusion. The woman had her back to the light now, and he could not make out her features. He was sure he knew no one in Macau, and he sidled sideways as he bowed, trying to gain the advantage of the nearest lamp for identification. It was a needless effort. The woman spoke again. Creuse a hail, Captain. I could not expect you to recognize me at this distance from Bombay. Good God! The drunken woman he had rescued from the equally drunken attentions of that man in Bombay last winter. He became aware that another older woman was at her side and bowed again. My aunt, Senora Maria Alvarado, wife of the commandant of the garrison. Merriweather remembered his manners. Will you join me, ladies? Oh, we are with a party of my husband's officers from the garrison, Captain, said Senora Alvarado in excellent English. He was startled for a moment, then remembered Mrs. Tollett's identification of the family as old Portuguese merchants in Bombay. And I am obligated to rejoin them, but I shall leave Creusa in your company. Perhaps you can console her. She turned and went back to a large group at several tables pulled together where gold lace glittered. Barryweather held the chair and seated Mrs. Hale, then resumed his own seat as he signalled the waiter for refreshments. Now, Captain, I have no ties on you, and if I am an embarrassment, just say so. I am no longer Mrs. Hale. Father Rodrigo serves as papal legate in these remote parts, and he has granted me an annulment of my marriage to Hale. He's a Protestant, and there were no children, though he tried hard enough. Merriweather was taken aback by these rapid revelations, though he tried to follow them as she continued. So, being a full-blooded woman who lives for the moment rather than the morrow, I formed a liaison with your Mr. Patty. Who? Oh, yes, the second member of the select committee, smouldering passion barely contained. The pair should have suited one another admirably. Then heard her urgent voice continue, and it was really rather a happy affair until that Anglo-Indian came to town. I don't know how they met, but she mesmerized him. He has her in his quarters, and hanged the scandal. Of course, Robert keeps a Chinese girl, and the others do too, though they are over at Canton right now. 
Merriweather looked at her, trying to make some sense out of the gush of words that had imparted such diverse information. She tossed off her glass of wine and signalled the waiter for another. Was she going to drink herself into insensibility as she had that night at Bombay? The prospect of a drunken woman on his hands offended him, and he sought some excuse to leave her. No, Captain, I shall not drink to excess, she said as though she read his mind. That was the first glass I have had today. I realize I am a little too full of myself, and what I just said may very well not make sense to you. The waiter set the wine before her, but she left it untouched, looking at him with her eyes glistening. You're married, I take it, Captain? Yes, am father of a new son. What was the woman getting at? Makes little enough difference out here. So are Patty and Roberts and all the rest. And China is a long way from England. And what the little woman at home doesn't know won't hurt her. She may even be taking a tumble of her own with the local squire. Merriweather was becoming restive. Sober or not, he wished she would come to her point, whatever it might be. My dear, he said gently, I gather that an affair of the heart has gone awry and you are understandably upset. Who is this woman and what service may I perform? Why, Patty called her Tulsi. She's a half-caste Indian, landed here late last month. It was impossible. Had Madame by anticipated him here? What was her mission? It was entirely possible, however, that what with his stops at Gur and Penang, the exercises underway, and the poor sailing qualities of transport, she might very well have made her way from Bombay to arrive ahead of him. Creusa was still talking. I only saw her once. She had an introduction to the judge of the High Court of Macau. He is said to deal in opium. A beautiful enough woman, if you fancy the type. There were tears trickling down her cheeks now, and she dabbed her handkerchief at her eyes. My uncle says, you are the representative of the Governor-General. I thought you might have influence. She looked at him hopefully. I am sorry, but no. The supercargoes are supreme out here. Even Admiral Drury has no authority over them. An expression of disappointment crossed her face, but her tears had ceased. He sought to change the subject. Tell me something of this place. My experience has been almost entirely with Canton. The spirit of reckless abandon she had displayed in Bombay appeared to be entirely lacking. Well, it is a much quieter place than Bombay especially at this season when the supercargoes and their staff are all over at Canton and the ship's ready to discharge. We have few social events. The one tonight is the second since I have been here. I met Patty at the first. It really is rather dull, but since my mother died I have no ties in England. This was not the type of information Merriweather desired, and he intervened with a question. Have you heard your uncle say anything about the military and diplomatic situation? Very little. He does not discuss such matters with his family. Oh, I know he has orders to resist any landing, and there are eighty Mandarin war junks up those creeks not fifty miles from here, with five thousand men in them, but I doubt the Viceroy of Canton would send them to our aid. He fears the loss of his customs duties and Roberts and Patty already have threatened that the cotton will not be landed. A morsel of intelligence as to the proximity of the Chinese naval force, but little else. Merriweather saw Marlowe appear in the doorway, scanning the terrace anxiously, and raised his hand in acknowledgement. I think my party is ready to take its leave, he told Creusa. I am delighted to have seen you again. She looked up with a changed expression, more the devil-may-care attitude she had worn in Bombay, and reached across the table to grasp his arm. He remembered the parting at her door that early morning, and then the note, 
and undertook to back away, disengaging himself from the woman. He had no intention of betraying Caroline with her, if that was what she had in mind. He rose. Shall I escort you back to your party? He offered his arm, and they made their way through the clustered tables and the hum of unintelligible conversation to the commandant's group. He bowed to Senora Alvarado, then to Creusa, and took his leave. Outside, his party was already formed up to enter the carriages, and Drury soon appeared. As they alighted at the landing, the flag lieutenant approached. Admiral wants you on board Russell by eight bells of the morning watch, sir. Back in Comet, he found Sang at his door with a sealed missive in his hand. It was delivered by a Chinese boat, sir. The letter read, My dear Captain Merriweather, I shall call upon you in Comet tomorrow afternoon. S. Dawson. The schoolmaster of his youth. Merriweather had last seen him two years ago in Canton, and then Percy had let drop the fact that he was the agent in place for British intelligence out here. Well, Merriweather would be glad to renew acquaintance with the man, but he was startled that his arrival had been reported so promptly. He retired with a call for four bells in the morning watch to lie awake nearly an hour with thoughts, not of the pending meeting with Drury, possibly the governor of Macau, and Dawson, but of Creusa Hale. At this juncture, in his single cot far away from Caroline, a possible bit of dalliance with a beautiful woman was by no means as unthinkable as it had been even an hour ago. He strove to put her out of his mind, then tormented himself with the vision of the splendid torso she had displayed at Bombay. Good God! In this course lay madness. He got off the cot and went out on deck in the sultry night, cadged a cup of coffee from the officer of the watch, and came back to his room to fall asleep until he was awakened by the knock and call of the messenger just as four bells sounded. Drury was drinking tea when the flag lieutenant ushered Merriweather into his cabin. Drury waved him to a chair, swallowed, and pushed the cup aside to assume his cloak of dignity, then picked up a letter from his desk. This came from Roberts before daybreak. He's changed his mind again. He wants no negotiation with the governor, simply commence landing the troops. Of course I shall do nothing of the kind. My audience with the governor is at ten this morning. I shall keep the appointment make a full disclosure of the situation or request his consent to the occupation. If it is not forthcoming, then I shall consider more extreme measures. I do not intend to take the supracargos to the meeting. Do you disagree? No, sir. And I am of the opinion that the Viceroy of Canton must be informed in advance. What he tells the Emperor is then his own affair. Barryweather paused to try to put his thoughts in order. I picked up two items of interest last night. First, the Viceroy has eighty Mandarin war junks between here and Canton, with a reported five thousand men in them. Second, I have a note from the agent of British intelligence in Canton that he will call upon me this afternoon. Drury showed immediate interest. Five thousand? And how are they armed? Rather lightly, by our standards. None of them could stand against even a sloop. But of course the massed firepower, if they decided to seal off the bogue, would be substantial. Very well. Another factor to keep in mind. Now we shall embark. They were met at the landing by Consul Wickham and a captain, aide de camp in the Portuguese garrison, wearing a gold bullion aiguillette. The carriage took them past the off-season quarters of the East India Company, and Merriweather wondered if Madame Bai might be sojourning there as Patty's chère amie for the time being. They pulled up at the Governor's mansion and shortly were ushered into an ornate chamber, where the Governor stood behind his desk to greet them. There was a man in the robes of a Catholic priest standing to one side and behind him. "'Good morning, gentlemen.' 
said the governor in a strong accent. My English is limited, and the father Rodrigo will serve as my interpreter. They were seated in hard, gilded chairs in front of the desk, and Drury commenced his exposition of the situation and of intelligence that had come to the attention of government. Father Rodrigo, hand cupped beside his mouth, put the words into Portuguese almost as fast as the admiral could utter them. Governor de Lemos listened attentively without interruption as Drury concluded. And so, Your Excellency, in order to counter this infamous plot by Bonaparte, we have no alternative but to demand that we be allowed to land and reinforce your garrison. The Viceroy of Goa is fully acquainted with the matter, and it is no more than a matter of time before his order to this effect reaches you. But I am under the necessity of proceeding without delay. The Admiral leaned back and fixed the Governor with a keen gaze. Senor de Lemos, eyes averted, lips pursed, finally looked up and out the window towards the anchorage. When he looked back at Drury, his expression had hardened, and Meriwether braced himself for the rebuff, as the governor began to speak with Father Rodrigo almost simultaneously delivering the English translation. Wickham apparently was content with the priest's version. Senor Admiral, I am without power to grant your request until such time as the Viceroy shall authorize me to do so. Also, under the terms of the treaties between the Portugal and China, I must inform the Viceroy of Canton before permitting foreign troops to land in Macau. I sincerely regret that I am powerless to accommodate you. Drury now spoke forcefully punctuating his remarks with a finger jabbed towards the governor. Your Excellency, I thought I'd made myself clear. I am under the most imperative of orders, and am compelled to land my forces regardless of whether you consent or not. If there is bloodshed, it will be upon your head. The expression on the governor's face altered, and he appeared to hesitate before he spoke again. Senor Admiral, he began in a conciliatory tone. Surely you recognize my position? I request of you at least twenty-four hours to enable me to consult with my people. This comes as somewhat of a surprise, and I must not act hastily. Very well, Drury said. Twenty-four hours, Your Excellency, but I shall expect your reply at the end of that period without further delay. He looked at Merriweather with a signal that he considered the interview concluded, then heard the governor's invitation for refreshments. It was an hour past noon when they embarked again for Russell. "'Since you are expecting a visitor, I shall drop you by comet,' said Drury, as they pulled away. This was certainly the most considerate flag officer he had ever encountered, Merriweather decided in spite of his exaggerated opinion of the dignity of the office he held. As they pulled under the stern of the ship, he saw a Chinese boat lying off the starboard gangway. Dawson must already be on board. Mr. Dawson, he said, seizing the man's outstretched hand, remembering the long-ago days as a ship's boy in the Indiaman Dunvegan Castle, when Dawson had taught him enough to enable him to rise above the stigma of his illegitimate birth, and eventually achieve a captaincy in the Bombay Marine. I am delighted to see you again. Maybe not so much when you hear what I have to say. Merriweather ordered Sang to bring refreshments. And what may I do for you, Mr. Dawson? I'll be as brief as I can, Captain, said Dawson pleasantly. But I think a bit of background is in order to acquaint you with the current situation here. I am rather familiar with the Chinese attitudes, particularly towards the company and the crown. The Emperor regards King George with about the same degree of respect as he does the chief of a small tribe in Borneo, and the company as a nuisance to be tolerated only because it enriches a few of his kinsmen. He is extremely jealous of his possessions, 
desires no intercourse with the foreign devils, and given provocation would expel the British and Portuguese from their concessions in a moment. The select committee professes to believe otherwise. The select committee is a pack of fools and corrupt as well. I thought when Elfingham and his crew were recalled things might improve. They have worsened. The members are not content with the very ample commissions they already receive, but have established an agency under the name of Bering and Company to handle the opium trade. But Bering is a member of the committee, and the company has absolutely forbidden the trade, as has China. Precisely. But money accomplishes many things. A Hong Kong merchant, Manhop by name, was induced by Robertson Bering last year to undertake the distribution of the contraband through Canton. He made his arrangements with the servants of the Hoppo, and they pay the same fees as for the landing of legitimate merchandise. Officially, the Hoppo knows nothing. Actually, his share of the customs is substantial, as is that of the Viceroy. But who brings it in? Surely not in company ships. Country ships, usually. There are fifty-seven bottoms of Wampoa now, of which twenty-seven are country ships from Bengal, Penang, and Bombay. My informant tells me that several of the ships have already landed their consignments, openly, and with the payment of duty to the officials. Though these supercargoes have held up the landing of other goods in furtherance of their design to coerce the Viceroy into not opposing the landing of troops at Macau. At least the Indian men were clean, if not the select committee, Merriweather thought, with a sense of relief. Every sailing order issued by the company contained the proviso, read out to the crew at the commencement of each voyage. You will take the most particular care that no opium be laden on your ship by yourself, your officers, or any other person, as the importation of that article at China is positively forbidden and serious consequences may result from your neglect of this injunction. And what has this to do with the mission to Macau? A great deal. Over three hundred chests of Malawan opium passed through Macau into China last winter. The company, of course, maintains a market for the legitimate sale of Bengal opium at Calcutta. This operation competes with it, though it is the produce of northern India and of lesser quality than the southern product. The Hoppo and Viceroy received no customs, and the select committee no commission on the shipment, which was reportedly managed by one of the highest officials of Macau. The profit was five hundred dollars net per chest. Is this not a powerful inducement to urge the immediate occupation of the town? It made sense. With the town occupied by troops under the control of the supercargoes, it should be relatively simple to stop off any further smuggling of the drug. I understand. Now what is your suggestion? Inform Admiral Drury of the motives of these gentlemen. I do not believe it will make any difference. He is going to give in to them in spite of his high-flown rhetoric as to obtaining consent from the Viceroy. But he is entitled to this information. Dawson looked out of the port at the town of Macau in the distance with his near-sighted gaze for a moment, then continued, I am not a military man but I fail to see the necessity for an actual occupation of Macau at this time. With a mobile squad at his command, able to oppose the French at any point they may appear, I would think him to be in a better position than with a few hundred troops ashore. If the Emperor learns of a fate accompli, I am certain that the wrath of China will be visited upon all of us, and the company will lose its trade at Canton. He shook his head. But, for reasons that I am not at liberty to divulge just now, I am content to let the select committee in Drury make this blunder. Merriweather was surprised at the statement. Dawson had just outlined motive and probable consequences of the operation, 
and then expressed satisfaction in the course pursued. He looked sharply at the man, and concluded that Dawson must have his reasons, though he would have preferred to know them. It appeared that the interview was over, but then Dawson spoke again. You remember Wong, of course? Certainly. And how is the young man? He is now the Mandarin. His grandfather died last winter, and being four months older than his cousin, he succeeded. He possesses much wisdom for his years, as well as ambition. I expect great things of Wong, though his title derives from the old dynasty of China and not the Manchus. If all goes well, I hope you may renew acquaintance with him. I regret the news of the Mandarin's death. He did me a great service three years ago. And now I shall be on my way back to Canton. If you need to communicate with me, entrust your message to Mr. Wickham, the consul. Merriweather saw Dawson to the gangway for the weary voyage back to Canton, as the officer of the watch called away the gig for his visit to the flagship. He trusted Dawson implicitly but was a bit bemused at his motives in making the call, imparting the intelligence and then indicating satisfaction in letting the supercargoes achieve their ends. Time would no doubt solve the mystery. No, said Drury in his pleasant manner a quarter of an hour later. I am interested, of course, in the suspect motives of those gentlemen but your informant's report does not authorize me to ignore explicit orders. I shall expect to receive permission at noon tomorrow from the governor to commence the landing. I shall at that time also urge him to petition the viceroy. But in any event, Macau shall be occupied. He sat back and looked speculatively at Merriweather, who gained the distinct impression that the Admiral did not believe a word of the intelligence. Very well. I shall want you present when we call on the governor tomorrow, he continued in dismissal, just as his flag lieutenant knocked and entered. Sir, Mr. Roberts is coming aboard. Shall I send him in? Yes, wait a moment, Merriweather. The tall supercargo entered in his languid gait. Good afternoon, gentlemen. I understand you gave the governor twenty-four hours to think over our demands. The drawl was still negligent in tone, but the words were accusatory, and Drury stiffened as he met Robert's gaze. Yes, it is only common courtesy to permit the man to confer with his senate and advisers. After all, his career may hang on the decision he makes now. The expression on the supercargo's face hardened, and his eyes glittered a moment, but his tone was unchanged. The members of the select committee are somewhat disappointed at this delay. Merriweather sensed Drury's hackles rise, but the man retained his poise and bland expression as Roberts continued. Since it is a matter of serious inconvenience to our trade here, the India men have not yet begun to discharge cargo, and I shall not permit them to do so until the occupation is complete. Is this still part of your scheme to coerce the Viceroy? demanded Drury. Term it that if you will, replied Roberts lightly. I prefer to call it a mere quid pro quo. Now, sir, we shall acquiesce in this common courtesy, but with the clear understanding that there be no further delay. Drury turned a little red in the face, but clung to his composure. Do you have some motive for this extraordinary haste? None but the interests of king and company. The opium trade through Macau is no factor, then. It was Robert's turn to look startled. His hooded eyes opened wide for an instant, then narrowed to slits. I do not know what you were talking about. The laws of China and the ordinances of the company forbid such traffic. Quite. I have apparently well-founded reports that it flourishes both through Canton and Macau. Roberts looked down at his interlaced fingers. The subject is irrelevant at this time. Now, sir, under the orders for this operation, the company troops are under the sole command of the select committee. 
I serve notice upon you that after the expiration of your common courtesy, they shall move ashore. And if I refuse to provide the boats, I have enough lighters and hands at the Canton factories to accomplish the task. Drury sat back, only the flush in his cheeks betraying the fury that boiled in him. Very well, then. The blood will be on your heads. I shall keep my appointment with Senor de Lemos at noon tomorrow. I trust you will take no action pending the result of our conference. Merriweather was surprised at the capitulation. He had braced himself for the grinding head-on collision between the Royal Navy and the senior company official in China. Roberts rose, inclined his head, and departed. What an insufferable ass! exploded Drury after a moment. In my short tenure out here, I have already formed a most disagreeable opinion of the Honourable Company's senior officials. He looked at Merriweather and added hastily, It's mercantile officials, I mean, not the officers of its marine. He drummed his fingers on the desk a moment, then continued, I shall call upon the Governor precisely at noon tomorrow. Back in Comet, Merriweather tried to sort out the situation. He was inclined to agree with Dawson's assessment of the matter. An attack overland on Macau was unlikely. There were no convenient landing points south of the city. There was sufficient naval force present to make an amphibious frontal assault all but impossible. The time of the occupation appeared not to be critical. The nine hundred troops could be ferried ashore in a day. And yet the select committee insisted upon immediate occupation of the town without the consent of the governor or notice to the viceroy. He was convinced that the supercargoes had other motives, and Roberts's recent reaction to the suggestion corroborated the charge. The orders from the Governor-General, however, gave Drury small discretion. He was still turning the matters over in his mind when he joined McCrae in the cabin for dinner. "'Slow start,' commented the small Scots officer. "'I expected the troops to be assured by now.' No, Drury gave the governor twenty-four hours until noon tomorrow to consider the matter. And Roberts is a bit miffed. He gave a desultory account of the day's developments during the leisurely meal. Small doubt in my mind, Captain, said McCrae at the conclusion. I have small regret that I have not had the pleasure of their acquaintance. Drury and Merriweather accompanied by Lieutenant Colonel Patrick Kelly and Major Silas French, marched into the Governor's anteroom on the stroke of twelve. The secretary ushered them immediately into the chamber, where Senor de Lemos stood behind his desk, flanked by Father Rodriguez on his left, and a swarthy, sharp-faced European to his right. "'Good morning, gentlemen. May I present the Honourable Miguel de Sivera e Arriaga, Judge of the High Court of Macau?' The man inclined his head, as Drury and Merriweather bowed formally. He also holds the posts of customs master and public treasurer of the city. I have asked him to be present as my counsellor. Aside from the initial greeting, the statement was in Portuguese, translated simultaneously by the padre. Drury came immediately to the point. Have you reached a decision, Your Excellency? De Lemos's face clouded as the priest translated the question. He turned to whisper urgently in the ear of the judge, listened to a reply of several sentences, then spoke. I am compelled to await the advices from the Viceroy of Goa, which are expected momentarily. There was a knock on the door and the secretary entered. He spoke rapidly in Portuguese. Father Rodrigo gave an instantaneous translation. The president and second member demand entry to this valley. Merriweather saw the flush mount into Drury's face as he opened his mouth to utter a quick refusal, then paused a moment. So be it, he said finally in a tone of resignation. Let them come in. Roberts and Patty entered their eyes searching the faces of the assemblage. "'Gentlemen,' said Roberts, 
In a matter of such grave concern to the company trading to China, it behooves the select committee to be heard. His gaze passed Merriweather to fix on Drury. At what stage are your discussions, Admiral? The Governor has said he is compelled to await the advices of his Viceroy, and I am about to tell him the reply is unacceptable. Good. Then you will immediately proceed with the landings. Not so fast. There must first be assurances that the landing will not be resisted whether consent is given or not, and that the Viceroy of Canton has been informed. Robert stared insolently at the Admiral. The Governor and Judge sat expressionless across the desk, listening to the translation of the interchange. Just a moment, broke in Patty. Let me suggest a course of action which should satisfy all concerned. His urgent tone compelled attention. What I propose is this. Let the troops be landed under Portuguese colours. Drury's composure vanished. Your proposal, Mr. Patty, is so contemptible, so unworthy of an Englishman, to land British troops in the guise of Portuguese banditti, that I shall withdraw in stanter from so scandalous an act. It has the added advantage of not alarming the Chinese, so that it is not necessary to petition the Viceroy, continued Patty easily as though the outburst had not occurred. Never, said Drury. The judge whispered urgently in the governor's ear in a moment of silence. Merriweather felt that the stratagem proposed by Patty had merit. It accomplished the practical objective of occupying Macau, while being less likely to offend the territorial pride and sensibilities of China. Evidently the governor thought so too, though it appeared from his expression and whispered remonstrances that the judge was not in agreement. De Lemos spoke in measured tones as Father Rodrigo interpreted. Although I am without present authority to consent to any occupation of Macau, I will accept the reinforcement of my garrison, provided the troops land and remain under Portuguese colours. For a moment, Merriweather thought Drury might accept the compromise but he reckoned without the fierce pride the officer felt in the flag he flew in King George's navy. Never! I shall not permit Englishmen to be demeaned by any such charade. The Admiral was adamant in his position. And now, Your Excellency, shall we take up the specifics as to the landing? Telemos threw up his hands and sat back. Your combined force is so far superior to my land and naval establishment that I am compelled to yield. I call upon all you gentlemen to bear witness that I do so under duress. For a moment Merriweather thought the man would weep, but then he composed himself, assuming an expression of deep dejection. The details were soon settled. The landing to commence at daylight, all the forts to be occupied and commanded by the British, with the exception of La Monte Fort, the Commandant's headquarters. The Portuguese garrisons would evacuate their barracks and be quartered on the town, but would man the new batteries to be emplaced on the land approaches from China and commanding the beaches to the south and west. And now one more matter, said Drury. I shall keep my flag in Russell as commander of the expedition. Of course, once landed, I realize that the troops are at the disposition of the select committee, and I exercise no direct control of their activities. However, I designate Captain Percival Merriweather of the Honorable Company's Naval Service and the senior officer present in its military forces to be my deputy in Macau. Merriweather had no desire to exchange his relatively comfortable quarters in Comet for a grimy billet ashore with the inevitable turmoil and conflict to be expected when two disparate military forces, without a common language, met and mingled. He realised that Drury was still speaking. Do you have suitable quarters for the captain in East India House, Mr. Roberts? It was the supercargo's turn to sit up and compose his expression. Why, Roberts paused, glanced at Patty, who almost imperceptibly shook his head, and continued, No, sir, every room is taken. 
I thought three members of your committee are at Canton. I have no right to permit their quarters to be occupied in their absence. Merriweather guessed that the supercargoes desired no close scrutiny of their activities, and was glad for the curt refusal. Perhaps it would cause the Admiral to change his mind as to the assignment. But there came an intervention from an unexpected quarter. Sir, said the Governor through Father Rodrigo, there are guest accommodations at the Commandant's residence adjacent to La Monte Fort. I shall be happy to offer your deputy the use of them. Hell! After a stiff resistance, the Governor had not only capitulated, but was now collaborating with the British. Excellent. The Captain will have to maintain a close liaison with the Commandant during the landings, and this will offer a perfect solution. Drury looked around the gathering. And now we may adjourn. I trust that you will impress upon your troops that we come in peace and as allies. He rose, bowed to the governor, and marched out. I think it will be well for you to move ashore this afternoon, establish a residence, and become acquainted with the commandant. The troops will begin landing as soon as it is daylight, said Drury, as they approached East India House. Merriweather recognised the order, though it was couched in the terms almost of a request. He listened to a succession of admonitions, nodding his head at intervals, most of which were superfluous, and scanned the front of East India House as they passed, wondering if Tulsi Bai might be peering out at him from one of the curtained windows. He was glad he had brought the cavalry officer's brass-bound chests he had used last year along the Persian Road. On the off chance, he might have to camp on the beach at Russell Kaimar. They should suffice to carry his necessities for the sojourn ashore. Back aboard Comet, he set Sang to packing and alerted young Marlow to prepare for the mission. The welcome was polite enough, if not warm. The carriage with Merriweather and Marlow in the rear seat, Sang perched on the box beside the driver, was waved by the sentry box at the gate to a walled enclosure of well tended lawn, set on a terrace below and to one side of La Monte Fort. The Commandant's residence was substantial, with the guest cottage to one side, but connected with it by a covered path, which led through an octagonal summer house with pergolas supporting rose vines halfway between them. The Commandant, accompanied by Father Rodrigo, met them at the entrance, and the priest presented Merriweather to Colonel Jorge Alvarado. The Commandant was of middle height, sturdy, ruddy of complexion, prominent nose, brown eyes, and curly black hair beginning to go grey. He must be close to fifty, Merriweather decided, and his expression conveyed an impression of good will, coupled with the resolution required of a capable officer. These are your quarters, sir, continued the priest. The pantry is stocked with provisions, and there are facilities for your servant. Shall we inspect it now? Merriweather was agreeably surprised. He had brought a week's rations from the cabin stores, but here was a promise of fresh victuals. Certainly. The commandant led the way inside through a foyer into a large drawing-room, elaborately furnished with colourful Persian rugs on the floor. There was a formal dining-room, three sumptuous bedrooms, a well-equipped kitchen, and both serving and storage pantries. The legate of the Viceroy of Goa sojourns here when he makes his biennial inspection, explained Father Rodrigo. I think you will find your quarters entirely adequate. There is a cot for your servant, and a copper tub in which you may bathe in this room off the kitchen. It is magnificent, said Merriweather, almost overwhelmed. He had not occupied such luxurious quarters since those few weeks he had spent in Colonel Harding's mansion in Calcutta, just before the expedition to Persia. He decided that he should try to establish some basis of communication with Colonel Alvarado. I am most grateful, he told Father Rodrigo. Does the Commandant speak English? A little, 
but the governor has assigned me to accompany you tomorrow. I also speak Chinese. Tell him that I shall be at the landing when the troops arrive in the morning, and I shall expect him to be with me. We should be mounted with sufficient aids to carry our messages and prepared to deal with any eventuality. Merriweather had no concern for the Calcutta Sepoy Battalion. They were hereditary soldiers with a deep sense of pride in their profession of arms. But the companies from Madras might well be composed of the scum of Europe, as one anti-company member of Parliament had termed them. He must be prepared to contain any breach of the peace instantly in this potentially explosive situation. He says, certainly, reported the padre. The horses will be outside by dawn. Evidently, Alvarado had received explicit orders from the governor. On an impulse, Merriweather stepped forward, extending his hand. After a momentary hesitation, the colonel grasped it. We shall get on famously, Merriweather told him. We must rely implicitly each upon the other. There was no hesitation in the ascent, and Alvarado saluted him as he and Father Rodrigo departed. Well, said Merriweather, feeling himself at loose ends for the moment. Might as well have a drink before dinner. It may be a long time before we have the opportunity for another. Sang brought gin, and Marlowe contented himself with a glass of port. Do you ride? he inquired of the young officer. Oh, yes, sir, but I haven't been on a horse since England. You'll be sore enough then by night tomorrow, laughed Merriweather. And so shall I, since it has been almost a year for me, too. Sang soon announced dinner, and there was indeed fresh beef and vegetables. Tulsi Bai sat in the comfortable chamber on the second floor of Macau's East India House, the curtain a narrow space open. She had resumed her European mode of dress, not as comfortable but more becoming to her than a sari. She felt the anger that had possessed her a few moments before subside into the cold hatred she felt each time she thought of that scar-faced captain. The man had ridden by in the carriage with that pompous admiral on his way to see the governor, and she had instantly recognized him. Patty had not mentioned him by name, only that a company officer was assigned as an adviser to Admiral Drury. It was an astounding coincidence. The very man who had frustrated her schemes for Malha last summer appearing here in Macau. She would keep out of sight and it might yet be possible to repay with interest the injury he had done her. Dispassionately she began to assess her present situation. In the beginning she had been of the opinion that René had overacted in dispatching her so great a distance to escape Holkar's revenge, but now she realized he had had additional motives. The message entrusted to her as she took ship at Goa was addressed to Miguel de Silveira, but upon her arrival she discovered that he held the office of judge of the High Court of Macau, was second in power only to the governor, and that he was the silent partner in her brother's opium cartel. She was prepared to distrust the man, but once he had read the dispatch he welcomed her into his home where his wife made her comfortable. Madame Bai tinkled the silver bell on the tabaret beside her, and the half-caste Indonesian maid came in. A glass of burgundy, please. She sipped the wine with pleasure, keeping a vigil through the curtain. It had been an hour since she had seen Merriweather pass on his way to the governor's mansion, and she already knew from Patty that he and Roberts intended to intrude upon the Admiral's audience. Patty had been an unexpected bonus, and the thought of the man filled her with an unaccustomed warmth. The judge had managed to throw her in his way, but Tulsi had then contrived the liaison with her own wits and artifices, and her mission for de Silvera did not interfere with her enjoyment of the interlude with a young man of fiery temperament 
after her years of sojourning with stale men past their prime. She thought of the woman from whom she had taken Patty, beautiful and spirited enough, but stupid and impulsive to the point of recklessness. Confronted with a rival, Creosa had simply flown into a tantrum and flung herself out of Patty's quarters. In the same situation, Tulsi would have maintained an icy calm and dared the man to remove her bodily, confident that he would not risk a public scandal even in the relaxed morality out here. The maid looked in, then came over to refill the glass. She was a pretty little thing and reasonably biddable. Your man! You said he was a gunner in the garrison, said Madame by in Portuguese. She had seen him meet the girl several times, and admired his dark good looks and graceful carriage. Will he be in danger if the British occupy the town? I do not know. The maid shrugged and looked away. He tells me nothing about his duties. Tulsi considered the possibility of using the man in some move against Merriweather only briefly. There was no need for haste in her designs for revenge. Once the town was in British hands with the control in Roberts and Patty, there would doubtless be other opportunities. She would bide her time, carry out her mission of keeping the judge fully informed of the select committee's strategies. It was only a few minutes more before Madame Bai saw the carriage coming back towards the landing. Admiral Drury wore his usual expression of composed dignity. She could not read the outcome of the audience in his face, but he was apparently laying out instructions to Merriweather, who was nodding at intervals. No matter. She would learn the result of the conference soon enough when Patty came in for his siesta. She moved to the dressing table to freshen herself with scent in anticipation of his arrival. Here in southern China, though almost precisely on the Tropic of Cancer, there was a distinct chill in the pre-dawn air at the end of September. Meriwether could hear Sang moving about in the kitchen, and there were footsteps and an occasional thump from the room occupied by Marlowe. Shivering, he shaved and washed himself, then worked his legs into the narrow riding breeches and the thigh-high boots he had worn to Persia last year. From the waist down, he had become a cavalryman. But the addition of his uniform jacket and cocked hat created a curious hybrid appearance, and he laughed at the effect when he looked in the mirror. The pistols were already in saddle holsters with a leather box of paper cartridges and a brass flask of priming powder to serve them. He hesitated a moment over the sword, then belted it on. It would be an encumbrance, but often the sight of a naked blade proved more intimidating at close quarters than a firearm. Sang placed a tray on the chest, and he ate his breakfast standing at the window, seeing the faint glow of dawn expand to the east. In the grey light of early morning, all his weakness, imperfections and failings came crystal clear. By noon he knew they would be glossed over, excused, forgotten, but at this hour they gave him concern. He harboured no particular foreboding of the day just now breaking, though it well might be one fraught with danger as two disparate military forces without a common language met and mingled. It would require only one hothead to loose off a shot, a miscalculation of temper, an insult, or nothing at all to precipitate a pitched battle between the Allies in spite of anything Drury, the Governor, the Commandant, or Merriweather himself might do. He felt the nagging doubt in the back of his mind that he might panic again, as he had done at Aden, but resolutely put the matter out of his mind. He tried to think of Caroline and their son back at Calcutta. The child must be nearly four months now, beginning to assume the shape in which he would grow. He intended to give the boy every advantage that he had been denied, and yet the life of man was a chancy thing, 
There was no guarantee that a gentle upbringing and classical education would assure success. It was light outside. He heard the clump of hooves on the turf before he saw the party approaching. Colonel Alvarado was accompanied by Father Rodrigo, a saturnine cavalry captain wearing the aiguillettes of an aide-de-camp, and two young officers of about the age of Marlow, booted and spurred, sitting their mounts in easy confidence. A groom brought up the rear leading two saddle chargers. Meriwether approached his horse with some trepidation. In spite of the long ride across Persia, he was never entirely comfortable when mounted. He measured the length of the stirrups against his arm and shortened them one notch. The horses appeared fit. There were no fresh scars on their flanks, and he swung into the saddle and settled himself before slapping the reins against the neck to follow Alvarado. It would be all right, he decided. His body had not forgotten the hard lessons of the Persian road. At the landing, half a dozen sullen officers clustered about a pot that gave off the aroma of coffee. They snapped to attention and saluted as Alvarado rode up, looking with open animosity at the two naval officers on horseback. Far out in Macau roads, the launches and cutters from all ships present were lying off the transports, and even as he looked, Meriwether saw three pull toward shore. At almost the same moment, he saw Admiral Drury's barge leave the side of Russell. With its superior speed, it was at the landing before the laden boats were halfway in. Evidently, the Admiral could not yet disassociate himself from the venture. There was the rattle of iron tyres on stone, and a carriage rolled up with Roberts and Patty peering out of the windows. All the elements of an explosion were converging on this spot, Merriweather thought sourly, dismounting and handing his reins to Marlow. Drury greeted Merriweather, the Commandant, then Roberts and Patty formally, returned the salutes from the Portuguese officers, and drew Merriweather to one side. I could not abide remaining in Russell while this landing is going forward, he confided sotto voce. I shall not interfere, but if trouble arises, it may not be amiss to have an officer of rank and experience at hand to intervene. I shall remain at this point, and would appreciate reports as to progress at least hourly. It was only a few minutes before the first launch began to discharge its troops. Colonel Kelly and Major French were the first to step ashore, followed by Fuglemen who trotted to take position as guides and rally their men into formation. It was an orderly operation. Evidently the company commanders had explicit instructions, and as each unit filled its ranks it marched off with a Portuguese officer to guide it to the appointed billet. By mid-afternoon, the garrisons of the three designated forts had been relieved by company troops without incident. Merriweather sighed in relief as he watched the last contingent of Portuguese troops march out of the small southern fort, and a company of Calcutta sepoys mount the guard. He and Colonel Alvarado had observed each such exchange of duty, then sent Marlow galloping off to report success to the Admiral. Now, in the heat of the afternoon, he was beginning to feel sore and galled. He looked forward to a gin and lemon, and possible immersion in the copper tub to soothe his pain. The Commandant made a statement to Father Rodrigo. Sir, said the Padre, Colonel Alvarado says the occupation is now complete, but the artillery is coming ashore and he wishes to visit the sites of the batteries his men are to man. Very well. Now express my profound gratitude for his splendid cooperation and the exemplary behaviour of his command. Drury had remained all day in a small building near the landing to receive reports as to progress of the occupation. It had been a day of alarums and excursions every rumour unfounded, but each a cause for concern at the moment. 
The operation had gone smooth as silk, not even a bloody nose to mar the affair. For Merriweather, it was a time to make his own final report and beg to be excused. Merriweather rode back to the landing at a leisurely pace to find Drury outside the building with his flag lieutenant. The barge was alongside the landing stage, bow and stern hooks holding on, hands ready at the oars. Ah, Merriweather, the occupation is complete, I gather. I was about to take boat to Russell, but delayed in the hope you would report. Yes, sir. The forts are in our hands without incident. Colonel Elvarado is seeing to the emplacement of the batteries, and I believe our mission is now complete. Quite. And my congratulations to you on a well-managed affair. Little enough he had had to do with it, Merriweather thought, but he appreciated the sentiment. He had opened his mouth to request relief from duty when Marlow appeared on the Praia Grande and approached them at a dead run. What now? The boy reined his horse back on its haunches. Sir, there's about to be a fight. Where? demanded Drury. Speak up, young man. At Lamonte Fort, sir. Lamonte Fort? But we agreed the Portuguese would keep possession of it. Yes, sir, but Mr. Roberts is there with his soldiers demanding that they surrender it too, and the Portuguese have wheeled out a cannon to block the gate. Good Lord, exploded Drury. Go and see what is going on, Merriweather, and I'll follow as soon as I can get my carriage back. It had been too good to be true. Merriweather swung his sore, sweaty body back into the saddle. And young man, ride and see if you can find the commandant. The canter was an easy enough gait that the horse could just hold up the switchback road that led up the hill to La Monte Fort. As he came to the flat crest, Merriweather could see two companies of European troops deployed a hundred feet from the main gate of the fort, standing easy. There was a little knot of men gathered midway between the troops and the open gates, most of them in Portuguese uniforms. As he pulled up beside them, he recognized Roberts, Major French, and Mr. Wickham, the consul, in a heated discussion with the Portuguese officers. Roberts only threw an annoyed glance over his shoulder as Merriweather dismounted from his lathered horse and continued his remarks. Sure enough, there was a field gun, a nine-pounder of current design and placed in the gateway with a limber to which four mules were harnessed standing in the background. The heads and shoulders of musketeers were visible in the embrasures at the top of the wall. The field gun crew appeared to have become frozen in motion. A man on either side of the muzzle, one holding a powder cartridge, another a charge of canister, while the third balanced a rammer in his hands. All were looking over their shoulders at the parley, but it was obvious that the gun could be loaded and fired in seconds. Here now, Mr. Roberts, what's this all about? Roberts whirled about. There was no trace of languor in him now. I thank you to keep your nose out of this merry weather. He turned back to the group. Tell them I do not care what agreement the governor and admiral made. They cannot bind me, and I control the troops. Wickham spoke rapidly to the Portuguese officers, listened to a lengthy and vehement reply, accompanied by vigorous gestures from a powerfully muscled captain, then turned back to Roberts. He says he commands the fort, his orders are to hold it, and he will not evacuate except upon the express command of the governor in person. It was still hot in the late afternoon this last week in September in Macau. Robert's normally pale face was flushed and gleaming with sweat. For a moment he appeared to be on the verge of losing control of himself, wearing an expression of pure fury quite at variance with his usual impassive calm. Merriweather stood indecisively a few feet aside, trying to formulate some course of action which would avert the explosion. He had no authority over the supracargoes, and for that matter, neither did Lord Minto except through the roundabout expedient of representations of the Court of Directors. And he wished Drury, Alvarado, or the Governor would gallop up to intervene. 
he became conscious that Roberts was speaking again in a high but controlled tone. Tell that Dago I give him five minutes by my watch. He pulled a gold watch up by the fob and looked at it. To remove that gun and swing the gates wide for my force to march in. He paused, then continued in a milder tone, and one hour for his garrison to march out. Wickham turned and spoke again. The reaction of the sturdy captain was instantaneous. He turned and bellowed an order towards the fort. The gun crew resumed its drill as though the interruption had never occurred. Merriweather looked about for possible cover. There was none short of the slope below this flat hilltop on which the fort stood. He looked back at the field gun, able to follow the yelped commands of the gunner even though in Portuguese. Charge, peace! The cartridge went into the muzzle with a wad behind it, and the rammer man drove it home with three solid thumps. The canister followed. The two loaders turned to stand facing him on either side of the barrel, hands clamped over their ears while the rammer man skipped nimbly to one side. Prime! The gunner drove his vent prick through the touch hole to pierce the cartridge, then inserted a priming quill of powder. Merriweather stood bemused. It was incredible that the relentless supracargo and the obdurate captain should have permitted matters to progress to this point. Of course, the Portuguese party was still in the line of fire, but the captain had effectively caught the hand of Roberts, and there was now the very real danger of a misunderstood command, or even an innocent gesture to bring the glowing slow match in the jaws of the linstock held by the assistant gunner down into the priming powder. Take aim! The gunner straddled the trail and sighted down the barrel, gesturing with his gloved left hand to his crew to shift the trail an infinitesimal amount to the left, while with his right hand he adjusted the elevation screw to lower the muzzle. All Merriweather could see now was the round black hole gaping at him. It required but the one final command, fire. He became conscious that the captain was speaking in a loud, harsh tone, emphasizing his points with his fist driven into the palm of his hand. He says, reported Wickham, that he will give you just five minutes to withdraw your troops before he orders the gun to commence firing. The captain had pulled out his own watch and now held it in his hand, aping Roberts, eyes glittering in defiance. The supercargo's own eyes blazed for a moment as he held his ground. Without artillery, it was obvious to Merriweather that the company infantry could not hope to stand against even the one field gun, backed as it was by muskets fired from the shelter of the parapet. He decided to make one more try at an intervention. Gentlemen, all heads turned towards him. Messengers are summoning the governor and commandant. Admiral Drury is on his way here. Can you not wait these few minutes to resolve this matter? I'll not withdraw my forces, said Roberts in a hard tone. If this Dago fires, I'll see him court-martialed and shot. The captain strode off towards the gate, followed by his officers. He says reported Wickham. His time limit stands. This was ridiculous. Two headstrong men willing to spill blood over a matter that could be resolved by higher authority within minutes. And if there was bloodshed here, violence would inevitably erupt throughout the city, with the distinct probability that the Viceroy of Canton would feel compelled to intervene to protect the sovereignty of China with his Eighty war junks. The company's trade here would be ended, the incident could well alienate Portugal, and England needed every friend it had in these perilous times to stand against Bonaparte. Roberts remained staring after the Portuguese officers a moment, then walked rapidly back towards his troops, followed by his officers and Wickham, leaving Merriweather standing holding his horse's reins. It was time to get out of the line of fire. Merriweather turned to remount his horse. Why he took the action, Merriweather was never able to explain even to himself. 
Possibly it was the sense of guilt that yet was an indelible stain on his soul, an unbidden effort to make amends for that unreasoning panic that had possessed him in Aden. He found himself quick-stepping across the turf in the wakes of the Portuguese contingent, his sword left hanging by its belt over the pommel. He was less than a half-dozen steps behind them when they reached the gun. Merriweather came to a halt to bear three yards distant from the muzzle of the gun, and held up both hands, palm out. It was one thing he thought fuzzily to fire a gun at anonymous ranks of soldiers at a distance, and quite another to shoot an unarmed man standing in the attitude of one who comes in peace at point-blank range. And then he saw the gunner, mustachioed, handsome, lithe and agile, yellow eyes burning in his head, and was suddenly certain that this man was no look-alike. Osborne, as the full realisation of the gunner's identity sunk in, Merriweather was pleased to note that he felt no panic. It was as though he stood detached to one side, observing the officer in the curious hybrid garb of navy and cavalry, who stood empty hands up in the age-old gesture of peace. If the fate he had escaped by a hair's breadth at Aden had overtaken him here at Macau, so be it. In his own mind, he had lived on borrowed time since that day. He examined Osborne dispassionately at this close range, seeing the sweat rag bound about his head, the smudged, soggy shirt and trousers tucked into short boots, the stubby artilleryman's sword in its leather sheath belted on. The man's feral gaze never left his face as he stood just clear of the recoil beside the right wheel of the piece, his left hand encased in its heavy leather glove, poised to stop the vent after the gun fired. He was only peripherally conscious of the assistant gunner holding the linstock with its glowing coal of fire burning in the slow match in its jaws, or the two loaders on either side of the barrel, hands over their ears in anticipation of the discharge. The captain reached the rear of the gun and about faced, looking right past Merriweather towards the company ranks and down at his watch. He raised his hand, still peering at the dial, looked up and brought his hand down smartly. Descarga! Discipline in the Portuguese force was excellent. The assistant gunner instantly brought the linstock down towards the touch hole in the smooth arc. Merriweather's heart leapt into his throat. He did not have time even to fall away from the muzzle, so unexpected was the command. The officer had looked right past him twice, never seeing him until after he had given the command to fire. His face was now contorted, mouth opening in consternation, but it was too late to countermand the order. Osborne's movement was deceptively deliberate. The gloved hand reached out to cover the touch hole at the last possible instant and the glowing coal on the slow match broke and scattered in sparks as it met the heavy leather. The captain recovered his composure enough to shout another command just as the beat of hooves echoed across the field. Marlow and Colonel Alvarado reined their sweating horses back on their haunches and leaped to the turf. Merriweather was completely spent, but he forced himself to move deliberately from in front of the gun. Osborne was staring at him with a crooked grin on his face. "'We can call it quits now, Captain,' he said in a conversational tone. "'Tip for tat, you saved my life and me yours.' Even in the throes of reaction to his escape from sudden death, the comment startled Merriweather. "'I saved yours.' What was the man talking about? He had done his honest best before the court of inquiry at Bombay to convict Osborne and then in pit to hang him. By rigging that lash up over the side in pit. You didn't exactly plan it to come out that way, but I'm still beholden to you for the favour. The hand in the leather glove remained clamped over the touch hole, though the slow match in the linstock was now extinguished. Osborne lifted his hand looked casually at the scorched spot on the glove, 
then up again at Merriweather, executed an elaborate salute and stepped back to stand at ease, staring out at the new parley commencing in the centre of the field. It was only a moment later that Drury's coach came up at a gallop to disgorge the Admiral, the Governor, and Father Rodrigo. It's not that important, Roberts finally conceded after a quarter of an hour of strenuous discussion heavily laced with references to British honour between the Governor Drury, Colonel Alvarado, and the supercargo. La Monte Fort would remain in Portuguese hands. Roberts was looking shaken for once, no longer angry and arrogant. The confrontation had come within a hair of spilling gallons of blood, not to mention the death of a senior company naval officer. Though I reserve the right to renew my demands to occupy the fort, if the situation appears to justify it, Roberts tossed over his shoulder as the meeting adjourned. Colonel Elvarado spoke up. I would be honoured if you gentlemen will join me for some refreshments, translated the padre. It has been a long and exhausting day, and my quarters are convenient. They were less than two hundred yards away on the bench below the fort to landward, and the invitation was attractive. The governor made a reply. I must regret, Colonel... I have issued a call for my Senate to convene within the hour to receive a report of the day's events. I also must regret, said Drury formally. Hell, there was no reason for him to hang back, Merriweather decided. The prospect of drink and provender after such a day was irresistible. I accept with much pleasure, he told the Commandant. That is unless you have other duties for me, sir, he said to Drury a little anxiously. He could already taste the gin and lemon. The occupation was complete, Roberts was marching his force down the switchback road in retreat, and the triumphant Portuguese captain had strutted back to the fort. Quite all right, Merriweather. I am current with the situation. Report to me in Russell by ten anti-meridian tomorrow as to any developments overnight. Merriweather saw the governor and Drury to their coach and remounted his horse to ride with Alvarado and Marlow the short distance around the slope of the hill to the house. If you don't mind, I shall freshen up and get out of these boots. Sang served as bootjack for him. By the time he went through the covered walkway with Marlow to be admitted by the Commandant's orderly, he had consumed three tots of gin and was beginning to feel human again. The only boat at the landing was a launch from one of the transports which had just discharged round shot for the field guns. The coxswain was surly and reluctant, and the ache behind his eyes did not improve Merriweather's patience. He bullied the man into going a mile out of his way to take him to Russell. Drury was in conference, and it was nearly an hour of stumping about the deck seeing how the Royal Navy did things in the seventy-four gun ship of the line before the flag lieutenant sought him out. He thus had full opportunity while he waited to meditate on his recent conduct. The events of the early evening as Colonel Alvarado's guest were a bit hazy. Merriweather certainly had drunk too much in reaction to the horrendous confrontation of the late afternoon. Senora Alvarado, assisted by a little daughter about the age of Marlowe, and Creusa Hale was a gracious hostess. Chinese servants glided in and out to serve the dinner with no interruption of the conversation. The commandant, with his limited English, had little to say, but the two women sparkled, and Merriweather had soon found himself at ease. He took only two more glasses before the repast, but bumpers of heady wine accompanied each course and he concluded again that he had little tolerance for the produce of the grape. I thought I should die when I saw you walk up to the muzzle of that gun, said Creuser in a break in the chit-chat. I almost did. Merriweather tried to keep his tone light, but the episode still sent chills up his spine. It was difficult now to justify the motives that had appeared logical at the time. That captain just never saw me until he gave order to fire. 
They tell me the gunner saved you by clapping his hand over the touch hole. He did. Ordinarily, Merriweather would not have elaborated, but the wine had loosened his tongue. And I have no real explanation for his action. You know, he was condemned to hang at Bombay last winter for mutiny in my ship. Creusa cried out for attention, then translated the account of the inexplicable escape from the scaffold almost simultaneously, for the benefit of the commandant, and then he said it was tip for tat, and that he was beholden to me for rigging the gallows out over the side. I heard that he had been an acrobat with the fairs in England before he went to sea, he said in conclusion. Alvarado looked at him and spoke briefly. Do you want him back to carry out the sentence? translated Creusa. Merriweather hesitated a moment. The man had made a fool of him, had created a legend that would live in marine forecastles for generations as the man who cheated the hangman. He had no possible doubt of his guilt as the leader of the mutiny. But there was rough justice in what Osborne had said to him. Tit for tat. Quits now. The marine accounted him dead, and how he had survived was still beyond comprehension. He reached a decision. Taking him back to Bombay to be hanged by the neck until he was dead, 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 in the language of the President of the Court of Inquiry, would serve little purpose now. It would never destroy the legend of his escape, and was no more than blooded revenge. Besides, Merriweather was beholden himself. No, he said, conscious that he might well be accounted guilty of compounding a felony by thus obstructing justice. Live and let live. The dinner had spun out in leisurely colonial fashion over several hours. Merriweather and Creusa are on one side, Marlow and the daughter across, and Colonel and Senora Alvarado at either end of the table. At this close range he found himself covertly observing the woman in detail, conscious of the scent she wore, the smooth skin of face and shoulders, the off-hand display of cleavage and the dark beauty of eyes and hair in the candlelight. Her mood was entirely different from the other two occasions, not sulky, demanding or reckless as she had been at Bombay, nor despondent and self-pitying as she had been the other night. The conversation was inconsequential, undemanding. A nod of assent, a chuckle of appreciation sufficed to keep up his end as she leaned towards him to underline the point of her vignette, eyes sparkling up into his. She drank the wine with each course but sparingly, and it seemed only to increase her wit. Merriweather found himself falling under the spell of this charmer as the wine added to the gin dissolved his inhibitions. He wondered that he had failed to discern Creusa's quality on two previous occasions. After dinner, the commandant invited Marlow and Merriweather to join him in his study, offered them long black cigars, and then lighted one for himself. Merriweather only pretended to smoke. He had no taste for tobacco. And then they rejoined the ladies. Marlowe's eyes had grown heavy in spite of the proximity of an English-speaking girl his own age, and when her mother signalled it was time she retired, Merriweather seized the opportunity to call the evening quits as well. "'I'm really most obliged,' he told the Colonel and Signora Alvarado. "'It has been a delightful interlude, and very welcome to two officers after a hard day in the field.' They were ready enough to end the evening, and after only the politest of protestations, Merriweather and Marlow had bowed themselves out. The orderly was in the hallway, holding the door opening on the walkway for them with a lamp to light their steps. He was halfway across to the cottage, just passing the vine-covered summer-house, when he heard the call, "'Oh, Captain!' "'Go ahead, Marlow,' he said brusquely. "'I'll see what she wants.' but his heart began to thump as he turned back towards Creusa. He could only conclude in the sober light of day that he had been entirely mad. 
the wine coursing in his veins, nine months of abstinence overwhelming his scruples with never a thought of Caroline. Creusa guided him into the darkness of the summer-house, and was in his arms the next instant, but broke off the kiss after a moment, and leaned back to look at him in the faint moonlight that penetrated the pergola. It was fated, Captain, from the first night we met. He did not dispute her and pressed on, rough and precipitate, but there was no complaint. The fires were only momentarily quenched, and he soon sought her out again. She had matched his ardour, until they crept apart as the eastern sky was beginning to grow light enough to reveal the vaulted roof above them. Now the matter was on his conscience, but it did not weigh nearly so heavily as he had feared it would. The vision of Caroline had grown faint and distant, as though she was someone in a former life whom he had once cherished but had little cause to remember now. Merriweather already anticipated the assignation Creusa had promised for this night, in a real bed instead of uncomfortably dishevelled on cushions spread in a summer-house, though he had little minded at the time. Even now, he felt a reckless disregard of consequences to career and marriage, and a lunatic infatuation with the beauty combined with passion consummate the woman possessed. What had happened to the sturdy conscience that had troubled him last year on Mauritius in his dalliance with Eleonora, even before he was wed? He made an effort to rationalise his conduct, but could not keep his thoughts on the matter as they veered unbidden to Creusa. The woman had cast a spell on him, made him mad, entirely aflame with lust, impatient now of the tedious hours that must crawl by before his rendezvous. The flag lieutenant snatched him out of his reverie. Captain Merriweather, the Admiral will see you now. He met Roberts and Patty coming out of the flag cabin and bowed formally as they passed. Tulsi Bai sat in her chair by the window watching the shadows of the trees shorten as the sun approached Meridian. She was impatient for the return of Patty. He had gone with Roberts almost four hours ago to call on Admiral Drury again with their newest scheme to consolidate control of Macau and suppress the illicit trade in opium that had developed here this past year. The judge already knew of the proposal. Her note had been delivered by the time the supercargoes took boat for Russell. She thought for a moment of Patty, a magnificent bedmate, but a man of impulse often erratic and illogical in his conclusions, if obstinate in pursuing a course once determined. Somehow he and Roberts had received intelligence last night of the expected arrival of another shipment of northern opium, and after several discussions had settled on their scheme to demand that Drury dispatch that company cruiser up there to intercept the ship. As an afterthought, they had concluded that Merriweather should be ordered in command of the expedition, thus ridding themselves of the Governor-General's observer ashore for this critical period. Madame Bai entirely disapproved of the move, but tried to head it off. But the judge had anticipated the idea. The opium would be trans-shipped to a small junk in a lonely anchorage off the Ladrone Islands in the mouth of the Canton River, before the marine cruiser could get to sea, provided Drury favoured the proposition. She saw the carriage approaching. No, said Patty in a downcast tone. That pompous popinjay says he exercises only military command in his squadron over that company cruiser, and has no power to order it to other duty. He did say he would submit the matter to Merriweather. He threw up his hands in resignation, dark eyes flashing. Except for his orders from the Governor-General, I'd send the insolent bastard out or see him broken cashiered. It was good news to Tulsi, but she dissembled and moved to embrace Patty with ardour. Not fatal, she said lightly. And now, siesta. Drury was behind his desk wearing a somewhat bemused expression. 
He waved Merriweather to a chair, then sat silent a moment, staring past him at the door, before he spoke in a tone of resignation. I am a patient man, but in the thirty-odd years that I have served His Majesty, I do not recall encountering two more exasperating men. He looked back at Merriweather, rolled his eyes to the overhead, then back down to his desk. Oh, here is a communication for you. Came over from Comet just an hour ago. It was a slender oilskin-wrapped packet superscribed to Captain Percival Merriweather, Honourable Companies Marine, Private and Confidential. Merriweather took it gingerly, reluctant to slit the wrapper, fearful that its contents might somehow endanger the rendezvous Creusa had promised for this evening. Go on, open it while I order in some coffee. The message was terse in the fine handwriting of Dawson. Imperative you join me in Canton. The bearer of this note will bring you back. S. Dawson. God damn, his worst fears realized. The dalliance with Creus had gone glimmering. His expression must have betrayed his emotions. Bad news? Drury was looking at him with concern. Merriweather tried to analyze his emotions then felt a sudden cross-grained sense of relief flood through him. Fate in the guise of Dawson had intervened to rescue him from his folly and further callous betrayal of Caroline. A moment more and he was by no means certain that he welcomed the intrusion in his affairs with the memory of Creusa so fresh and vivid. Oh well, no help for it. I have no intimation of his motive, he said, handing the note over to Drury. "'Nor do I,' said Drury, after a swift perusal. "'And now, back to the reason I requested your presence this morning. "'Are there any problems with the occupation?' "'No, sir. "'I called around this morning at each garrison and found all quiet. "'Oh, there'd been a fist-fight or so and bloody noses, but quickly broken up. "'The Portuguese seem to have accepted the situation with good grace.' Merriweather wondered what Roberts and Patty had demanded of the Admiral, but surmised he would learn soon enough. Very good. Now, I conceive that under our respective orders I exercise military command over your cruiser as a part of my squadron in any action with the enemy. But I doubt my authority over you or Comet in company affairs. What the hell? Drury continued in his unhurried didactic periods. I therefore inform those two precious gentlemen that I should submit their demands to you for decision. This was a twist that should give the supercargo's pause, Merriweather thought maliciously, since Drury had given them nearly everything they desired thus far, already savouring the curt denial. In a nutshell... They desire to dispatch you and your ship to intercept an expected cargo of opium in... I am not familiar with the term a country ship called the Ganges Pilot. Comprehension flooded into Merriweather's head. Even in the undisputed command of Macau, Roberts and Patty possess no control of the sea. Unless intercepted before it could be transshipped, the contraband would simply disappear up one of the creeks to reappear in competition with the product being imported by Bering and Company. He had the imperative summons from Dawson to Canton. Undoubtedly some development in his primary mission out here, but it was also the mission of the Marine to serve the Company and Comet was for the time idle. It galled him to exceed the arrogant demand of the supercargoes with their motive, but the laws both of China and the company prescribed the importation of the drug. He made a reluctant decision. I cannot go myself, but if you can spare her, I'll send McRae in Comet to cruise off the Ladrones. I must respond to this summons to Canton. You'll violate the laws of China again? demanded Drury in amazement. After you were court-martialed for the same offence? I must trust Dawson. He would not call for me unless the matter is of importance to the company or crown. Very well. 
for what of my liaison ashore? Mr. Marlow can observe and report activities as well as I. Good Lord, a stripling assuming the duties of a captain. I never heard the like. But it is your funeral, Drury added, and you may be excused to make your arrangements. Merriweather was on deck before the image of Creusa appeared in his mind, already a bit less vivid than it had been an hour ago. Was he beginning to exorcise the infatuation that had possessed him? There was time enough for contemplation during the long night watches as the boat worked its way towards Canton, now sliding through tortuous channels, then again traversing open water, skirting whole cities of boat-dwellers where the babel of voices and flicker of lights revealed the life that continued on the river at any hour. Merriweather tried to make himself comfortable in the matting shelter that protected him from the dew now glistening on the gunwales in the moonlight. It had been a hectic afternoon of preparation. Orders to write for Macrae, his travelling kit to be retrieved from the guesthouse ashore. Marlow instructed in his new responsibilities, and then half an hour as a Chinese servant stained his hands and face, set a black wig on his head, and then drew the semblance of a Mongol fold on his eyelids. Not necessary to be perfect, said the laconic Fong, only enough to pass. He had found Wong's cousin lounging on the quarter-deck of Comet as he came back aboard with his kit, but he hastened to greet the young man he had brought back to Canton as a hostage two years ago. I know nothing, sir. My cousin Wong only sent me to fetch you. His English was better. Probably Dawson had continued his instruction. The journey ashore had inspired palpitations. He was under the necessity of regretting Creuse's invitation for the evening. Dare he risk an hour or so now in her embrace? He dreaded the encounter, but it did not materialise. The Commandant's orderly had indicated in sign language amplified by voluble gibberish that she was absent. And Merriweather was reduced to leaving a note commencing, My love. Now, as the hands poled this little craft through the shallows, his thoughts were not of the unknown crisis that compelled his presence in Canton, but of that ardent nymph he had bedded last night. Even now he trembled with frustration and cursed the circumstance that denied him her charms. Except for this explicit summons to duty, he should be in the very lists of love ready for the hot encounter. He moved uncomfortably to ease the pressure, and tried to divert his thoughts from this madness, falling into an uneasy series of dozes that lasted until daylight. It was mid-morning when the boat finally came to the same landing where he had disembarked Gunny and his marines two years ago to serve as the honour guard in the triumphant return of Wong and Fong to the home of their ancestors. He climbed out stiffly, face averted, self-conscious in the blue Chinese garments, and at Fong's invitation entered the sedan chair that awaited them. There were no fanfares of bugles or ruffles of drums this time, and they passed without remark through the narrow street to the gates of the House of the Mandarin. Wong and Dawson were in the big room where Merriweather had once made his request to the old Mandarin to intervene with the hoppo and gain grand chop. The elaborate lacquered desk of the scholar still stood in the corner as he remembered it, but Wong sat in the place of his grandfather. Dawson greeted him cordially, and Wong stood to incline his head with a little smile in response to Merriweather's bow. I am sorry, Mr. Wong, to hear of the death of your grandfather. He was a scholar of great distinction, who did me a most important service. This was wasting time, but he felt compelled to honour the amenities. And my congratulations on your elevation in rank. His regret was genuine, as was his pleasure in the fact that Wong was now the Mandarin of Canton, though of the old Chinese dynasty with little real power under the Manchus. He was conscious of the fact that Fong had slipped out, leaving him alone with Dawson and Wong. 
he took the opportunity to examine the young man. Always assured, Wong had matured into a man of authoritarian aspect. The face was composed in harder lines than Merriweather remembered, and he carried himself in an attitude of aloof dignity at variance with his manner of two years before. But the mantle of authority assuredly became him. Dawson cleared his throat. Captain, since last I saw you those few days ago, the situation has altered drastically. Yes, Robertson Patty hold Macau. All to the good, I think, now, as Wong will shortly explain to you. The little schoolmaster turned his nearsighted gaze to the Mandarin. Captain, you may have small interest in the politics of China, but I find in this situation an opportunity sent by heaven to further my own humble affairs. The man's English was much more precise, the vocabulary greater, evidence of practice and study. I covered the post of Viceroy of Canton, now held by the corrupt Manchu, the Mandarin of Wu. He paused self-consciously. Since last I saw you, I have taken a bride. Why, congratulations, and so have I. Wong bobbed his head with a brief smile. She is a niece of the Emperor. My grandfather was a Mandarin of the old order of China, conquered more than a hundred and sixty years ago by the barbarians out of the West. But he was very wise. If you cannot master the upstarts, he told me, then mate with them. Their women are comely enough. I followed his advice and have no complaints. This was an interesting commentary. Wong now possessed ties of kinship by marriage with the Emperor, as did the Viceroy and Hoppo, presumably by blood, however distantly removed. Last spring, the Viceroy's Admiral met the flotilla of Madame Ching, and was most ignominiously defeated. In his shame, he died by his own hand. Who is Madame Ching? Merriweather demanded. The widow of the pirate Ching, the most bloodthirsty as well as able commander those rogues have ever had. He was killed two years ago, and she assumed command. She is as brave, ruthless, and able as he, and has raided dozens of villages and taken scores of ships since his death. When she defeated the Viceroy's fleet, there was a dead calm, and she sent her men over the side to swim and board our ships. Wong shook his head in recollection of the disgrace to the navy of Imperial China, then looked directly into Merriweather's eyes. Two days ago, I received the news I had expected. The Emperor, in his wisdom and in recognition of our new kinship, has commissioned me Admiral of the Canton Fleet. Well, congratulations again. Wong appeared not to have heard the compliment, now looking down at the surface of the desk. The Viceroy was furious. The appointment in years past has been his. He already seeks to undermine me with my subordinates and yesterday summoned me into his presence. He seeks to destroy me by ordering an impossible mission. How? demanded Merriweather, already divining the answer. Why, to destroy Madame Ching, of course. He directed me to set sail at dawn tomorrow, and not to return until I had done so. That is why I ask you to come to Canton. I request that you become my captain of the fleet during this operation. Merriweather sat silent looking at his fingernails while he digested the ramifications of this remarkable proposal. In the past nineteen years, as man and boy in the service of the company and its marine, he had experienced many difficulties and some perilous assignments. 
but never had he dreamed that he would be requested to take command of a squadron in the Imperial Navy of China. The Royal Navy and Marine officers entertained nothing but contempt for the Chinese Navy. China was not a seafaring nation, and its war junks were clumsy, unhandy craft. Still, the pirate vessels would be no better, and it might be possible, by employing the tactics developed by a succession of British flag officers over these last three hundred years to achieve success against them. It depended on whether those Chinese officers and seamen possessed the will to fight. Resolute men in inferior ships had often enough overcome better equipped and armed forces. He was not yet ready to make a decision, as he became aware that Wong was speaking again. I told you at the outset of this discussion that I coveted the post of Viceroy of Canton. I have set in motion a scheme that should secure it for me. Wong's black eyes glittered. Wu fears to inform the Emperor of the British landings at Macau, lest he be ordered to expel the English and lose his revenues. I have sent the news right by him to the Emperor by relays of Mongol horsemen. Meriwether recalled Drury's rhetorical question put to Roberts in his first interview with the supercargoes. Is the Viceroy the only eyes or ears the Emperor possesses in Canton? Not when it suited Wong's purposes to lend his own. He became aware that Wong was still speaking. But I require the time for the message to reach the Emperor and for him to act upon it. And the Viceroy may destroy me in the interval. Meriwether admired Wong's spirit. The Viceroy had undertaken to bully the wrong man. Wong evidently felt that he could take care of himself in the political situation, but he required technical assistance to perform his naval duties, and for the nonce was yet under the dominion of the Mandarin Vu, with do-or-be-damned orders to execute at his peril. This man had done him a favour two years ago, and there was no pressing need for his services at Macau, though he winced at the recollection of the entertainments he was missing with Creusa. He was about to voice his acceptance when Dawson spoke. And, of course, Captain, with Wong as Viceroy, the company will have a friend at court. There was even a quid pro quo. The profitable China trade tottered on the brink of disaster lacking only a stroke of the Emperor's brush to put it into bankruptcy. And you will receive one-eighth of the prize money as well. I have received instruction in the martial arts, said Wang anxiously, and I have made three voyages as supercargo in our family ships. But I lack experience in the art of making war at sea. I accept. Meriwether said at last, not for the prize money alone, though it would be most welcome to a man with a new son, but for Mr. Wong and the company. And now, may I see this squadron of yours while there is yet daylight? He wiped the sweat from his eyes, undid the tie strings, and held the blue coat open to the fresh breeze, savouring the cooling effect on his overheated torso. His own brown hair was flying in the wind, he had abandoned the black wig the first day, and by now every seaman in the fleet must be aware that a round eye was in command of the operation. Wong, Dawson and Fong were just concluding the final phase of instruction to the commanders of the other thirteen ships lying hove to, in a jumbled mass here in the approaches to the Pearl Estuary. With some four hours of daylight remaining, Meriwether decided he would get the squadron underway eastward as soon as those captains regained their war junks. There should be time before dark to try out the response to these simplified direct reading signals he had devised, and conduct a brief exercise in naval discipline. He refastened the jacket and walked unobtrusively forward on the poop of this wallowing war junk, as Wong and Fong saw the captains over the side to rejoin their ships. It had been a hectic three days. 
Out of nearly 80 war junks based on Canton, only 14 were in a reasonable state of readiness for sea. He had cannibalized the balance of the fleet to cram these 14 ships with some 4,000 men and all the arms they would carry. The Chinese possess no standard system of signals to govern movements at sea, and Dawson had recruited a hundred seamstresses to run up overnight fourteen sets of direct reading arbitrary signal flags, including a Bombay Marine ensign. They had managed to get the flotilla underway just after daylight and moved down the narrow channel into the open reaches of the Canton River. Once out of sight of land, they hove to and convened aboard the flagship a school of intensive instruction in naval science and tactics for the officers of the fleet. Merriweather could only oversee the operation, but Wong, Dawson and Fong were articulate and forceful teachers, demonstrating turn and flank movements in response to the signal hoists with chips of wood laid out on the hatch amidships. There were gunnery drills, Boarding parties were organized and rehearsed, and small arms target practice held. The second and third days, Merriweather Wong, Dawson and Fong visited every ship in the squadron to observe, criticize, and correct the drills conducted by its own officers. God only knows how they will react in battle, Merriweather had told Wong as they returned to the flagship but they have been exposed, certainly, to all of the art I know. There was more than just the language barrier to deal with. All but two of the captains were illiterate, unable to read the meaning of the flag hoists painstakingly drawn on rice paper opposite their definitions by Dawson, and then pasted on boards. Nine scholars had been discovered among four thousand seamen and posted to each ship, with Dawson and Fong going into the other two to interpret the signals for the commanders, and surely some of the brighter ones would soon memorize the meanings. Now, with the conclusion of this last session of encouragement and inspiration to valor, Merriweather felt that he had done as much as he could on this short notice. True proficiency would only come with the repetition of one weary drill after another, but if he could communicate with his fleet and the ships obey his signals, half the battle would be won. He decided to put the matter to its first trial. I suggest, Admiral, that you signal your command to get under way. Course east, line ahead. Wong consulted his table of signals, then barked out an order to the petty officer who had been designated as signalman. There were some false moves, mistakes, but finally the hoists were flying, and other bits of colour blossoming on the halyards of the other war junks. Execute! The hoists came down. The huge slatting sails were sheeted home, and the wallow of the junk became more purposeful as she picked up way towards the east. Merriweather watched anxiously as the other vessels began to fall in astern in a passable line. The intervals between ships were ragged, but he would not confuse the commanders as yet with admonitions to close up. By sunset, he had exercised the squadron with nearly every signal in the book, with the exception of engage the enemy. I believe they're getting the idea, Admiral, he told Wong, as they dined on a delicious mixture of pork, vegetables and bamboo shoots. By morning we should be southwest of the Ladrones, and that is where your last intelligence puts Madame Ching. Time enough, then, to consider our next course. Already I feel more confident, Captain. I begin to see the logic behind your tactics. At dawn, the Ladrones were a blue smudge on the northeastern horizon. Merriweather came yawning on deck a cup of tea in hand, to find Wong anxiously searching that sector with his long glass. I thought I saw a sail to the east a moment ago, but I cannot find it now. Merriweather wondered a moment as to the whereabouts of McCrae and Comet. They should be in this vicinity, cruising across the approaches to Canton and Macau in search of that putative opium smuggler. 
I think, Admiral, that we may as well change course to east-northeast to weather those islands. I lack the local knowledge to try to pass between them. He looked astern to see that the line ahead had survived the hours of darkness in reasonably good order. There were only two stragglers, and they were steering now to rejoin the formation. The signal was soon executed, and Merriweather watched to see if the lessons of the past three days had outlasted the night. The flagship made its turn and steadied on the new heading. The next ship in line held on to follow suit at the same point in the water just vacated. He breathed a sigh of relief. Just one junk made a false move and it came back quickly into position. He felt a flush of pride in his force. Now, if they could only find Madame Ching, and if these buggers would fight, Wong had a chance of accomplishing his mission. The hail from the seamen perched precariously at the masthead was unintelligible to Merriweather, but Wong responded with vigour. He pointed ahead. Two European ships, Captain, one sailing about west and the other north. Each have two masts. Another hail floated down. And a small junk about due north of us. That might be a picket for Madame Ching, but Merriweather wished he had more information as to the European ships. One might well be Comet. He looked up to the masthead and decided not. Just hold on and they should be visible to the deck shortly. The moment her topsails became visible, he was certain. It was another few minutes before he could make out the brig. Possibly McCrae was about to make the interception and he silently wished him luck. He turned his attention to the small junk sailing east, but could make nothing of her. It was another ten minutes before the masthead sang out again. Many sails, junks, bearing north-northwest, translated Wong. Course appears to be about east. Merriweather felt a thrill of anticipation. It was unlikely to be an honest convoy so close to the Ladrones. Merriweather gauged the bearing and relative movement with his eye. If he came around to about north-northeast, he should be able to make the interception. The speeds of the two forces must be about equal. He made the suggestion to Wong to change course, then looked back to see Comet and the brig both come to the wind. A cloud of gun smoke was drifting downwind from Comet. She must have fired her broadside to stop her prey. He shifted attention to the pirate flotilla still pressing on in line abreast, as though it were intent on reaching the two European ships, apparently oblivious to the approach of the Emperor's fleet. He tried to put himself in the shoes of Madame Ching to fathom her strategy and tactics. First, she obviously had no fear of the Chinese Navy having dealt with it so decisively in the past. Second, she intended to try to take those two prizes hove to over there, possibly unaware that one was a marine cruiser. Third, if the fleet came close enough to be a nuisance, she would simply execute a flank movement, square off for the wind, and sail northwardly with little chance of being brought to action. How then to counter this fluid situation? The shape of the brig altered. She was paying off and heading southeast. He saw smoke erupt bow and stern from Comet, and then the splashes in the van of the pirates. McCrae was evidently warning them off, but they sailed on. With a ship as fast, handy, and heavily armed as Comet, Merriweather had no compunction in ordering her to engage the enemy. McCrae would make the most of her speed and firepower. But even as he thought of the matter, he saw her sails fill and she followed the brig southeastwardly. With his mission completed, McCrae did not intend to tempt fate. Signals, Mr. Wong, to number 31. Engage the enemy and hoist the marine ensign. In this first week of October, a cold, steady rain slanted out of the night to splatter remorselessly across the deck. 
Captain Ian McRae huddled in his dripping oilskins, perched against the cabin skylight, arms folded across his chest for warmth, back to the chill breeze. It was still out of the southwest, but the monsoon would reverse its direction before many more days, and the weather already was becoming unsettled in anticipation. Comet was hove too, only two scraps of steadying sail hoisted, rising and falling rhythmically as the long rollers passed under her keel. He had not been able to get a sight today, but dead reckoning put the ship some twenty miles south of the group of tiny islands that lay in the centre of the Pearl Estuary, and bore the name Ladrones in recognition of their age-old use as a haven for pirates. God, what a night! The cheerful voice of what, the past midshipman who had the watch, was pitched high enough to carry over the drumbeat of rain on deck, the creak of rigging and clatter of blocks, and the sigh of the wind through the shrouds. He was near twenty, a red-haired, raw-boned Scot who had come late to the Marine as a volunteer, but had quickly proved his worth. He was awaiting the next opening in the lieutenant's list, and in McRae's critical judgment, was entirely qualified for the commission. McRae only grunted at the comment, no reply was expected, and decided to turn in. He could trust Watt to keep an eye on things. He was halfway to the companion when the hail came thinly down from the main cross trees. Deck there! Light on the starboard quarter! McRae checked his stride and looked aft. Nothing visible, of course, from the deck. His only real concern was whether the light was on a vessel or the remote possibility that it was on an islet. What? Needed no prompting. He swung into the rigging and disappeared aloft. It was only a moment before his hail floated down. It's a fluke, Captain! McRae resumed his interrupted journey to hang the dripping oilskins on pegs in the passage and enter his cabin. A wild goose chase in truth, he told himself, as he poured a dram designed to relieve the chill in his bones and loaded his pipe. He watched the blue smoke eddy about the swinging lamp, then gave thought to his present mission. Merriweather had expressed small hope of success. There was not even a reliable description of the vessel they sought, other than it was two-masted and thought to bear the name Ganges Pilot. Whether brig, snow, schooner, brigantine, or ketch, no one knew. But he would cruise out here astride the sea lanes to Macau for a few days in the forlorn hope that he might encounter such a vessel. Now warm and relaxed, McRae's thoughts turned again to Merriweather and the long voyage that had brought them back to China. In the close confines of the ship, the man had appeared entirely his old self. The deep personality shift that had afflicted him after the action at Aden last summer vanished as suddenly as it had descended. Possibly it was no more than an aberration brought on by the enormous stresses of the chase and the bitter battle that ensued. But McRae's tidy Scot's mind still sought some logical explanation, would not accept the theory of a mental breakdown, temporary or otherwise, that Buttram had tentatively advanced over a bottle at Bombay. He would never know the truth, he decided, and the captain certainly had worn his normal countenance this commission, in spite of the vexatious conduct of those gentlemen of the select committee. His thoughts feared to his own situation. Now nearly ten years of commissioned service in the Marine, and half a world away from his home in the West Highlands, just south of Malague. He had never been close to his stepmother, but he could trust her to take not a groat more than her dower rights to the estate, skimpy as was the produce scratched out of the soil and the sheep pastured on the barren hillsides to be turned into wool, carded, dyed, spun, and finally woven into sturdy tweed by the deft fingers of the women. Six struggling crofters occupied his lands, but two of them had been burned out last year, and he had spent most of his liquid capital in rebuilding the cottages. 
It would be a long time returning since the families had lost their looms, tools, and nearly everything else short of the clothing on their backs. He felt an unaccustomed twinge of nostalgia for the heather-clad hills that ran down to the rocky shore and the little cove only large enough to accommodate half a dozen trawlers, but his father's lifetime concern. His father had been a rigid, precise man, taking pride in his courtesy title of the Laird, bestowed in recognition of his ownership of nearly a square mile of bleak hills and plunging gulches that supported a sparse population of red deer and conies in addition to the six tenants. He had quarrelled at one time or another with each of them and all of his neighbours. For more than forty years he had maintained a bitter but correctly polite feud with the MacGregor, whose lands adjoined his to the east. As an only child and always small in stature, Macrae had never considered farming. He had early found his father's ways repressive, and even while receiving his limited schooling shipped out in the herring fleet, it was only a step to a berth in Clydeside packet, and having mastered the theory, he was soon sailing as mate. The packet accepted a charter for Bombay, and was wrecked in a typhoon off Ceylon. With another Scot, Macrae had supported himself for two years by diving for the pearl oyster before taking a berth as mate in a country ship. The officer shortage in 98 had brought him a commission in the Bombay Marine. Now at close to forty and as high he was sure as he would ever go in the company's navy, he was giving sober thought to his future. Inclined by nature to misogyny, Macrae had never had more than a passing interest in any woman, few and far between as unattached white females were out here. Occasional access to one or another of the myriad Indian maids of all work ashore at Bombay or Calcutta had sufficed to satisfy his needs. He had, as a matter of principle, never patronized a prostitute, though there was always quid pro quo for the native girl's services. Now he must give some consideration to marriage if he decided to leave the Marine at the end of his three years' leave with pay, to which he would be entitled next year. He thought briefly of Molly MacGregor, daughter of his father's old enemy, still single on his last visit to the Highlands three years ago, tied down to her querulous old father, now crippled by a stroke. They had been children together. She was intelligent, Biddable, attractive enough in a fair, freckled way. There would be economic advantages, too. She was also an only child. A marriage would unite the holdings of MacGregor and Macrae. There might even be time for a child or two. Macrae resolved to call around on Molly when next he visited Scotland. The clump of feet sounded overhead as the mid-watch came on deck to relieve. He blew out the lamp and slid under his seldom-used blanket. Just before he dropped off, he decided to write Molly a letter. No proposal, nothing even implied, only a reminder of his existence, first thing in the morning. At dawn the source of the light was apparent. A ragged-looking junk of small dimensions hove to and rocking wildly with slatting sails in the chop some three miles north. Macrae examined it closely through the glass. The seas along this coast were alive with pirates who plundered mostly other Chinese vessels and the villages up the many creeks, but were not averse to taking a lightly armed European ship when the opportunity presented itself. The Viceroy had been unable to deal with them. His admirals had proved themselves singularly inept at finding or bringing to justice these corsairs, and the Empire had been reduced to offers of amnesty to lure them from the seas once they had made their pile. He's a wrong and I'll wager, said Dillon, racking the glass. Pick it for the rest of his filthy crew, no doubt, but he'll not call them down on the likes of us. Macrae considered the matter only briefly. Comet's identity was apparent from the buff gun ports along her sides, even though she wore no colours. 
running down on the junk for a closer inspection would avail nothing. He decided to get some sail on and work to the southeast. One direction was as good as another with as uncertain an objective as he had. Make sail, Mr. Dillon. Course southeast and by east. He went below for his porridge and tea. It was two hours before the hail came. Where are we? About north, port tack, course west. What had the forenoon watch again in regular rotation? The sun was still obscured, but the cloud cover was high. The rain had ceased, and visibility was good. She's a brig, under all plain sail. McCray went on deck. Stand by to go about. His mind visualized the component of wind and course for an interception. Port your helm. Your new course is nor nor west. Set flying jib and staysails. The big schooner came to the wind, the hands tailing onto the sheets as the main and foresails swept across the deck to the opposite tack and were trimmed against the breeze. The jib went up in rapid jerks, and Comet already bore a bone in her teeth, dipping and swooping across the seas as she commenced the pursuit. Deck there! That junk looks like it's trying to cut her off! McCray cursed himself silently for his earlier choice of a direction in which to cruise. If the vessel was the picket for a squadron, the pirates stood an excellent chance of snapping up the prize. He could barely make out the peaks of its brown sails above the horizon now squared before the wind. Comet must be logging double the speed of the junk, however, and he was sure he could come up with the pair before the brig could be looted. He made a minute course correction and leaned against the weather bulwark's arms folded, face impassive to await the outcome. It was another ten minutes before the hail came down, and Watt made his formal inquiry. Two, four, no, seven, make it ten sails of junks bearing about west northwest. McCray stood erect. Course about east. The watch below was on deck by now as sightseers, and Watt cast an expectant glance at McCray. He would hold on a bit longer before sending the hands to quarters, he decided wishing that the master of that brig over there would only change course. Signals! The duty quartermaster jumped for the flag bag. Send, you are standing into danger, and hoist our colours. It was a direct reading, arbitrary signal well known to the merchant navy, but it was yet a great distance to make out the flags, and they were blowing right at the brig. In any event, she sailed placidly on towards the wallowing junks now beginning to become visible from the deck as specks on the horizon. Masthead makes them fourteen now, sir, reported Watt. A sudden thought struck McCrae. This was a rendezvous. The brig intended to transship her contraband into that tattered junk over there, all unaware of the threat slowly coming over the horizon to the west. She then could sail on into Macau clean while the junk disappeared up one of the creeks to deliver the opium. McRae tried to recall what his old acquaintance, Jameson, first in the company transport Alnick Castle, had told him over a bottle last week about this particular pirate crew. It was unique, led by a woman, the widow of their former commander, killed in action some two years ago. Ching. That was the name. Madame Ching, according to Jameson, as bloodthirsty, courageous, and capable as her deceased husband. She was reputed to control some eighty sail of junks in her flotilla, divided into six squadrons, each commanded by a lieutenant distinguished by flags of different colours. She was reputed to command the Red Squadron, and to be lurking in the Ladrones after pillaging a village to the north last month. It was possible that the fourteen ships over there could be honest traders sailing in company for security. But McRae suddenly knew in his bones that it was Madame Ching about to interfere with his own mission. He must keep his options open, be prepared to rescue an innocent country ship from pirates or capture her in spite of them. 
Send the hands to quarters. Clear for action, Mr. Watts. The marine bugles and drums sounded out. With nearly every seaman already on deck, the canvas jackets came off the eighteen-pounders in a trice. Tampions were pulled out, and rammers, sponges, buckets of sand, water, and smouldering slow match, together with garlands of shot, plumped down along the batteries. Gun captains secured the locks over the touch holes and tested the spark of the flints against their cupped palms. The armoury gunner's mate and his strikers filled the racks with pikes and cutlasses. Dylan came aft to report. Ship's clear for action. All stations mad and ready, sir. McCrae put the glass to his eye. The brig was still sailing on to a point of interception with the junk. He wondered suddenly how Merriweather would have handled this situation. He well understood the captain's preoccupation with the weather gauge with all its advantages of manoeuvre, had seen him exploit it to win actions that otherwise might have been lost or been much more costly. He had the weather gauge on the brig, the junk, and the squadron. Now, what was his objective? This was more complex than appeared on the surface. His natural instinct was to sail right to the brig, cutting off contact with the junk and making sure of its capture. But then, what of the squadron? It would take time to put a prize crew aboard. There might be resistance to overcome. And while these details were being resolved, he could be overwhelmed by sheer numbers, provided the fourteen junks were pirates. You canna make an omelette without cracking eggs. McCrae told himself. Haul down the brig, warn off the junk, and if the pirate squadron came down upon him, he had the speed, manoeuvrability, and firepower to deal with it. Even that fat-bellied brig should have the heels of those clumsy craft. He had no orders to take any action against Chinese pirates, and he was not a volunteer. The junks were now hull up, Lumbering through the swells in a long line abreast, and through the glass, he could see that their decks were crowded with men. No honest traders, these. Sail ho! What, another? These waters were becoming damned crowded after several days without a sighting. On the port quarter, sir, what informed him? McCrae picked up the glass. He could see a shimmer of sails in what appeared to be a regular line ahead. Had the Chinese finally adopted the strategies of old England to sail in a disciplined formation? It was hard to believe. Masthead makes out fourteen sails, sir. First things first. McCrae's mission out here was to intercept and search that brig over there, though he felt some concern at the possibility of being trapped between two pirate fleets. He paused to reassess his position, and almost instantly decided that Comet was in no danger yet, had the heels of any ship in sight, and the eighteen-pounders to make them keep their distance. Steady as you go, he told the expectant Watt, and turned to study the ships on the port quarter again. The flags exhibited were not yellow, green, black, blue, or white, the colours of Madame Ching's other five squadrons, but now looked through the glass suspiciously like the Emperor's own device. He recalled Lieutenant Jameson's account of the crushing defeat suffered only last May by the Viceroy's forces. With both pirates and navy becalmed, the ferocious woman commander had urged her sailors over the side to swim and board the ships of the Chinese navy, capturing nearly half of the fleet. The Admiral had killed himself in disgrace. McCrae shook his head. His pessimistic Scots nature would hardly accept the fact that allies might be on the horizon. Hold on and find out. Briggs wearing to starboard. Her master had belatedly seen the danger he was standing into and squared off before the wind. Change course. Steer north northeast. Comet's speed picked up measurably as she sailed a course that would still permit her to interpose between the ragged junk and brig. There was little enough sea room to the northeast, 
They should be raising the Ladrones any moment now, but there was room for those with local knowledge to pass between those islands. With Comet on her most favourable point of sailing, she was running down her quarry at a great rate now. The junk was less than two miles distant, only a point forward off the beam while the brig was rapidly drawing aft on the starboard bow. Time to warn off the junk. Pass the word to Mr. Dillon to load the log nine. There was a buzz of comment and stir of movement along the batteries. Men who had slouched in the shade a moment before stood up to assess the situation for themselves as the crew of the forward pivot gun began the ritual of loading the piece. Ready, sir! Dillon's hail came aft faintly against the wind. Your target is the junk. Fire when ready. The platform rotated to port, was wedged in train, and the muzzle rose to maximum elevation. An instant later, the spiteful high-pitched report cracked out. The target was at least half a mile beyond the maximum range of even a long nine. But the round shot fell fortunately, sending up a plume of spray and then skipped like a flat stone flung across a mill pond for three more less spectacular but plainly visible splashes directly in line with the junk. It was only a minute before her silhouette altered as she fled northwestward. McCrae took stock of the situation again. The supposed pirate fleet was plainly visible now almost due west, holding on in a very creditable line abreast but he could now make out what appeared to be red flags at each peak. Madame Ching in person. He looked back for the other flotilla. It was still in line ahead, steering a course that should intercept the other Chinese squadron not far from his present position. McCrae turned his attention again to the brig. She was almost a beam and in range of the long nine, certainly. Signal! Heave to! He waited for some response, but the brig sailed on. He could make out men on her deck, most of them Laskers, but at least two were European. It was apparent she would not obey the signal. Reload! What passed the word to Dylan? He intended to reel in this clumsy country ship now as though it were a salmon hooked in a highland burn. Put a shot across her bow! The pivot rotated. There was an adjustment in elevation, and the report. The splash was less than half a cable's length ahead of her bow. There was a movement on her poop. She had what appeared to be about six pounders fore and aft, probably mounted on pivots, and then smoke blossomed from both of them. The fall of shot was woefully short, but it was an affront not to be brooked by McRae. Starboard battery, stand by! The hands were already ramming home the round shot. Divide your battery, forward fire ahead, after section astern. He paused only a second to see if the brigade wavered. It had not, and men were clearing out from in front of both six pounders, evidence that they were reloaded. Fire! The eighteen pounders roared out and the splashes almost under the bow sprit and fan tail were impressive. McCray saw movement on the poop again. The helm went over, and the brig came reluctantly around into the wind. The Ladrones were plainly visible to the north, but he could recall no report to this effect. He looked around the horizon. The pirate squadron was still almost west, closer than he fancied paying no attention to the ragged junk now sailing well to the northwest. The Emperor's fleet was coming directly towards him, fore reaching a bit on Madame Ching. Both of those Chinese forces would have to wait. His first objective was to take possession of the brig and search her. Mr. Barger! The compact little second lieutenant in command of the port battery leaped across the deck to stand in front of McRae. You are prize master. Take the launch and the full marine detachment. Get the brig underway immediately. Course east. Then examine her papers, cargo manifest, everything. 
And while you're doing that, have Severin search her for opium. If you find any, dip her flag three times. Comet was rounding to half a cable's length from the brig and the launch was already being hoisted out. There were only three other white men visible, all clustered on the quarter-deck. While the launch was pulling across, McCrae looked back for the pirates. They were not intimidated by the presence of a marine cruiser, but pressed steadily on, almost within long gunshot by now, coming faster than junk should on their present point of sailing. Even stoic McCrae felt a pang of alarm. Best warn them off, he decided. Both batteries load and stand by. Pivots, take aim to stabbard. He looked back to port. Barger was at the gangway in confrontation with the gesticulating captain, the marines flowing past him on either side, sun glinting on their bayonets as they drove the hands forward and took possession of the wheel and quarter-deck. All was well. No resistance. Pivots commence fire! The splashes were right at the bow of the nearest junk, and McCrae waited a moment for the reaction trusting Watt to keep him advised of any developments in the brig. But the pirate squadron did not waver at the show of force. It ploughed on relentlessly towards Comet and the brig. He was going to cut this dam close. If something fouled or gave way now, he was lost. Brig's paying off! It was about as fast as the manoeuvre could be accomplished in a strange ship, and McCrae made a note to compliment Barger. Get under way, course east. The schooner's sails filled and she fell in astern of the brig, the wake beginning to boil out from under her counter. Brig stepping our colours! One, two, three! A hit? She carried the contraband a chance in a thousand of finding an opium smuggler with only the sketchiest of intelligence. But this was somewhat beside the point at this juncture. He stood an excellent chance of losing his prize yet. Comet could easily sail away from the junks, but the brig was not so certain. Even now he was beginning to fall reach on her, and he gave consideration to reducing sail. Signals! What? Nothing on the brig. Then he saw Watt pointing aft and whirled to look. The presumed Chinese naval squadron was much closer now, and he could see specks of colour near the peak of the foremast, with the naked eye, that might be a flag hoist. He snatched the glass from the hand of Watt and focused it. I don't believe it. He looked at Watt and saw confirmation on his countenance. The topmost flag was the ensign of the Bombay Marine, and the flags below spelled out the arbitrary signal, Engage the enemy. He took the time to consider the matter. No Chinese admiral had authority under any circumstances to order a marine cruiser into action. It was almost impossible that any such officer should even know the meaning of the signal. But Merriweather had gone off to Canton last week with an urgent summons from that British intelligence agent sojourning there, and he must be nearly the only person in China who would have the knowledge to employ such a signal. It could be a trick, but Macrae suddenly knew in his bones that Merriweather was over there for what reason he could only conjecture. Log the signal, and add the comment by what authority unknown, he told Watt. This was an order he desired to obey. It had galled him to give even the appearance of flight from those pirates, but engaging fourteen ships, lightly armed as they possibly were, was not to be undertaken in a reckless spirit. He took the time to reassess the tactical situation, conscious that every eye was fixed upon him. Two Chinese squadrons, almost equal in force, were approaching one another at approximately right angles, the pirates in line abreast, the navy in line ahead. Madame Ching could at any time turn north and probably avoid action, but with her recent resounding victory over these same ships, she evidenced no intention to do so. The pirates were on a less favourable point of sailing than the Emperor's force, 
which was now almost before the wind, heading for a point of interception that would permit it in effect to cross the T, engaging each ship in turn with concentrated gunfire. The tactic of itself was corroboration that Merriweather must be aboard and in command. McRae measured the distances with his eye. The line abreast was spaced in intervals of no more than a cable's length between ships. A far smartly handled ship might sail right across the face of such a formation, angling northeastward to allow for its speed, throw a broadside into each vessel as it passed, and have time to reload for the next junk. If his gunners made a good practice, he could very well dismast a third of them and come back on the reciprocal of his course to deal with the survivors. There were risks, of course. He must not permit any pirate to make contact with Comet, lest she be overwhelmed in a hand-to-hand -hand combat. But with these eighteen-pounders, he should be able to prevent such a catastrophe. He would take the risk. Stand by to jibe! Watt looked at him in surprise, then leaped to reinforce the hands tending sheets. With the tremendous area contained in the main and foresails, it could be a risky manoeuvre. He could pull the sticks right out of her in this fresh breeze if something slipped. However, the elements of surprise and speed in making his move outweighed in McRae's mind the danger to the ship. He heard the boatswain shouting admonitions to the men tailing on the lines, saw that they were ready, and gave his command, Starboard helm! The rudder bit. Comet began to swing as the hands strained at the sheets holding them taut as the leech began to tremble, then hauling in with all their might as the booms went over with a rush and the sails filled with thunderous reports on the port tack. McCrae let out the breath he had been holding. Nothing had carried away. Steady as you go. Course north. It was only moments before Comet was within effective range of the nearest junk. He could see the eyes painted on her bluff bow, and clumps of blue-clad seamen clustered around the gun on her forecastle. It fired, but he could not make out the fall of shot. About a nine-pounder, he judged. McCrae adjusted his course, watching the relative movement closely. Now! Port battery! Stand by! The guns were already loaded, and the captains were making minute corrections in elevation and train. This was well-nigh point-blank range, no excuse for misses. Commence fire! It was a textbook example of the best British naval strategy and tactics. Six eighteen-pound and two nine-pound iron balls crashed the length of the ship. Both masts fell in a welter of brown sail. The seamen vanished from the junk's deck, and the gun on the forecastle pointed skyward. As McCrae had estimated, there was just time before Comet crossed the bow of the next ship to reload the battery, and the second broadside roared out to devastate that vessel. By the time he had dealt with the third junk in line, the others had changed course and were fleeing in a disorganized gaggle northward but Comet hunted them down relentlessly. As he had suspected, the pirate junks were lightly armed, many small one- or two-pounder swivels of the sort the Marine called cohorns, which had vanished from all but its smallest vessels, and one or two eight- to twelve-pound pieces, usually mounted right up in the bows. Comet did not escape unscathed, but her damage was minor, and only two men suffered splinter wounds. Three of the northernmost junks escaped, having made their turn early, and McCrae went about to deal with cripples. As his ship settled on the starboard tack, McCrae saw that there was no need for this. The Chinese navy was systematically bombarding them, and when resistance ceased, taking possession by boarding. He saw signals on the flag junk again, and what read them off as each hoist climbed the mast disengage, and then carry out previous orders. Finally, thank you. McCrae found the brig on the horizon to the east and changed course to come up with her. 
There might be a long reach southeastward before he could steer a course for Macau Roads unless the monsoon came in the meantime. But he would bring Ganges' pilot safely in as his prize. Tell the purser to serve out a double issue of grog, Mr. Watt. And if the officers would like a wee drop themselves, they are welcome in the cabin. As he lifted the dram to his lips in a toast to the marksmanship of Lieutenant Dillon, a vagrant thought crossed Macrae's mind. He had not drafted that careful letter to Molly MacGregor. Merriweather lowered himself gingerly into the steamy wooden tub until the water reached his chin, then sat quiet for a few moments, feeling the salt, sweat and grime that encrusted his body begin to dissolve. Screen shut off this corner of the ground floor of the Mandarin's house to grant him privacy, but a barber with the tools of his trade squatted just outside. He must wash the grease and tangles out of his hair before submitting to the ministrations of the barber, but he was so comfortable just now that he was reluctant to begin. Three weeks at sea with the Chinese Navy and Admiral Wong had taken its toll, not only in the lack of fresh water in which to bathe, but he had clearly lost weight. Somehow the delicious concoction served up by Wong's steward just did not seem to stick to his ribs. Not that there had been time for leisurely, formal dining at sea. In any case, the squadron had been almost continuously underway seeking out the six squadrons of that woman, Madame Ching, bringing each to action, then systematically destroying or capturing the pirate junks. With discipline now rigidly enforced by Wong, and an effective, if limited, mastery of British naval strategy and tactics, the Canton fleet had become a force to be reckoned with. Only in that first action south of the Ladrones, when Merriweather had shamelessly called Macrae and Comet down to soften up the enemy, had there been European assistance. By the third action, sagacious young Wong had grasped all but the finest points of warfare at sea, and proceeded to exploit all the advantages of the weather gauge. With Merriweather hovering discreetly in the background, and with only an occasional prompting he made his own decisions through the balance of the operation. Only three days ago they had encountered the ragtag remnants of Madame Ching's once invincible armada off Hong Kong Island to the north, and sent the few survivors in frantic flight towards Formosa. Wong would have pursued them even then, but a courier had come on board the flag junk four hours earlier, with momentous tidings above the Emperor's own seal. Sir, I am Viceroy of Canton. Wong's face was creased in his deprecating smile. The Mandarin Wu and his Hoppo have been degraded and removed from office for their failure to resist the British landings and their brazen attempt to deceive the Emperor. He looked back at the column of ships following his flag south, before the steady pressure of the northeast monsoon, his eyes leaping from junk to junk to judge the intervals they kept. It was not yet quite a Royal Navy line ahead, but close enough. By the day after tomorrow, I shall take my oath to the Emperor before my ancestors, and assume the dominion over Canton. I shall make Fong my hoppo, and if you will consent, my admiral of the fleet. Another offer of high rank, Merriweather thought with wry amusement, remembering that backhanded tender of a supreme command at sea in an Indian empire ruled by Tipu Sultan almost three years ago in the blinding heat of Velour. He must be careful not to offend the new viceroy, but couch his refusal in delicate terms. Already he was seeking the proper words. Why, Admiral, more properly, Your Excellency, my warmest congratulations upon a well-deserved promotion. You will rule with wisdom, honour, dignity, justice and compassion, in a manner that will exalt your ancestors. Was he laying it on too thick? No, he decided. It was difficult to overdo genuine praise coming from a full heart. 
for many years to come. I am most honoured and complimented by your offer, but I am already sworn to king and company. In less than two hours now the formal ceremony would commence, to be followed by a lavish entertainment in the Viceroy's palace. Merriweather was summoned as a guest of honour, some Chinese order of merit to be bestowed upon him in recognition of his services, so Dawson reported. He would wear the regalia of the orders for the occasion, but no other disguise. His freedom of Canton granted by Wong's grandfather was yet valid. He sighed, ducked his head and began to work the soap into his scalp while sorting out the tangles in his hair. Once the festivities were over, there was nothing to prevent his return to Macau and Creusa. He felt a flush of heat at the thought, rinsed his hair once again, and stood up. What had possessed the man, Merriweather wondered foggily. His head was not exactly splitting, but it was sore enough to cause discomfort this early forenoon of the morning after. The Chinese wines were not of themselves caused such malaise, but Dawson had taken him to his own abode after the festivities and produced a bottle of real London gin to lubricate their discourses into the dawn hours. Only a few minutes ago, a courier from the Viceroy had brought his summons, and now Merriweather leaned against the rail at the stern of the flag junk, clad once more in seaman's blue, wearing the black wig again, anchored in the Canton River below the city. The other ships of the Victoria Squadron were moored in line abreast, stretching to either bank to form a barrier not to be penetrated except by small craft, and effectively denying passage either to the Indiamen moored upstream or the men of war at Macau. Drury, for some unaccountable purpose of his own, was making his way up the river in his barge, decked out in full dress, less sword. Merriweather could only surmise that the officer had formed some intention of opening a parley, in an attempt to crack the impasse brought on by the occupation of Macau and the failure to open the trade at Canton. The supercargoes apparently yet persisted in their design to intimidate the Viceroy and Hoppo though they must be informed by now that the men they had formerly dealt with had been broke and cashiered. Wong would be a different kettle of fish wearing the mantle of authority over this great city, and Merriweather almost forgot his distress in anticipation of the resolution of the controversy. Sir, the Emperor has issued strict orders that the English are to be expelled, he had told Merriweather at the dinner that interposed between the formal ceremony yesterday afternoon and the entertainment last night. No more than the company deserved, Merriweather thought bitterly, remembering his investment in its soon-to-be-worthless shares. Mayhap he could dispose of them at a discount before the news became current, if he could only get back to Calcutta. But I know how important the company is to you, Captain and I choose to interpret the Emperor's order to apply only to the troops of Macau. Once the British evacuate them, I shall order the trade to be reopened at Canton, though I intend that the company shall do penance for the sins of these willful men. Meriwether's heart had leaped. The company would not be destroyed after all. And how do you intend to communicate these terms? He thought sourly that Roberts and Patty had already accomplished their purpose at Macau with Macrae's capture of the consignment of northern opium, and there was little reason now to hold the town. I shall summon them before me. The message goes tonight, and I think you may be interested in being present. So there went another two or three days' delay before he could rendezvous with Creusa but the company's fortunes were more important than his fleshly gratification. There came the sound of gongs and drums, and Wong came over the side in formal robes, the mandarin's ruby gleaming in his cap. The barge under British colours was in sight by now half a mile down the river, 
The oarsmen tricked out in flat straw hats and pale blue jumpers. The admiral seated stiffly in the stern sheets, his gold lace glittering in the sunlight. To be sure, the man had been entirely decent and considerate in his dealings with Merriweather, but his vacillation and final yielding to the select committee in its every unreasonable demand had precipitated this crisis and brought the company to the brink of ruin. He found just enough resentment to move him to give Drury a bit of excitement for his memoirs. Your Excellency, would you indulge me by having those guns loaded? He indicated two co-horns mounted in swivels on either quarter. Wong looked at him with surprise, then clapped his hands and gave the order. It was only a few minutes before the barge was within fifty yards of the junk and still pulling. Fire each gun to either side of the boat, but well clear. Wong's face creased in a smile of appreciation before he gave the order. The effect was entirely gratifying. The almost simultaneous reports preternaturally loud in the still morning air. Every head in the boat snapped around, mouth and eyes wide, and two seamen jumped over the side. The splashes made by a collection of scrap iron and stones at short range were spectacular. Drury sat frozen in place for a moment as the two men overboard were retrieved, then stood a little shakily holding his hands up, palms out in the gesture of peace. Ahoy the junk! he shouted. I come in peace. Is there any one of you who speaks English? Merriweather made himself inconspicuous among the Chinese officers as Wong stepped forward. The Admiral had recovered from his surprise and appeared steady enough now. I do. What brings you to the forbidden environs of Canton? I come in peace, repeated Drury. I desire a parley with the Viceroy. I am the Viceroy. Drury looked at Wong with astonishment, then spoke. I want it enough, sir, Wong interposed. You will bear my summons to the select committee to appear, every one of them, before me in my palace tomorrow at noon precisely. You are dismissed. The Admiral looked unbelievingly at Wong, his eyes roving across the assemblage gathered behind him. He started slightly, but his gaze came back to fix on Merriweather in the midst of the group before he spoke. Very well, Your Excellency. I shall convey your message. Not message. Summons. Wong's face was set in hard lines, eyes glittering his tone authoritarian. He turned, and his entourage fell in behind him as he made his way to his barge. Drury remained standing a moment more. It had been a long time since he had been addressed in this cavalier fashion. He resumed his seat and gave the orders to the coxswain. As the hands gave way, he looked back over his shoulder for one last inspection of Merriweather. The heavy gold filigree, set with rubies and circling an enamelled device, thumped on his chest as Merriweather took his seat beside the hoppo in the space allotted for senior military and naval officers serving under the Viceroy. Dawson had informed him that by his calculation, the Chinese order of chivalry into which he had been inducted the night before last was at least of equal rank with the Knight of the Garter in England and entitled him to many honours and privileges. Of course, these heathen titles meant nothing. He could not call himself Sir Percival, but the insignia was a pretty bauble, and valuable to boot. The Viceroy, preceded by his herald, made his entrance, and Merriweather aped the others in making his obeisance as Wong took his seat in the elaborate chair set on the dais. There were no preliminaries, you have violated the territory of the Empire of China, an act of war which has caused our Empire much distress. 
and inclined him towards retribution, Wong said in a strong voice. The five supercargoes were ranged in a line before the dais, Roberts in the centre, Patty to his right. The other men must be Branston, Elphingstone and Baring, but Merriweather could not distinguish them. The faces were impassive, but from the side he could see Roberts clasping and unclasping his hands behind his back. The Emperor accordingly has directed that the English shall be expelled. There was a movement all along the line. Expressions of incredulity blossomed on the faces of Branston, Elphingstone and Baring, while Roberts and Patty stared stonily at the Viceroy. Evidently the other three had not been fully informed of the drastic consequences attending the actions taken by them. When he named me his Viceroy, the Emperor reposed a special trust in me to carry out his mandate in a manner to serve the best interests of China. Wong ticked off his conditions. First, evacuation of Macau within three days. Second, a period of two years of probation during which the Viceroy reserved the right to terminate all treaties and expel the company. Third, a surcharge in the nature of a fine upon the duties paid at Canton for a period of two years. Fourth, discontinuance of any trade in opium at Canton or Macau. Merriweather saw relief appear on the faces of the supercargoes, and they were dismissed. At least they had escaped the painful duty of informing the courts of proprietors and directors that the company had lost its trade to China. Come, said Fong, Wong desires to give you farewell before you depart. He led Merriweather in.